Good evening, everyone. This is a special meeting of the Downers Grove Grade School District 58 Board of Education here on Thursday, July 30th, 2020 at 5.01 p.m. at the Downers Grove Village Hall. This meeting is also being live streamed for the public on the Village of Downer Gro Downers Grove's YouTube channel, and the recording will be posted on District 58's YouTube channel. Melissa, will you please call roll? Member Doshi. Here. Member Hannes. Here. Member Harris. Here. Member Olchek. Here. Member Samanti. Here. <clears throat> Member Weiner. Here. Member Hughes. Here. This evening, members of the audience will have an opportunity to provide public comment to the board later on in the agenda. The board asks anyone wishing to comment to fill out a card and indicate the topic to be addressed. These can be placed in the basket over on the table to my right. Members of the public who are viewing remotely may provide a public comment by submitting the public comment Google form. The link to the form is available on the meeting agenda in board docs under agenda item number three, public comment. This form is open now for comments and will remain open until we reach that portion of the agenda. I have allotted 60 minutes for public comment tonight, up to three minutes each for in-person comments from those who have submitted cards. I will then read aloud comments submitted remotely in the order in which they were received. In the event we run out of time to read all remote comments aloud, please know that we will be publishing all comments submitted remotely on this agenda in board docs if you would like to refer to them after the meeting. Should there be time remaining, we will take any additional in-person comments. We're going to go ahead and, and start the day off with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> All right, we're going to dive right in and talk about the Return to Learn plan for 2020 through 2021. Welcome up to the podium, Dr. Russell. Good evening, Board of Education. Tonight's presentation, we're uh, calling Return to Learn in District 58. This is a common uh, term that you're hearing throughout districts. Uh, we certainly like that as the theme, and so we, we borrowed that from uh, other school districts. Tonight, we're going to be uh, discussing many different potentials for the reopening of schools. Us, we'll be covering a blended learning option, an on-site, a remote, and then a, an online academy. Some of the verbiage has changed since July 13th. Uh, we wanted to be consistent with our verbiage uh, moving forward, so we did change some of the terminology. The purpose of our presentation tonight is to continue our conversation from July 13th, to review feedback from surveys that the district sent out after the last board meeting, again, to provide an overview of those three learning models, and then to seek board approval of a model or models for a path forward. Before we start any conversations, especially ones of this magnitude, I think it's important that we visit our, or revisit, excuse me, our mission and vision statement. And I've highlighted some words in our mission statement that I like all stakeholders to really think about as we're having these conversations. Our mission in the district is to challenge and engage each child and make sure that they have a quality educational program. Our duty is also to provide a safe, nurturing, and child-centered environment. And I think that is really the crux of the conversation this evening. How do we accomplish both in these challenging times? Speaking of challenging times, I do want to take a moment to just talk about what an unprecedented time we're in. I know that is kind of the biggest obvious statement of the year. But there are so many concerns that we're all hearing on a daily basis on all sides of the issue. But I also like to take opportunities like this and, and really talk about the many opportunities that we've already accomplished as a district and some of the things that we're very proud of. So for instance, in March, we were told on a Friday to completely flip the way we do everything. And by that Monday, we were able to change into a remote learning school district. Uh, that would not have happened without our staff. Many of them are here in the audience and without the hardworking Board of Education. So I really want to use that as an example of how when a community comes together, we can really shine. I also want to highlight the opportunity that we took, and I want to compliment our business office, with arranging meals for those who were in need. Uh, that is a huge accomplishment, and we were at Herrick earlier today, and we got to see that firsthand. What an opportunity in such a challenging time. 
I do want to talk a bit about the strong feelings on all sides. Uh, to say that this has been a tough time for board members and superintendents and staff would be the understatement of the century. I've been accused of being Donald Trump's lackey. I've also been accused of being J.B. Pritzker's lapdog. I've been accused of not listening to staff. I've been accused of only listening to staff. I've been accused of you know, being responsible for potential mass murder. I've also been accused of being uh, responsible for mass unemployment. And one of the things that I'm always proud about Downers Grove is that no matter what problem we have, we always come together. We listen to one another and we collaborate. Sometimes those strong feelings that we have, especially on social media, can really cloud all of that. And so my call tonight is for all of us to come together as best we can and to really take time to listen. And whatever path or paths we choose, we have no choice but to collaborate because we've got over 5,000 kids that are depending on us. No matter how we feel about the current situation or whether or not the federal government should have done more, the state government should have done more, did not put 862 school districts in this position, the reality is here we are. And we have no choice but to come together and move forward. So I'd like everyone as we go through this, our staff, our community members, the Board of Education, to assume that we're all working with the best intentions. To say that these have been sleepless nights for all of us would be an understatement. These are not just willy-nilly decisions or recommendations that we're making. These are decisions that we have poured over, that we've stressed about, and uh, that we are really, really doing the best that we can. I think we also need to avoid the rumor mill. There are so many rumors that are going on. I look forward to presenting some of the things tonight because of all the different things that we've heard. We also need to talk about perception versus reality, what people believe versus what is actually going on. And this is one of the things that I think has been a very tough thing for us as administrators over the last several weeks because the guidance is ever changing. And so there's a perception out there that perhaps we haven't been doing anything all summer long. Uh, I, I want to blow that perception right out of the water because I can assure you that if we could have had a plan a month and a half ago, we certainly would have. A classic example of this is just last Thursday, we received another 103-page guidance document from the State Board of Education. And the ones that they sent out early in the summer continue to be updated. And so there's also a perception out there that people have not had input in this plan. And, and I really want to push back on that. Um, we do not have a final plan yet to the ground level because we feel it's so important not to create the plan ourselves, but to listen and to incorporate as many voices, our staff voices, into finalizing that plan. But we certainly have plans. We have certainly gone over this, and I think you'll see that tonight. I also want to point out that the plan we create now will likely be the plan until the state moves to phase five. I also want to highlight that no matter what we do during these troubling times, we can never create a risk-free environment. The village cannot create a risk-free environment. The state of Illinois cannot create a risk-free environment. Whenever we go out, we are all at risk for the coronavirus. And so as we think about that, I think that's very important that we recognize that we can catch the coronavirus everywhere, not just in the school setting. Again, I want to emphasize that we're in this together. And my one plea to all involved is let's insist that we're all using the same objective criteria. As a public school district in Illinois, our objective criteria is clearly laid out in the ISBE guidance and the IDPH guidance. Now what I will say though, is good people can read that guidance and come to very different conclusions. But the one non-negotiable that we need to have is that we're all using the same objective criteria. So as we go through, I'd also like to define our terms. I won't take the time to read through all of these, uh, but one new term that you will see is online academy. The online academy is if the board were to vote tonight on a blended option or an in-person, the guidance that came out last Thursday states that we need to offer an online academy for people that don't want to send their children to school, so parent choice. We're choosing to call this an online academy so we don't confuse it with remote learning, or what would take on place on the opposite side of a blended day. So I just wanted to make sure that we all had those terms. So that is a new term. Uh, we were gonna do that anyways as a school district and with the guidance and with our work over the last several weeks, I think many will be pleased at how beefed up uh, that is uh, compared to when we first started talking about a framework for that. I've attached some key documents. They're also, uh, they've been listed for the public in board docs. I would encourage everyone to take a look at these documents 
I've also highlighted when these documents were released to us or when they've been updated. This is the reality that we're living in. It is day by day, week by week, ever changing, ever fluid. And so I realize that people are frustrated. I would like to be at the front of the line because I am just as frustrated some of these times. Again, I do not believe the state should have ever put all of our school districts in this position, but know that you've got dedicated people working very, very hard. And I want to commend our Board of Education. Since July, we've received hundreds of emails, phone calls. The same thing with the administrative team. I said this to one of the members prior to the meeting, and I really mean this. I would never want to work in, a, uh, or let me rephrase that. Going through something is terrible as a pandemic. I wouldn't trade working with this board or this administrative team or our staff for anything. It is amazing how they've all come together and really worked. I'm not saying we agree on everything and that will be clear, but I am so proud of how we've all come together and really worked hard. You've seen this guidance several times, but again, I, I wanted to put that up there. Uh, you would have seen this in the, in the presentation on July 13th, but I, I felt like it was important to put it in there. The one thing I want to highlight is under the instruction tab, because this is a big change. We know that any model that we do has to be five hours of instruction. However, any time kids are learning off-site, the opposite side of a blended, full remote, or the online academy, the new requirements from the state board state that it must be two and a half hours of synchronous instruction. That is a monumental shift from what we would have seen in the spring. So if the board chooses to go a remote learning route or a blended route or even the online academy, I can assure everyone that it is going to look much different and much more rigorous than what you would have seen because of the requirements that are in front of us. We surveyed our families uh, after the last board meeting. And I do want to address one question that I was getting. Why didn't you have a vote in terms of which option do you prefer? I, I, I've gotten that question from staff and I've also gotten that question from families. And, and again, I think this can be one of those things where good people may disagree. The reason I did not in the survey ask for a vote about which model we prefer is because the guidance clearly states that for children under 13, we should be pursuing an in-person model. If we cannot do that, then we need to go to a blended option and, or a remote option. We don't survey as a school district people, uh, you know, how many days of school would you prefer because it is very clear it says 176. And we also want to be careful once the board gives direction that we then don't survey the community the day after because that could cause friction with the Board of Education after they've given clear direction. So it was not an attempt to sway one model versus the other. It was an attempt to survey the community on the board's direction and where the guidance was. So I, I did want to uh, make that clear. But as you see, we had over 3,500, almost 3,600 responses. One of the things we've noticed during remote learning or during the pandemic is just how much our parents and families are queuing in to what's going on. And the same thing with the staff. So on behalf of all of us, thank you to our families for taking the time to fill out that survey. I want to assure all of our families we have read through every single comment that was submitted and those comments are also posted online for the public to view. So the first question we asked based on the guidance was if we had a modified on-site model how many of you would attend school or send your children there? 79 percent of our parents had indicated that they would send their children here, 19 and a half said they would prefer an online option and a sliver said they wouldn't prefer either and would not send their children to school. The next question we asked is if we're not able to do an on-site option and we went to a blended model, how many of you would send your children to school? The, re result, or excuse me, the results were similar, but they did go up a little bit. And so here you see about 85% of our families would send their children to school, 13 and a half would prefer a blended, or excuse me, an online option, and then that same sliver would not send their children to school. We asked families, and again, I want to be clear here, there are about a million alternating, or excuse me, blended type of options that you could send your families. But we asked our families on some of the most common ones that we're starting to see, you know, alternate week or alternate day type of uh, situations. And clearly our families would prefer more of an alternate day versus an alternating week model. We then asked our families, 
In the event we were in a full modified on-site, given the fact that many of our buildings, in fact, 11 of the 13 do not have air conditioning, would you like us to explore extreme heat days should we be in there all day? And clearly you see that our, our community would like us to do that depending on the model that we develop. Uh, with the lack of air conditioning, late August and September are very tough in our buildings. I think I've shared that with uh, you since I've been superintendent being a former teacher at O'Neill. I can vouch for this. We also asked our parents who had kindergartners coming in. There's a lot of concern about five-year-olds, their stamina, wearing masks, first real school experience for many of them. Should we go back to a half-day model for kindergarten during the pandemic? And of the parents who responded to the survey who have children entering kindergarten, 54% said that is something that they would support, where about 46% said that is something that they would not support, they would prefer full day. I think that number is significant because I, in normal times, if we asked that question, I would, this is just my view, anticipate that that number would be much higher for full day. Then we asked our families who qualify for busing. Would you send your child on a bus during this time? And here you see the split. 50% of our parents said that they would. 49% of our parents said that they would not. Um, so I think that number is also very telling in terms of transportation and where people feel on that subject. We then asked our staff survey questions. And again, I can't thank our staff enough. Almost 500 of them completed the survey. Our staff left several comments and we took the time to read through all of those and so I appreciate that. One of the questions we asked staff is a medical diagnosis. Now, of course, we didn't ask specific people what their diagnosis was, but what we had to ask was, if we go on site or a hybrid model, would you need an accommodation that may limit your ability to work on site? 94.4% of our staff said they would not, 5.6% that they uh, said that they would. Now again, I caution that number a little bit because not every staff member responded to that survey. And so much of this gets done in the personnel office with uh, Dr. Uzentis as they go through that. But it gave us a rough number of approximately, if we were on site or blended, how many people would be there. One of the other numbers, I'm so proud to be the superintendent here in District 58, 210 individuals said that they would join working groups to plan for this, 210 in the summertime. Uh, again, I think that speaks volumes for our staff and their work ethic. We then asked if on-site is not doable for our staff, what kind of blended learning would they prefer? And we asked a, a slightly different question. We asked alternate day, alternating day reduced model. And here you see that our staff strongly prefer an alternating day in, in a reduction in the hours of the school day. And I wanna be very clear that that does not mean that our staff are indicating that they work any less. Our staff would work the exact same hours. I think one of the things that we all need to recognize during a pandemic or, or if we're on site or remote or blended, just the extra time of planning and preparation that calls for. You can't even pass out papers in the same way that you would. When you're talking about the earlier grades and manipulatives that are in kids' hands, you, know, you now have to think about how you can use those and individually baggy them because you can't pass them out like you used to. Even cran bins for our younger kids can't happen in this model. So, there's a lot of extra time and preparation that would come into any type of model that the board approves this evening. We also summarize some of the open-ended responses. Now, again, to be fair, you can't summarize 499 responses on a slide, but we gave it our best shot. And so here are some of the things that we heard. Our staff need time to collaborate in this model, especially if there's a remote component to it because that's gonna take a lot of time to get everybody on the same page so our kids get a similar experience. One of the things that our staff, and, and there should be a, a comma after safety, I apologize for that. One of the things that our staff had also indicated was serious safety concerns about coming back to school. We don't wanna hide that, we don't wanna sugarcoat that. I think that is common in every single school district across the state of Illinois. Many of our staff are indicating that they're not comfortable coming back because of the safety requirements and the district's ability to implement those. Workshops are another thing that our staff would be asking for. Deep cleaning is another thing that our staff would be asking for. They need support during this time, frequent check-ins, and then again, that planning time that we had talked about before. 
So how do we go about this work over the last several weeks? Again, I want to reiterate that we didn't just start talking about these things on July 14th. We have been poring over these since March. But we did form four working groups, health, safety, and well-being. If you notice that well-being, we made sure that we put that in there because I think it's very important that we're talking about people's mental health and social health as we go through any of this. Special services, those are our students with special needs, perhaps an IEP, a 504, English learning. We uh, set another group, remote learning, and then we set another group, instructional. And this group combined to talk about modified on-site and blended learning. Of those 210 staff members that indicated that they would be willing to work, we had approximately 175 staff members come in. I want to repeat that, 175 staff members come in and help us with this work. The working groups were tasked with identifying benefits and challenges of multiple situations and scenarios. <clears throat> they weren't tasked with making a formal recommendation. So one of the things that the, the committees had asked us is to make sure that we really highlight that this recommendation is coming from the administration, and that's fair. That's exactly what the guidance calls for, is that a plan would be approved by the district superintendent. So the first area that we worked in, I, I would say probably the one that has the most concern around is health, safety, and well-being. This was led by Todd, and uh, Todd and I also, I tag team, I, I was able to attend uh, two of the four meetings of this group. I tried to get as many uh, working groups as I could during this process, and so Todd is gonna walk us through um, what our protocols would be in the event the board chooses to come back on site in any form. I want to make clear that these would pertain to a blended option. These would also pertain to a modified on site. They obviously would not pertain to a remote option. So Todd and I will walk you through the next few slides and uh, go through what it would look like. Please note that no slideshow can do complete justice for this, so that's why you see a narrative that's also attached to this, and also several plans that still have to be worked out at the building level in terms of doors and who's doing what and all that other stuff. So thank you, I wanna first start by uh, thanking the group. Um, the working group, there were over 22, 23 uh, individuals on that, on that group, and to, to understand um, the workload and, and we were on a shared Google Doc working through that narrative that is in the board packet, and I know that after midnight, there were at least three or four people on there editing, putting questions, commenting, and, and so um, it, it was a, a great process of a lot of people adding in things, and we, we helped make a better document. And it's a document that continue, it was gonna work and change and, and adjust as we keep working through this. Uh, I wanna talk about a little bit, I wanna talk about the how a school day the start of a school day as it changes. Uh, knowing that this uh, pandemic fundamentally changes things, some of it while we're in this stage, some of it may be a permanent piece uh, as you know these things often do. Uh, arrival for a student, uh, we are going to go through a process where families will do a self-check, uh, self-certification uh, before the student leaves their home or wherever they're you know, be on their way before they, they head to school. Uh, I call them the little fast passes that we would do um, that every student would have a thing where the, they'd write the temp, where the family would write the temperature in and certify that they've gone through uh, the, uh, the form and make sure that the student exhibits no signs uh, that are attributed to, to COVID-19. That will be in a lanyard that we will do with a breakaway lanyard uh, that each student will have with an ID and a little pouch so they don't lose these things and whether they're going on a bus or walking or uh, in the car to get dropped off at school, they will have that. That is their, their ticket in, so to speak, their ticket onto the bus, their ticket into, uh, into the school. Uh, they don't have that ticket, then we will have a process both at the bus and at the school for verification to ensure that the student has gone through our verification and answer those questions by a staff member and have their temperature taken uh, before they head, head to their classroom. <clears throat> we will have a bus monitor on the buses so that they can do that before the student enters the bus. We will have assigned seats on the bus so that we know where they're at and when the kids are gonna be at. Uh, that helps for contact tracing down the road but it also just makes sure that we're in a structure so that we're accounting for everybody. 
if a student has a temperature, and this, and I will tell you, this piece and lunch were probably some of the largest amount of time spent uh, over this last week trying to figure out how do we get students into the building safely, how do we secure, you know, make sure everyone comes in safely, and then how do we get a point where we can do lunch uh, safely as well. Um, students will, will go through a temperature check besides that self-verification. If they are, uh, if that bus monitor finds out or has a, a student that has a temperature that is higher, uh, we're going to not let them on the bus and we're going to have a process where that bus monitor gets a hold of the school, we work to get a hold of the, parent, the family so that <coughs> someone can come and retrieve the child if you know, they've been left at the bus stop by themselves. You know, obviously, all of this aside, we can't leave a student at a bus stop unattended. So that will involve administration coming out if necessary and however that process will be. M moving forward then, we have um, students in classrooms and we have some pictures down the, you know, in the presentation of what classrooms look like meeting with the guidelines and the structure that students are six feet apart uh, in the classrooms. And so that piece will be in there as well. Water fountains, uh, and I should say, the list you see here is some of the items. There are a great number of things that we are going through and adjusting to meet all of the guidelines and the criteria from the State Board and the IDPH and working with the DuPage County Health Department. Water fountains will not be operable. Bottle, bottle fillers wor will. And for those systems that have a, a fountain and a bottle filler, we can turn off the fountain piece and the bottle filler will still work. So students can still have their clear bottle, fill it up with water and have that available. Lockers will not be used. So any place where we can limit or that there's no con self you know, contacting or contract between items of students we will work to, to, to adjust all of that. And most of these things, if, you, if anyone's been watching other schools, this is, this is very commonplace. I got a list of things from my kid's school saying, you're not gonna use, my daughter's already lamenting that she's not gonna have a locker to use, uh, that everything is in her backpack. That, that'll be the same process that we will have as well. Uh, washrooms will be adjusted either by partitions or and or items being, you know, sinks being shut off so that they're every other sink so that there is social distancing and allowance in there. Uh, I talked about the picture ID with the lanyard. That is something that will be new, um, but it will also help because obviously masks, you'd like to see who they are and who the kids are. And so that's something we'll start with and as well as a different colored piece. It's one of those best practices for safety and security and given this structure, it's a, time that, a good time for us to implement some of those processes. Also allow them to attach their mask when they get a mask break to go outside so that when you know, they go outside, they have their lanyard, they attach their mask to their lanyard and that way they know where whose is whose when they come back in. And so we will have tents available that we're working on. We've been working with several companies to either rent and or buy. As you can guess uh, by driving around, tents are a rather big commodity these days, uh, particularly the large ones that we want to be up for a period of time. This will allow for mass breaks, either in when it's still drizzling and we can get kids out, or even in the hot, you know, when it's sunny out. <coughs> the big piece and the big struggle and the big conversation is lunch in classrooms. In this process, we are limiting travel of students back and forth to cafeteria uh, so that they're, you know, we're, we're, we're limiting as much contact as possible. Um, and so that is one piece where once we get to a format where we would be full time and have a lunch opportunity, uh, that would be at their desk. And they would be able to take off their mask, have their lunch, we would then clean up afterwards. Hopefully, there's a you know there's some type of break in that piece, um, and going through that that presents some logic some some challenges that we are working through. Um, we think we've worked out many of them. 
we have more to work on. Uh, but that's a big piece of cleaning up their site. Obviously, besides COVID issues, we want to you know, limit such things to limit rodents and pests and so forth as we always do with food. <clears throat> uh, increase hand sanitizer placements throughout the building. We will have and have purchased lots of hand sanitizer. Um, one of the things, and we, and I'm going to take the opportunity to talk about this piece as well as the PPE. The operations team, uh, uh, Kevin and Jeff and everyone started, we started working and having a concern and watching supply chain starting in, in February. Now at that time we were looking at what do we need to have for supplies for summer, for next school year, and having a concern about that. Obviously those have adjusted because different supplies now for fall are needed. But we continually work through and make sure that we have supplies on hand, we know we can order, we work with our contractors and our vendors and look for any opportunity to make sure we have items. As of right now we have <laughs> 13,000 on, on hand, actually we got a large shipment today. We may actually now have 18,000, I'm not sure how many came in today of, of masks. So, and the state just sent a request asking for their address to send the free masks that the state would be sending to all the schools. So we could probably have another 5,000 coming in. Thermometers, we have purchased a great number of them, of the, you know, the touchless thermometers, contactless, and we have an order ready to go for another 150. Actually, I think we already sent that in. Uh, and we will have those in. Um, new cleaning products and protocols. M we have gone through on the operational side with what is required, what is suggested or recommended by the CDC and have evaluated and gone through to get those in stock and order those as well. One of the things that will be in, in the next couple weeks, um, August 12th or 13th, is our misters. We have a couple sample pieces, but they are the sanitizer mister that the uh, custodians can go through at night or in the morning or if necessary during the day when the room is evacuated um, to mist and sanitize. It's a very fine piece that just evaporates. It sits there, it doesn't have to be wiped off. And that is you know, essentially the COVID killer approved product. Before we put that product on, obviously everything must be wiped down and cleaned as you have to do that before you can disinfect. So um, additionally, airflow and air conditioning units, we had, discussed that piece. One of the, one of the positives uh, for Downers Grove is that we have a lot of windows we can open. Um, that's a nice way of saying we don't have air conditioning. Uh, throughout our buildings, fresh air is our friend and very important in this process. We can open doors and leave doors open. Um, that's, that's, not a, that's not an optional thing. But we can open windows and we can have that, that fresh air piece going. Air conditioning units, uh, we will, we're evaluating with our manufacturers what models of filters we can use and go up to as much as we can to you know, control cleaning in that piece as well as increasing uh, fresh air intake into those units. So um, one of the pieces, because we have lots of windows open, and not air conditioning in all but two of our buildings. Um, the district utilizes a time where students can, in very hot days, where we move students in and out of air conditioned sections. That is something we won't be able to do uh, currently. So in place of that, something that uh, we've kind of, we've evaluated that other districts have is an extreme heat day or a, you know, a day where when the heat index hits a certain point and we, it's forecasted uh, as such, our recommendation would be for the board to put in place a policy or that on, you know, at, at this point the superintendent has the ability to put school into a remote format or call, call off on-site instruction because we simply just won't have 
that flow that we normally are used to. The question is with students with symptoms. So we have that verification process where there's multiple ways and times that we are taking the temperature at the bus, at the building. Uh, when a student has uh, a symptom, uh, there's a couple things that we need to have uh, it, it different this year. One is that we have to have a quarantine space that it, when a student has a symptom of, of COVID, uh, that we put that student in that space. And it could be a conference room that we have partitioned off um, and we contact the family and have them come and pick up their student. It could be outside. Uh, obviously in, in good weather, we can have tent areas and so forth where the student could be out there if they're gonna, you know, uh, for a short period of time. <clears throat> so the other piece is we must have a room that in the event we have this position that the student has this symptom, what we will need to do is move the class from the room that that student was in into a temporary, uh, another classroom while that other classroom, their original classroom, is cleaned and sanitized. Now, it is the guidelines that it be 24 hours. However, we can also go in and clean it, sanitize it. We use our mister. Takes 15, 20 minutes. Maybe it's a half hour. And then that room is available again uh, once we have made sure that we've used all the products that are approved to, to kill COVID. <laughs> One of the common questions that I received is what happens if a staff member tests positive or what if a, a student tests positive? Will parents be notified? Will staff be notified? And the answer from District 58 is absolutely people will be notified. We notify our families when there are cases of head lice. We would certainly do that for COVID-19. So I want to stress that again. Families will be notified if there is a positive case in the building. The way we typically go about that to protect student identity, which we have to do, is we identify the grade level in which the case was, and then we report it out to the whole building. And that is exactly what it would look like. The other thing I want to assure everyone as I spoke to you on July 13th, the DuPage County Health Department is an unbelievable partner in all of this. They are dedicating a staff member to respond to all the schools in DuPage County. And I can also assure you that Karen Ayala, the head of the DuPage County Health Department, is second to none in terms of responding to superintendents. Just today, I was sent an email by the health department and Dr. Ruschetti, our assistant, uh, or excuse me, our regional superintendent, asking us to identify who our point person would be in the event the health department and or the regional office needed to come in. If there is a positive case in our buildings, we will not only be knowing our fam or notifying our families, but we will immediately notify the DuPage County Health Department. They have assured us they will come in and assess the situation and then recommend a course of action. As your superintendent, if you choose an on-site model or a blended model, I promise that we will adhere exactly to those recommendations from the DuPage County Health Department. So I did want to clear that up. I know that was a question that we've been getting in terms of notification and, and again, parents will be notified in the event there is a positive case. One of the things we have to be careful about though, and I won't spend too much time on this, but if you go through the symptoms of COVID-19, there are so many that align with other things like headaches and seasonal allergies and those types of things. This is why the self-certification process is so very essential. I'm gonna talk about this uh, in, in a couple slides, but again, the self-certification process is essential to anyone in any uh, place in the state of Illinois for this to be successful. So areas of concern for many of our working groups, um, lunch is a big concern. Uh, I, I think there's a lot of skepticism on whether or not lunch can be successful, especially right off the bat. And so some of the models we're looking at is to take lunch out of the equation uh, until we're confident that we can really do it well. Uh, students in classrooms without masks during lunch is a concern. Students with food allergies, of course, is always a concern, no matter whether we're in the classroom or in a larger lunch space. Clean up time frame. Recess in playgrounds is obviously concerned with kids social distancing and touch points. And then the verification process, that self-certification process as I spoke to earlier. Before, uh, so I think the next slide is going to be uh, Jessica Stewart, our uh, special programs director. Oh, there you are. Thanks, Nicola. Just as we talk about health and safety, it's important to note that there is a portion of our population 
some of whom are served in our special programs, but some of whom are not, that, that really rely on personalized and hands-on care to get through their day safely. So we really took um, a kind of a regional approach to ensuring that we were developing protocols in line with um, SASET, our special education cooperative, that would really ensure that our practices were really supporting that, um, that hands-on care being, being safe in nature, both for the student and for the staff members. So, you know, our, our students in specialized programs are going to see additional temperature checks. There will be additional PPE. Uh, we've come up with ways to uh, allow sensory equipment to be personalized and in instances where, you know, that something can't be replicated, that there are disinfecting practices that will be in place. Um, in some of our programs, we use community outings as really an, an instructional approach. We'll be replicating those activities within our, our students' classrooms and obviously collaborating with our families along the way. If you don't mind, I'm going to do a, a couple of slides from here so we don't have to keep bouncing around and, and driving the camera person crazy here. Um, I did have several um, people ask me, you know, are you going to share concerns that our staff have? And the answer is, of course, we would always share those concerns. Uh, you know, one of the things I want to reiterate with our staff members is that all of us work here in the district as well. We have those same concerns. And, and so the safety guidelines that we're putting in place for our staff are the same safety guidelines that we put in place for ourselves and our children. So staff have expressed concerns about how we can properly implement the IDPH guidelines. And again, I think you see that consistently across our state. Self-certification is also a concern. Um, any model bringing kids back to school in any school district requires a robust self-certification process, which is not just taking a temperature, it's really going over all of those symptoms. I've been asked by many community members, if you're going to bring kids back, what can we do to help? Take this seriously. That would be my number one ask. Self-certification needs to happen. We are going to be, if the board votes on any kind of on-site model, we are going to take this extremely seriously because this is a non-negotiable as we go through this process. We do not want to put our staff in positions where they have to go through checklists and temperature checks. Yes, we can do that every once in a while if a student forgets their slip and things like that, but the self-certification process is, or excuse me, is essential. Um, lunch, obviously, we, we've talked about that that is a major concern for our staff. So again, in, in several models that you'll see tonight, it takes lunch out of the equation for a while. Uh, Another concern, but, but I want to address this and, and, and turn this a little bit, is the, their perception. Um, I know there's a lot of people saying, you haven't finalized all of these safety protocols. And, and, and you know, so for instance, in a school, we've identified that we've got several rooms available, let's say, for that place where a kiddo might have to be quarantined or where a classroom can go. But we haven't said exactly what those rooms are going to be. Why? because we want input from our staff. Our principals, their first day back was today. So our principals really take that time to go through with our staff and they'll identify all of those final pieces. So the analogy that I'm using in the village here has a great picture when they talk about problem solving. So 50,000 feet is where we were at on July 13th. This evening we're at about 5,000 feet. And then from here, over the next four weeks, we get to the ground level with the help of our principals and with the help of our staff. It's kind of a catch-22 because if you finalize every plan and you go through all that detail, people are going to say, why didn't you give me input? And if you give people input, you're going to get critique because everything is not finalized to the last detail. And so that's the predicament we're in. So we chose to make sure that our staff had input. Now I will recognize that when staff have input, they may disagree on the final decision or recommendation. Um, that is totally acceptable and totally fair. Uh, but I will commit to this, as we've always done. We've been working with our associations. Just this week, we've had three joint meetings with all three of our associations. We will continue to meet with our associations and any staff member that has a concern that they would like to be addressed. Um, we're not going anywhere until every checkbox can be checked off and until we can continue to finalize all of these plans. So the next piece of the presentation, we're going to turn over more toward the instructional side. And this is where we're going to give details of what a blended option could look like, what on-site could look like, remote, and then, of course, what the online academy could look like. Once we get done with that, and this is going to be pretty lengthy, obviously, because there's a lot here, 
Once we get done with that, then we will talk about uh, recommendations and moving forward. So as we begin to consider a return to instruction, there are certain things that are true of any model that we might choose. And the first is a recognition that there is not an instructional model that doesn't require us to make some instructional sacrifices within these restrictions, within these times. And that's something that came through in our working group's work. It's something that's been part of administrative conversations. At some point, we are making choices about which best practices we are going to prioritize and which instructional best practices we are going to recognize, we have to temporarily set aside so that we can provide instruction within the guidance and, and, and frankly, restrictions that we do have. What that leads us to then is the need to develop those essential standards for each grade level and each, across each curriculum. We want to ensure that we are making thoughtful decisions in advance. We did this work in the spring, but we did this work as things were ongoing. We would want to begin the school year, regardless of model, identifying those priorities for us as a district. The State Board of Education has said they will be doing this work also. Frankly, we're going to, I, I bet we're going to get there first because we're going to work collaboratively with our teachers here and really define that scope and sequence of instruction in any model for all students, which ensures not only consistency across the district, but it also ensures that we, again, are thoughtfully ahead of time setting the course of action and ensuring that we know what the endpoints will be from an instructional and a standards-based perspective. We know that assessment will be part of any plan. We are eager to know where our students are, what are those present levels. It, it's, it's easy to get lost in hypothesizing about what learning loss may have occurred based on last spring, so we are certainly eager to gain that information. And yet at the same time, we don't necessarily want our first moments of instruction after, after being apart for so long to be a map test, though that will come at some point. The other consideration is how we respond to that data, because it is likely that we will see a different data set than we are accustomed to for our students in the fall. It is likely that it may identify some learning loss. But that doesn't mean for us as an institution that we suddenly turn to remedial instruction or modify and return to a more basic level. In fact, the ISBE guidance is very direct on that and says that the way to close a learning gap is not to simply backtrack but to continue to scaffold and differentiate and challenge our students with all kinds of the instructional strategies that we will have at our disposal, knowing that it, will, it may take time to close those gaps, but they, they aren't closed by slowing down or backing up. They're closed by thoughtful, meaningful, rigorous instruction. We also know that feedback and grades are a piece of any plan, and the ISB guidance does nod toward returning toward the grading practices we would have been using prior to uh, the suspension of on-site instruction. However, while we know that grades are an important part of the conversation, that direct quote from the guidance reminds us that really feedback ought to be our primary focus. And so we will be, in any plan, emphasizing that meaningful, consistent feedback between from teacher to student, and then the response from student to teacher, what do I do with that feedback? How do I respond? How does it help me as a learner? And again, as Kevin mentioned earlier, we know that in every model we need five instructional clock hours on any given day. That does include all instructional activities, so it may include some independent learning, but at, but at the same time we know that two and a half of those hours must be synchronous. So that again means that must be live, interactive between teacher and student. Easily covered on site and then off site covered most likely through a, a video conferencing format. There were a lot of common themes that emerged from the multiple working groups as we've synthesized the work, but, but perhaps none more clearly than the idea that we're going to need some time to make sure that we can implement this all with fidelity. The reality is, regardless of which plan you were to select, not one of them resembles a previous instructional experience in District 58, and you'll hear the details of that as we move through each of the plans. And so regardless of the plan we select, we're going to need to acclimate ourselves to this new normal. We're going to need to build the stamina that we, and the endurance that we need to go forward. Especially if we start talking about on-site instruction, it's been nearly six months since our children have been in, that, in a structured school environment, and the reality is that the environment we're creating for them will be significantly more structured than the environment they, they left in, in March, and so that, so that makes the transition even more significant. We have to acknowledge that we're asking teachers in any of these models to do new things and we want to give them time to develop those activities, to figure out the ways that they can teach their kids how to be successful in this new environment. 
And the last piece here is that m there's just a myriad of educational research that says if, if we feel good about what we're doing, if we can feel confident, we will do it better and the results improve dramatically. And as Kevin alluded to with needing our, our building administrative team together, we need to give our teachers time when they are together. They will need each other to develop these things. We'll all need each other to prepare and build, not only build the systems and, and think about the individual implementation pieces, but also the time to build the confidence within those systems. So as we talk about where we're headed and the decisions ahead of us, it's important to just note that there are some things that have never slowed down, and, and that is related to the work of special education. So despite all of this, this summer we've continued to operate through our preschool screening and child find obligations. I'm grateful to our staff who spent time working through special education evaluations and completing annual reviews. Um, it's all been great work that will continue to propel us forward. In any of these models, um, some of the work of special services really was to consider or to really ensure that four things were in place in any model. The first um, we've already talked about, which is just ensuring those um, special safety pieces that might be unique to some populations. The second is to in ensure that any learning model that was selected um, had the capacity to be, to be flexible enough to meet a variety of learning needs. The third was uh, to make sure that those, those platforms were accessible to all learners, that um, regardless of where they were or how they were receiving their instruction, um, their disabling condition wouldn't get in the way of their ability to engage with it. And then lastly, we wanted to ensure that um, families of students with special needs had meaningful choices and that really they could choose any of these options if they were made available. So as we, we think about that and these important decisions, um, one of the pieces that it will be in place regardless of where we go is just some advanced planning with all of our families. You know, they need the opportunity to understand the options, to provide input on the plan, to discuss with the experts what those recommendations might be for their child, and ultimately to document that plan because regardless of where we go, the amount of minutes and the services and what the day looks like is very different than what it was when we actually wrote the plan. So. So putting that time up front for families so they know what to expect is very important to us and a piece of our plan regardless of where we go. Good evening. So as Dr. Russell uh, alluded to early on, you know, we've got a lot of different phases of learning that we're talking about. So the, the mode that I'm going to start by talking about first is full remote. And this is a scenario in which uh, nearly all of instruction would be occurring with our students off-site for district or DA properties or, uh, you know, for all of their learning experiences. Um, and so that, that could be a situation that's short-term or it could be longer-term. For example, short-term, a good example would be uh, when Todd Drayfall mentioned that uh, you know, if we have an excessive heat day, one day could potentially be a single day of full remote. Obviously, another scenario that we are all probably considering would be a move back to phase three statewide. In that scenario, you can't have any more than 10 people in any given space, which would really prohibit the large majority of our students from, from being on site. There might be a small number of students who, who, could, who could come for particular services, but for the most part, at that point, all of our students would have to shift to a full remote learning. Uh, the, the benefit of this model, then, is that we also have all of our staff simultaneously teaching students in that scenario, and it's not really a split. So we're really able to focus all of our attention on that learning. Uh, so structurally, that looks like what happened last spring, but I, I think it is, I'll talk about it. It, it. It's gonna look different because of a lot of the guidance that we have. The state guidance, again, that Dr. Russell has alluded to, has really paved the way for a lot of the work that we're gonna do, including the document that came out last Thursday. Uh, you know, it was between two of the working group meetings that we had, so you know, our, our team had a lot a lot to parse, but it really did give us some good guidance. And so we're really gonna try to follow that, that document and the other state guidance with fidelity. The work of our working group is also closely guided by the remote, uh, the remote learning task force. Uh, you know, that task force came up with, with a lot of good guidance on, and, on what we should be thinking about, really the questions that we should be answering. So that really has provided the framework and the outline of the things that we're trying to structure and improvements that we're trying to make to the process in relation to what occurred last March, April, and May. Uh, so again, reiterating that idea, it really will look different than what happened in the spring. Uh, and so when you think about full remote learning, you, you almost want to separate from that experience. It's a, we're 
uh, under, should we enter a full remote learning scenario, it really would be under different circumstances. We're going to have more time to prepare uh, and have our students be prepared for this, our staff be prepared for this, and really structure things differently. So uh, w one of the big things uh, that you heard about tonight is that five hours of instructional time. Okay? So that is a must. Okay? That's imperative that we cannot count as an attendance day unless we have that five hours. The state does give a lot of latitude as to what type of activities you could have, but as long you know, it can be independent practice, it can be various learning activities, but it has to add up to five. And again, as you heard tonight, you know, the risk of being redundant, but the 2.5 hours of synchronous, that was what we found out last week, uh, that, that was new information. And, and I think it's a great idea, and I think it was the direction that we're heading. But now we have that concrete, clear guidance that we want two and a half hours of those five to be synchronous, live. Uh, you know, the, the point the state is making is you have, students have to have the ability for it to count to be synchronous. The students have to have the ability to interact with their teacher in a live way. If they're working and they get stuck, it's not sending an email, it's not any kind of delay or getting any response. It's in that moment they can say, hey, I need help with that, this. That's what synchronous learning is. So we're excited to be able to offer that for our students and we really think it's going to enhance the remote learning experience for our students. Uh, again, that, some of those times are proportional. Uh, two hours for a half day program. Uh, and uh, total and 90 minutes for uh, uh, the 90 minutes of synchronous time along with that for a, for a half day kindergarten program. Uh, the, the, the other philosophy that's really guiding our work and, and you'll see this a lot in the narrative, this, this phrase, we really want to work to mirror the on-site schedule in a remote setting. Uh, and we're going to try that from an instructional practice perspective and from a scheduling perspective. And so the idea of a schedule is something that we heard a lot about in the task force. Uh, you know, it, it was really hard to keep up, and we had a lot of competing priorities and, and, and logistical challenges in the spring. But, but now we're going to be able to take an on-site schedule, and if we shift into full remote, we really want to try to mirror that so students have those routines built. And so they know what time that, that they are supposed to be on learning ELA with this teacher in this class, and they know when they're going to have their art class and when they're going to have their PE class, and, and also the instructional supports. That was another thing, one of the challenges, we do provide our students so much instructional support, math interventions and reading interventions and, and, and various other related services. And so to be able to coordinate those in a more routine schedule, I think will, will help families, caregivers, students, and staff. So I, I think we're really excited about that opportunity. Uh, again, <laughs> I apologize for being redundant, but I think it's a really important point that assessment and feedback will be consistent components for the experience. Uh, you know, again, we, we took a different approach to that in the spring. We tried to follow the state guidance that was relevant at the time. Well, now the state guidance, and again, what we feel is best practice, is that we really need to make sure that assessment is weaved into this with consistent feedback. And, and so we're really going to focus on uh, w what some of those best practices are and how you can assess students effectively remotely and how you can provide them good feedback to really support and enhance the learning process. Uh, if we have any component of on-site learning, we're going to use that component to prepare students for remote learning. They need to practice the skills and practice the routines. And so, so last school year, yes, we did have uh, uh, you know, a lot of time on site, obviously, all the way up until March. But, but we didn't really see it coming. We didn't have time to prepare our students. Uh, so we're looking for a scenario where we're on site. Uh, you could talk to your students, you know, when you go home, we're going to practice this skill. And then you can come and check in the next day and see how it went and work and refine. Because our students know how to use tools like Seesaw and Google Classroom. But doing it completely independently when you're learning instruction was a new skill. So I, I think really building those routines in on a regular basis will really improve the process and hopefully uh, let us focus more of our energy on learning than some of the log logistical challenge, the challenges that we had in the spring. Um, and the, something you can hear a lot tonight and, and, you know, uh, is that staff needs time. Uh, and, you know, we really need time for staff to be able to do this. So a, as an administrative team and through these working groups, we're going to prioritize when we build time in the schedule for our staff to work, what skills we need to make sure we're developing, what professional learning needs to be happening. Because there's a lot to do and we have to be prepared for a variety of different scenarios. So, but we're going to make sure that our teachers are ready for this. Uh, you know, a, a good example is just like digital whiteboarding and something like that. Like our, our teachers didn't do, they focused on social emotional well-being and they focused on maintenance of skills last spring. Now we, we know we need to be moving forward in a more uh, in, in a more accountable way, really. And so I think our teachers need to work on developing those skills. Should we go full remote? Are they able to effectively deliver new instruction? Do they have a wide, a wide variety of um, methods to do that? Um, another thing to think about that I think is really important from the guidance is, you know, I, I think we did focus a lot on the 2.5 hours of synchronous time, 
But the asynchronous time we also want to focus on as well. It doesn't just mean independent practice. Uh, that doesn't mean 2.5 hours with the teacher and 2.5 hours of just on your own practice. I, I, the state guidance does a really nice job, I think, of calling out that, yes, it's asynchronous, but there should still be interaction. There still should still be feedback, ways for students to collaborate digitally. Again, the benefit is we have a lot of tools in place. We have Seesaw, and we have Google Classroom, and we have Google Docs. And so we have a lot of tools and technology to enhance that process. Uh, and so I, I think that's something we definitely want to do. Also, I just, it, it is worth calling out that <clears throat> we got a lot of good feedback on some of the paper and hands-on experiences. And so you'll see that be a part of the process too, especially at the primary level for our youngest learners. But even all the way up to middle school, I, I mean, if we are more prepared for this and have more time, I think we'll be able to do a, a more effective job of prioritizing what resources need to go home with students uh, to be in their hands for a period of remote learning. I, I think that was feedback that we heard quite a bit. And finally, on this slide here, I, we want to be able to support families better. We, we, we worked at this a little bit in the spring, and this is actually something that's been on our radar through some of our superintendents advisory councils, really supporting our families and being better partners in the learning, or allowing them to be more effective partners in the learning process. What professional learning can we offer, or what, what learning can we offer for our families, and how to support their child when they're learning the seesaw. So trying to be creative and not just, you know, the videos we can create and the webinars we can have and the different opportunities we can do to really help parents facilitate the process. So as we noted, that comprehensive, comprehensive range of special education services would be available in this model as it will be in every model. There will be, would be a predetermination, um, including our families in that discussion about what supports and services would be delivered synchronously and which pieces of that would be uh, worked on asynchronously. Um, a difference with this model than some of the others we'll look at is we would be also working with families to determine if there are some special education sites, assuming it was safe to, to be on site, uh, you know, are there some special education services that could be delivered on site? So that would be an additional piece to that overall discussion. So again, another component in thinking about the language and how we're defining this is the online academy, which is different than full remote. Right? Online academy will be a supplemental offering to our families uh, should we proceed with a on-site, modified on-site, or blended learning opportunity. So for families who did not uh, want the children to participate in one of those on-site opportunities, they will have the option to uh, commit to and have their child participate in what we're calling the online academy. Again, it is a different experience than the full remote option. So, uh, and this is one of those things that I will say is very challenging to plan when we don't have the numbers. Uh, but, but at the same time, in order to get the numbers and get commitments for parents and families and care, caregivers to understand their options, we need to uh, paint the broad picture of what this can look like. Mm -hmm. So, uh, w what we're envisioning is classes grouped throughout the district uh, into grade level classes. So you've got 11 elementary schools, you've got two middle schools, uh, we're we're going to uh, forget the physical school boundaries and group students in grade level cohorts as much as we can uh, and then have a certified District 58 teacher providing uh, synchronous SEL math and ELA instruction. Uh, the, the goal there again is to be in alignment with that state guidance. That 2.5 hours applies to any instructional day. And any instructional day that we're calling, a, a, you know, we're going to count as a student learning day, has to be five hours and has to have that 2.5 hours, including the online academy. So, you know, we spent a lot of time thinking about how to best allocate that 2.5 hours, and we, and we think that the, the, the most valuable time for those students will be working directly with our District 58 certified staff. And so we, we thought it was appropriate to focus on math and ELA. So that time will be synchronous with a teacher. Uh, at the middle school level, uh, again, it's a little bit more complicated, and, and it's, it's possible we could expand that to science and social studies, but I really think it will depend on the numbers and, and also all the moving parts for blended and modified on-site instruction. So uh, you know, again, there's a lot of things that need to come together before we can make that final determination. But as we talked about in the working group, we, we definitely consider the option that at the middle school level, it might be math, science, ELA, and social studies that are delivered um, by District 58 certified staff. Uh, so the remaining 2.5 hours of that five hour day will be delivered asynchronously. Uh, and so it'll be a combination of using a CELIS, which is the, pro um, the learning program that was used in summer school. Uh, so that they have online courses that are accredited uh, and aligned with our standards. Uh, in addition, what our teachers talked about is, is there, there could be some asynchronous, you know, if a teacher is teaching a synchronous math lesson, there is asynchronous work to be done to take up some of that five hours. And it could also involve practice on some of the digital platforms we already have, such as IXL, uh, 
reading A to Z, read as kids, uh, and also to some independent practice. So that will make up some, so it won't necessarily be 2.5 hours on a cellus, but we do believe um, that a cellus will need to be a part of that experience to, to round out all the instructional content areas. So again, this has to look different for us than the full remote option because of the way that staff is allocated. Uh, in this scenario, we don't have all of our all of our staff working towards this program. They are, they are going to be divided between supporting our students working on site and supporting our students working in the online academy. Uh, again, re reiterating some points, uh, you know, District 58 will sort of by staff will provide the synchronous instruction. The asynchronous instruction will, will be supported by both uh, certified staff and also we envision this being supported by uh, instructional assistants. Our instructional assistants are a really valuable asset in our district and they support learning on a regular basis. So I, I think it, it stands to reason that they could, that they could continue to support that uh, in the online academy. We think it's a great way to utilize that, that resource that we have and support those students uh, through uh, particularly that asynchronous learning. Cool. One of the things that we're looking at, and this is a, this is a challenging discussion in the working group, but really we talked about, we value our specialists, art, music, library, physical education. Uh, but we don't want to overpromise right now. So when parents are making this decision, weighing their options, I, I, we don't know that we can offer specials initially. Uh, our teachers, and I've got a lot of great teachers on the working groups that teach specials, and, and they're, they're really committed to finding creative ways to be able to offer that. So they may have to also support students that are on site, but there might be some creative options to also have them doing both because it, it doesn't seem realistic that we, we'd be able to, with our limited full-time staff, be able to dedicate uh, one of those specialist teachers strictly to the online academy. Again, I'll also preface that we don't have commitments from parents yet, so, so that could change. Is, uh, you know, you'll hear me continue to say that that is evolving. Um, special education supports and services may be interwoven both synchronously and asynchronously. And Jessica will speak a little bit uh, more to that in a moment, but, but you know, just like our uh, student services staff does. They'll always find creative ways to make sure we're supporting our students as we need to. And final class determinations will be made dependent on commitment numbers. But, but a, as we envision this, and as we try to have staffing conversations, and, and this is where you know, we work closely with Jane and Justin and what they're planning for on-site, and try to, try to theorize what type of staff we might have available to support this. Again, you know, there's a lot, a lot of moving numbers. Uh, but but I, I think that the statement that I want to be clear on is it's very likely that the the online academy teacher is going to have more students than they would in typical District 58 instruction. Right, so they're going to facilitate this w with more students than they would, probably just to make the staffing work and for us to be able to put it all together cohesively and have it work. Uh, concept we talk about, again, this isn't, isn't finalized yet, it depends on numbers, but the idea of having uh, an AM section for synchronous and a PM. Again, if you think about that 2.5 hours of synchronous, they could do that twice in one day. And it would be a lot of time synchronous for that teacher, but I think it's, it's a way that we could try to uh, try to get the most that we can out of our FPE and support as many students as possible. It's not ideal, uh, but it's a way that we're envisioning trying to make this work effectively. Um, and with that, I, again, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say the staff had some concerns with the plan as envisioned. Uh, they really were concerned that it's too many students, uh, there's a really large commitment. So I, I think administration is going to really look closely at those numbers and we're going to work to reduce those class sizes to the greatest extent possible, in particular I think for our younger learners. Um, uh, you know, uh, something to think about with those numbers, uh, a comment I've gotten is, you know, 20% of families or 15% of families elect the online academy. Doesn't that mean you can allocate 15% or 20% of your staff to online academy? And if you really think about it, the numbers actually don't work out that way because it, it only works that way if you can collapse a section or reduce a section on site. So you might take a few sections away at a grade level. It really depends on how it's distributed, and it may not reduce, especially with the tight constraints that we have for space in our classes. So uh, unfortunately, it's, it's, uh, it's never as simple as we would hope it would be, but we, we really will work hard uh, once we have those commitments to build out the schedule. Final thing uh, that I'd like to mention is just a consideration for transitions between learning scenarios. This is another question that's come up a lot, and, it, and, and it's complex. Uh, the, the one in particular that's come up is if we go full remote, can students in online academy switch and pivot into full remote? Uh, and I, I think we definitely support that idea, and I, and I think we could find ways to make it happen. It, there, may, there may be a delay, and we wanna, may want to take some time and really be thoughtful about it, right? Uh, if it's only for a week, I don't think you want to take a student out of a class. They're going to do SEL, and they're going to build community with that class in Online Academy, and then take them, put them in a class with all new students that, you know, that they may know from their home school, but, but a different classroom community they don't know, and then pull them back into Online Academy a week later. I, I don't think that's good for the student. Uh, and I think it creates a lot of confusion on, on a lot of levels. So I think we're going to want to be thoughtful 
and think about, again, we're going to look closely at staffing when we make a transition and think about where we're going to put students. So we're not quite ready to commit, but I, we definitely want to work with families on an individual basis to, to put students in a situation where they're going to be as successful as they can. So calling out some pieces within the world of special services that would look a little different in this, and you know, as Dr. Eichmiller um, kind of alluded to, from a staffing perspective, you know, it, it is unlikely for our families of students with special needs that select this as an option. It's unlikely that their 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 current serving team or their their homeschool team is going to be the the group delivering the services. Now, certainly, that all comes down to what, what where the numbers are at and who's in and who's out. Um, but but obviously, as we always do, we are going to set up opportunities for collaboration so that it isn't a brand new team starting over from scratch with no knowledge of your child. There will be opportunities for the current serving team to help support that to be successful. Um, additionally, um, you know, recognizing why a family may choose Online Academy, you know, really unless a family is requesting, we wouldn't be coming to them at any point during Online Academy to say, we'd like to see you on site. Um, we'd really, you know, this this is an option that people are selecting most likely because they don't want on-site as an option. We would be willing to work with families that would be interested in that, but there would be, um, you know, we're assuming that most of our families wouldn't be looking for that. As we move now from the off-site options to the on-site options, it's a good time to, to point out that all of these on-site options are taking the, the things on this slide into consideration. So in any on-site model that we're discussing, we are ensuring six-foot distancing for educational spaces. That includes the way desks are arranged. It means that, that to, to accomplish that, we are looking at class sizes of around 15 and up to 18 in some spaces, which we'll talk more about later. We're also recognizing the, us the utilization of some of our larger spaces. We would be looking at using libraries, most likely. We may be looking at using multi-purpose rooms in the buildings that have them. However, one difference from our presentation a few weeks ago is that as we've gone into a little more detail, at this point, we, we do believe we're able to accomplish the, 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 a situation in which we would not utilize gymnasiums for instruction. Rather, a gymnasium at a school may be one of those spaces that's available if a classroom had to be moved because of a symptomatic student or something along those lines, which helps because it's a larger space and, and has more capacity in those moments of need. The guidance is also strong on minimizing movement and keeping students grouped together. So all of these plans take strongly into consideration the goals of minimizing both the movement of students throughout the building during their time on site and also minimizing the commingling of students so we can keep students in a similar group throughout the day. And then obviously, as Kevin mentioned, this is a situation where masks are worn indoors at all times with the opportunity for outside breaks if we can accomplish six foot distancing in those moments. So over the next several slides, Jane Udentis and I are going to walk through the numerous models that have been considered by working groups. As Justin mentioned, we want to spend some time now looking at and talking about that mod those models of modified on-site or blended instruction. We organized our work with our working groups. We decided to or organize by grade band, thinking that makes most sense to recognize that the age and developmental levels of our learners. And so we um, really worked on the preschool and kindergarten grade band. That was one working group. We had a working group focus on grades one through three, and then a working group focusing on four through six, and then finally a middle school working group as well. As you've heard from Jessica Stewart, Really, that work related to what does this look like for special education services and specialized programs is really facilitated with the work of her groups. So we want to, I would like to start with our preschool and kindergarten age students. Um, the modified on-site, what that would look like is all students on-site each day receiving all of their instruction in an on-site model. This would be a two and a half hour two and a half hours of instruction that's really based on that ISBE guidance. And to accomplish this, we would want to utilize a half day model, that AM PM model. Currently, the majority of our preschool classrooms are already following this model. That, that change would be our kindergarten, where we have an O'Keep offering, that optional portion of O'Keep of kindergarten. We would suspend O'Keep during phase four. It's important to know we're not talking about eliminating O'Keep. At this point, those fees would not be collected during this time, and those families who have already submitted fees, they would receive refunds. 
in this model, we're planning for class sizes around 15 students. So in our work with our staff, we identified some main benefits of having our kids with us for that instructional period, two and a half hours, five days a week. The kindergarten core curriculum is already designed to be accomplished in the half day program. We absolutely will have a higher rate of participation by our students when they're live and interacting and in front of us. Uh, we then can establish that consistency, that ability to establish routines, which are so important for our students. Establishing the social emotional connection and allowing those opportunities for students to learn social, school, social skills, excuse me. That last bullet really referring to that reduced day in that two and a half hours um, we see it is a benefit that we're taking into consideration. It will be a strain for the mass and the social distancing requirement that really relates mostly to those children who would have been in our OP program, who would have been in school in, for a full day. As with all of our models, we're identifying challenges, of course. Um, some challenges we would like to work through are making sure we develop that classroom environment that remains nurturing while maintaining distancing requirements. And our teachers talked quite a bit about some strategies to make sure that kids still feel it's a welcoming, nurturing environment, even though um, obviously it's going to feel much more structured and perhaps more rigid than they would be used to. We will need to individualize um, the material that would typically be shared, as you've heard in the guidance, we wouldn't be sharing materials. Um, and so we would have really re-envisioning what the space looks like. The students would have their own manipulatives, hands-on activities. That's going to take some time. We need to really continue to develop that list and figure out how we would individualize those learning activities. Additional planning is absolutely necessary as we rethink those classroom spaces and instructional activities. And then we would like to recognize there is a greater impact on our families with that increased need for child care for those parents who would have opted for O'Keefe who now will have their children in a half-day program. As we shifted to talk about blended, a blended model, again, that definition really is some of the instruction is on-site, some of the instruction is off-site. There are a couple, po many possible scenarios, I imagine, but the two we really looked at was the five days a week on site, however, you would shorten that instructional time. Or an alphabet split model where students last name A through L attend on one day, students last name M through Z the next day, and then there's an alternating day um, for attending. The benefits, students would have that opportunity to practice for a fully remote model because in that alternating day, they're in school one day, they're at home or in a, um, some other child care center for that period of time. There would be less time wearing a mask and social distancing because they're obviously at school less. Some of those challenged challenges is really that decreased amount of time for in-person instruction, instruction. The requirement for off-site learning activities presents a significantly more challenges due to the age of the learners, trying to really reimagine and, and develop what kinds of activities can kids be successful with while they're at home or again while they're in child care. There will be an increased need for instruction <laughs> and support to be provided by families sorry. and the caregivers on that obviously are these the youngest learners do not yet have that independence to be able to do these activities alone so we want to recognize there will there will be a need for someone to be supporting them and then that last bullet really is recognizing as a result, there will be inequ inequities created for students who need more assistance during the off-site time. Some may not have that opportunity depending on the, the work schedules of families. At the last meeting, we were tasked with determining the feasibility of on-site instruction. And so obviously, the first question is, what is possible? And, and uh, two and a half weeks ago, we stood up here and said, we believe that this is possible. But the next question becomes, is it feasible? And what does that mean when we consider the physical spaces that we have, the staffing that we have, and really the overall educational impact? And so that's what we're going to talk through in the next couple of slides, also recognizing that the, the, the working groups that focused on the modified and blended on-site options really 
worked under the guidance of the distancing, the masks, those kinds of things, but did not necessarily tackle some of the other concerns around arrival, departure, temperature, symptoms, as we knew another group was working on that. So as we prepared these models, our lens really stayed in that within instructional spaces, following the guidance that is required for instructional spaces, how can we, what is feasible in terms of those requirements. So on the next slide, the first question obviously is do we actually have the physical space to accomplish this? And I, I, I believe I said it last time, but eight weeks ago I'm not sure I would have been able to say yes in the way that I am able to say yes tonight because it, it's, it's difficult to conceptualize. The first thing we did was, was actually to go into a classroom on the smaller side of average in our district and space out desks at six foot intervals. And in that first classroom, you know, we found a number of about 16 desks. And so then we backed up and said, okay, let's now do this mathematically and verify our physical work. And so if we know that each person in the room who's gonna be regularly there, so students and teachers, is gonna require at least a six foot diameter, we're gonna give that even a little more breathing room and say six and a half feet, just to make sure we're not truly wall to wall, which tells us then conservatively, an average size classroom in our district is going to accommodate a class size of 16 with a teacher. Um, and so, in an effort to, to show the granular level of detail without getting too far into the weeds of each and every building, I want to give you one example of the way that we did this. So we're going to look at a, a sheet here. And so this is a hypothetical school in District 58. It's an actual school, but we're going to call it a hypothetical school tonight so that we can stay focused on the process of the way we work through this. So what we did was we looked at those approximate class sizes and, and, and broke down into knowing the number of students who are currently registered for this school, how would we accomplish those class sizes, and then is the space actually available? So modeling with a half-day kindergarten model, we would have AM and PM sections, so you would only need one room for, each, for an AM and PM together. So we've assigned a classroom with the square footage. If you look at the way this works, column B is the number of students that would be in that class. Column C is a formula that takes the number of students plus one teacher and multiplies it by the need for that six and a half square foot diameter. Column D is an actual room number in this hypothetical building. And then column E is the actual square footage of that hypothetic, of that actual classroom. And then column F is the difference. So what do we have left over in terms of square footage? And so as you look down, we have some classes of 17 and 18 that require a little bit more square footage. In this model, we did have a couple of larger classrooms to capture. And then we had one classroom that would leave just under 100 square feet. But rolling all the way through with these different class sizes in an actual building, we can see that this works. And so between mathematical estimation and actual physical spacing of desks, we are, we are confident that the spaces exist in each building with the models that we'd be presenting. So James, if you click on the other um, sheet, the next question is, do we have the staff to make this happen? And so this is a different hypothetical school. Um, but if we look at this, this is a typically sized elementary school in our district. And so columns A, B, and C would be what I would call our pre-COVID sections. So if we were opening fully on site with no restrictions, we would have had two sections of kindergarten at 27 and 28, two sections of first grade at 20, two sections of second grade at 26, and so on. And so I've identified teacher names as A and B, just so we can kind of see how that would work over. Again, with the kindergarten half day model in place, those kindergarten classes move over into AM and PM sections, and there's no different space need. They would be accomplishing the same instruction in the same spaces. In the first grade, in this particular model, we've said that there are two sections of 20. And so we have two certified teachers and two section two and, and 40 first graders. And in this model, we're suggesting that that instruction would take place in the library. The square footage makes it available. And then we have a couple of different options. Those teachers could set up a team teaching scenario where they're, where they're all working together in that space, again, at six foot distance, but together. And we have classrooms in our district that have shown us this model successfully. Or within a library, we could set up two independent first grade spaces and we have, you know, that's which creates sort of an open concept within the library, again, within the guidance and, and, and possible. Then the third way we would break down those sections in second grade, for example, is we would take those two sections of 26 and they might become three sections of 17, 18, and 18. And so in this case, we see that then we would obviously need an additional staff member. We would need an additional classroom, and one thing I neglected to mention, though, is by moving those two first grade classrooms to the library, we now have recaptured two classroom spaces. And so as you run all the way through, and doing this with all 11 of our actual buildings, we've been able to go through and calculate, do we have the actual space while remembering that we need 
at least that gym available for an alternative space should a classroom need to be moved. So James, if we could go back to the presentation. And so then that leads us to talk about the certified staff who we would be using to accomplish those numbers. As we talked about that question of do we have the staff to support this model, um, we believe we absolutely do. And what that would look like is identifying additional certified teachers. Some staff members who in last school year were working as reading specialists, interventionists, teacher librarians, or instructional coaches, and then those specialist teachers, meaning an art, music, or PE teacher. I think it is very important to understand um, we would not randomly select people to put in a classroom to teach 15 children. These classroom teachers, we would be look, making those decisions based on classroom certification. A, a large number of the people in these groups have classroom teacher certification. We would also then look at their alignment with previous experience. We have many teachers who, just two years ago, were classroom teachers in our schools who then decided to get additional endorsements. I would like to be a PE teacher. I would like to be a reading specialist, have applied and have moved. But those are very important parts of that decision as far as which teachers would be helping us um, support this model. We are also identifying that with changing a position, again, all our staff, we have outstanding teachers. If you haven't been in the role in a couple years or more, or maybe you haven't been in the role at all, we want to provide those opportunities for support and training. We plan to offer those opportunities through our new teacher week, which ob obviously will look different than our normal new teaching tr teacher week, but there are opportunities there for additional training and support, as well as building in support throughout the school year. And then finally, that last bullet really is referencing um, the work that I've already begun with staff who may need accommodations. As we've mentioned, there may be situations where there's a, a serious medical, situ uh, medical condition that would prevent a staff member from being able to be at work. Then there will be another, a different set of scenarios where there may be a medical situation or condition. However, we need to understand what accommodations we can put in place and we will absolutely do that. So that's what we are beginning to work on right now. These next slides just give a little bit of visual representation to what we're talking about. And so we, we set up a first grade classroom at Henry Puffer School. In this room, we can accommodate 18 student desks with teacher space to move about and have some instructional space. But acknowledging that this room you can see in the lower right picture has the advantage of sort of a bump out bay window. So that's a room that is, is configured uniquely and has a little bit of additional space to capture, different than the room immediately next door, which is the next slide. Another first grade room where we can fit 15 desks with some teacher space. Um, without that bay window, the, the space is a little bit more limited. And so that's an example of if we were to apply this model when, you know, directly to buildings, we would be looking at certain sections, might be 14 or 15, they might go in rooms that are relatively smaller within a building versus sections that are 17 or 18. So what was a first grade room last year or was a fifth grade room last year may or may not be depending on size. We're not, not looking at movement for movement's sake, but recognizing that we have some, some options within each of our buildings because as we've discussed before our buildings are full of additions and various builds at different times and so there is not a uniform classroom square footage. This is a middle school example. This is a Herrick classroom where we've, where we've laid out 15 desks with six foot spacing and you can see there's actually a nice amount using the desks of additional space in that room. A second classroom at Herrick, many of our middle school classrooms are currently equipped with tables or other seating that would be for two students during non-COVID times. So just using that same furniture, we can accomplish 14 students in those tables. So one of the questions we get is, do we even have the furniture to do this? And as we started to use the pieces that we have, again, the answer is, Throughout the district, we do. Now, there are obviously classrooms that have moved into flexible seating and things like that, so there will be some considerations, but we, we believe we can make this work with, with the materials we have. And Justin, just to jump in there, one of the commitments we have from our neighboring districts is that we will all assist each other during this process if you're modified on-site, blended, or remote. And so all of the 99 feeder districts are committed to working together to share things like furniture and other uh, needs during this pandemic. And so if we did run out of anything, that would be the first place we would go to. As we discussed at the last meeting, 
as we, as we look at how this can be accomplished, the space constraints at Highland and Leicester do cause us to have to make an adjustment in those buildings. And so initially we talked about con the consideration of relocating either kindergarten or sixth grade. And, and obviously, we, we've, many of us have been through these decisions before. This is, this is not something that we take lightly. We, we recognize the immediate impact of decisions such as this. Um, considering all of the options and looking at the actual numbers and sections of students that we'd be moving, at this point, we would be discussing a scenario in which the administrative team would recommend the relocation of kindergarten students from Highland School to Bel Air School and the relocation of kindergarten students from Leicester School to Pierce Downer School. The reasons that we looked at kindergarten, part of that is we do have a district precedent of that being a move that we make when we are faced with space constraints. And while that precedent can tell us and inform us of, of like I said, that immediate impact on families that is very real, we also have the long-term lens of that precedent and the fact that we have seen very successful experiences occur after we have made this happen. Another piece is that you know, our kindergarten students are entering a new experience. And, and while there may be some familiarity, we are replacing a new instructional location with a new instructional location as opposed to something previously established. And finally, though you've heard me advocate for six, eight middle schools in the future at previous board meetings, it's important to recognize we don't have that now. And so moving sixth graders into a current middle school would be moving them into an, an inconsistent educational environment and causing a different type of transition. Whereas we were able, if we're moving kindergarten students, we're moving them into another elementary building, which is a comparable instructional setting across the board. This slide has a lot of data on it, and essentially what this is is a, a summary of looking at each building, where are the sections we would need, where are the staff we would need, some extra details, and then noting that we do have at least the gymnasium available in each building. Another important thing to note is that we are running this model for all currently registered students. So that means we, when we are determining feasibility, we are assuming that every student who's currently registered in District 58 would be returning, the number of close to 5,000. We know that initial data is telling us that's not likely to be the case, but we want to make sure we could if we, if we needed to. In reality, if we see that 15 or 20 percent of families elect not to send their children back, as we saw in that initial survey, a lot of these numbers will change. And so that's another question of teachers want to know, well, is it me as a reading specialist who's going to be moved? And, and which classroom is going to be in the library? And how is it going to work? And the reality is it, it's, it's not something we can determine yet because we do want to work collaboratively with our building staff and our building administration. But also we want to do this based on actual numbers. Because as James mentioned, we'll also need teachers for the online academy, depending on how many families elect were to elect that option, assuming we elected an on-site um, you know, model to begin the year. And so it's, it's not dissimilar to planning a large party or a wedding. There's a lot of things you can do, but until you have the final RSVPs, you don't know who's sitting where. You can't make those final arrangements. And that's sort of the state we'll be in over the next week as, we're, as we would be waiting to see what the actual commitment of our families would be. <coughs> So then as we move into talking about our students in grades one through six, we asked our working groups to take a look at four potential models. And I'm going to do just a brief overview of these, and then Jane will talk through the details. The first is what we've called elementary modified on-site. And in this model, all students would attend five days per week from 8.15 in the morning until 2 o'clock p.m. The second model is, uh, we're, the next three models, as Kevin showed that slide with, with vocabulary, are all blended because they require a portion of off-site instruction to complete the five clock hours. However, elementary blended A has the same parameters as elementary modified on site with a shortened day. So in this case, blended A would be students attending five days per week, but from 8.30 till 12.45. In elementary blended B, we, we implement that alphabet split where students attend every other day. So again, students with the last names A through L perhaps on Monday, M through Z on Tuesday, and so on. And in B, that model is from 8.15 to 2. And then elementary blended C is essentially the addition of that shortened day with the alphabet split, as we discussed. So as we begin working with our working groups, we started digging in and really exploring that modified on-site model first, which really means all students, as Justin said, on-site every day. We're looking at a day of approximately 8.15 to 2. In this model, we would be delivering five hours of instruction on site, which would meet the ISBE requirements. Our class sizes would be around 15 students. Uh, again, planning for all 5,000 students to register to attend. We would need certified staff to teach the grade levels. 
which, which means re reassigning teachers and talk, going through that process I discussed just a few minutes ago. Um, our libraries would be used as instructional spaces and multi-purpose rooms. At this point, our gyms are not used as a dedicated instructional space. And then, as you've already heard, that Highland and Leicester, the kindergarten students, would need to be relocated. We had um, some good conversations around specials and lunch. Um, in this model, one idea is students could have art or music once weekly and PE once weekly, along with the supplemental, supplemental activities provided by the classroom teachers. So in, in working with the working group, as well as we've had some initial conversations, initial meetings with our art, music, PE teachers, teacher librarians, I mean, we're really brainstorming what this could look like. One of the things that has been brought up multiple times is the worry of, okay, I'm a, I'm a music teacher. Am I going to see 900 kids over the course of the week in person? And the answer to that is no. Like, we've, we've organized this model, and we have a flexibility and want to work with the teachers themselves. They are the people that are coming up with the great ideas of um, seeing fewer students in person, which is why our kids would not have that, the regular special schedule that they are used to. Um, they would have fewer sections, but then also what could those ideas be for supplemental, supplementing the instruction so they still can benefit from learning the important concepts in our specials. As far as lunch, lunch would be, need to be in the classrooms. Lunch would be included in this five-hour model, and we would need to give consideration for alternate space and plans for those students with severe allergies. So as we then shifted with our groups to talk about, okay, let's, let's outline those main benefits as well as those challenges. For benefits, all of our students are on site for instruction with us. We will have a much higher rate of participation, obviously. Uh, we would have that ability to provide that direct feedback to students in the moment, which is so beneficial for improving their learning and, and helping with understanding. Our smaller class sizes um, are actually obviously smaller than typically in our grades one through six classrooms. That daily on-site instruction provides for consistency and that ability to establish routines. It, it allows us then to also establish that social emotional connection and develop that classroom community. We can provide more, this provides more consistent schedule for our parents, um, recognizing again, there's an impact on all of us, our families, parents, as well as um, students and staff. The five day a week model allows for that con continuity of instruction as students would be assigned to that core teacher, as opposed to some of the models that actually would have students seeing multiple teachers, which you'll hear more about. Our IEP and 504 students would then be on site each day to receive their support. Um, and then again, that reduced stay, we, we have the kids there, we still would want to um, have this model end at 2 p.m. One, taking into account the consideration of that strain, that stamina with wearing masks. The second very important piece is we feel it's very important to capture the time from 2 o'clock on for our teaching staff. As you've heard about that need for collaboration and planning and training, we can accomplish that with that additional time with our staff. There are definitely challenges to work through. You've heard many times that lunch and the cleaning protocols and some of that nervousness or concern by our staff, um, can we really keep all of us safe during that lunch period when kids are taking their masks off? The length of the day, even though it, the, the day would end at two, it's still that the conversation was, well, five hours is still a pretty long time. So there's still some concerns there with that, that five hour time frame. There is less opportunity potentially to prepare our students for a more learning situation as their day is, their five hours is all delivered on site and with a classroom teacher. The individualizing the material, again, that will, that will be a challenge in every model because we're, we would not have our students sharing mater materials or we would minimize any sharing of materials, I should say. That additional planning would be necessary. Our teachers really need that time and the, the collaboration to rethink their teaching space and what those instructional activities would look like. And then there is that challenge of reallocating staff and having teachers who last year were not classroom teachers shift into a different role. And finally, that, um, oh, I apologize, the decreased art, music, PE instruction, as well as library, and then really looking at that reading and intervention support which could be delivered, but it will be delivered in a different format. And Justin will talk about that here 
um, during the rest of the presentation. Finally, then, the students, you, as you've heard, the students moving from their home school from Western Highland, we want to recognize is definitely a challenge. From that modified on site, then we shift to blended, which means some of the instruction is off site as well. So, this blended A option includes the majority of the components, the same components for modified on site with the exception of it reduces the student instructional time from that five hours to four. So our students are on site every day four hours. They would have a fruit break but no lunch. They would then also, that would mean that requirement for that one hour of instruction off site. That could be instruction in art, music, PE, library instruction. It could be a designated content area. It could be a combination of independent practice, check-in and reinforcement, uh, we really envision those decisions and those conversations and decisions being made with our staff once we have direction on our model. Looking at our benefits um, for option A, we would realize the same and the majority of the benefits with our modified on-site. In addition, we, our group identified some additional benefits that we didn't have in the modified on-site model and really it's that shorter amount of time at school Again, for the stamina with the wearing masks. Um, the remote learning is practiced and experienced daily during that one hour off-site time. And with that, our group was feeling students would be better prepared to move to either fully remote, should that scenario happen, or to fully on-site, because they're going to have on-site and off-site consistently each day. And then finally, another benefit is the students would not be eating lunch at school, which really um, has caused a number of concerns. Challenges we'll need to work through. Again, similarly, the individualizing the material, the planning, the reallocation from staff of staff, that's all the same as in the modified model. Additional challenges, we want to make sure we recognize that earlier dismissal time, there is an impact on our families related to childcare and then instructional support. Other challenges, really maintaining that student engagement during that one hour of off-site learning and then the potential for inequities for those students who would need, need more assistance during the off-site time, but not, may not have that opportunity to get that assistance. As we shifted then to look at blended in B and C, we really grouped them. They're very similar. Um, they are, it, both models will decrease the amount of time on-site, and it's just a different way to organize. So it's an alphabet model, Half the students attend in one group, the other half in another. In option B, we would maintain that five hours of instruction and um, there would be lunch in that plan. Option C really reduces the day to four hours, which means we would not have to have lunch at school. And the additional piece here is it would require that concurrent off-site instruction to meet the five hour daily requirement. In this model, as with the others, we are still would still target that class size of 15. And considering benefits, obvious first one is there are fewer students at school or in a school at one time because half the students would be attending. Most likely, there would not need to be movement of students from Highland and Leicester. Students would have two opportunities to build adult connections. Um, and then if we transition to remote, students would have experienced complete remote days as they have the attend one day, fully remote the next. Some of those challenges, students would receive instruction from two different teachers. And in, in thinking about this, if a teacher is on site with the first half the alphabet, and the next day they're on site with the second half the alphabet, they can't be available for the groups of kids who are at home. And so there would be a second teacher, an off-site teacher in this model who would then be delivering that instruction in this every other day uh, model. There's an impact on our families. We want to recognize related to childcare and the instructional support for students. You know, and again, these are the similar, some of those inequities start to increase because now there's more time off-site, which means more time some of our kids may need help from other adults who are not home with them. Um, there will be a need for professional development around team teaching and collaboration becomes even more important as you have that on-site, off-site teacher. Students and the student-teacher connection really is that every other day 
then with each of your teachers. So there's a, a longer interval of time between your interaction with your teacher. And then as for students, it's, there's less consistent. There's so the schedules and the routines. And then the, the last um, challenge is specific to option B, really that lunch and the cleaning protocols, because in option B, lunch is still part of the model. So in all of these models, um, when we look at what our learning targets were and our learning plans that were developed for students with both IEPs and 504s, we have to recognize that they were developed with a different vision for what that educational environment would look like, as well as what those instructional minutes and instructional day would be. So in all of these, there would, there would need to be some conversation around how do we continue to ensure progress on students' learning goals, um, regardless of, of what model we go with. When we talk about modified on-site and blended, um, we really looked at how could we continue to give a lot of flexibility and a range of options for um, teams to be able to deliver services and meet individual needs of students. So obviously um, the prioritization in this model is that we're delivering push-in services, that the adult is going into that classroom space and there is appropriate social distancing and they're delivering in some portion of the classroom that instruction to either the, the student or a group of students who have been grouped together in that cohort to be able to, to receive that instruction and benefit from that instruction. We also know that uh, a number of the students that we work with really struggle with their attention and focus and they have some sensory needs that make it very difficult for them to mitigate in that larger environment where there's a lot going on. So, you know, we wanted to also just recognize that at times an IEP team, including the family, may say there are some things we do need to pull out for. And when that's the case, we really we need to ensure that we are using appropriate PPE, that we are disinfecting surfaces, and ensuring that that's occurring between students coming um, in or out of either a clinician space or another location for instruction. So there really is some individualization that has to occur there. Now I want to speak to this creative use of technology to reduce exposure because what I don't want anyone walking away with a sense of, well, if we're coming into modified on site, you know, maybe a student with an IEP is going to be sitting in the corner on a Zoom call, call you know, working on something with a, a staff member who's in the room next door. We really were looking at, you know, are there places within the model of support where, you know, maybe a student did an end of the day check-in with a social worker, could we do that electronically? You know, oftentimes our social workers and our speech pathologists will, will co-treat in a group. You know, one of, those, one of those staff members might be out doing some things in another classroom instead of going into, uh, you know, a second or a third classroom that day. One of them might zoom in to that group meeting where the social worker may be sitting in person, but the speech pathologist is participating via Zoom. So, you know, really just looking at those resources that are in front of us to be creative about the ways that we can keep people safe. So all of these, though, really come down to looking at the needs of the student, the spaces that are available, and then how we can best do the things we need to do to ensure that students continue to make progress. Before we leave the elementary school models, there, it's important to note there are other programs and experiences and, and supports for students, such as intervention, as we've talked about, math acceleration, our elementary gifted program, our instrumental music programs. There are a number of things that we as a district value and, and, and absolutely want to see offered for our students in, in any of these models. And yet we have to recognize that each one of these would require some significant reimagining to be able to make these things possible. The situation of putting elementary students on a bus midday to go to another school and returning from that is, is probably not consistent with the guidance at this point you know a math acceleration model where students would typically move from classroom to classroom is probably not consistent with the guidance at this point point. and yet there are ways to do that some of the ways to reimagine that include leveraging technology include considering the off-site components of instruction and potentially using those for some of these types of programs so at this point these are things that we want to acknowledge are discussions that would continue to happen once we know what direction we are heading then we begin to tackle the detailed work of ensuring that we keep the robust program programs and supports in place for our students across the district. As we looked at the middle school and the working group met for the first time, we acknowledged that, as we said a couple of weeks ago, this is physically possible. There are 640 students reg registered at Herrick, which can be broken into groups of 16. That would be 40 of them. 
If we utilize every single space, which yes, would include a couple of, you know, a large, maybe two groups of 16 in a cafeteria and using the gyms, it is physically possible. There are also 34 current teachers at Herrick, and so yes, in, in another model, we're talking about reallocating staff. When you look at overall numbers of certified staff, the numbers are there. O'Neill, again, space is a little more readily available, but still there's that gap within teachers. However, when, you really start to, when we really started to talk through what would this actually look like, the scenario is a little bit different than in the elementary school. Middle school teachers are, are, are highly specialized in most cases and have teaching endorsements that allow them to teach in specific content areas. And so, as Jane stated, the, you know, we do have certified staff who could successfully and readily step into a third grade classroom or a fourth grade classroom because that was their experience and training. When we really look at would we need pe additional people to teach eighth grade chemistry or seventh grade accelerated math or Spanish, we don't necessarily have the same certified staff with those endorsements or specializations. The other piece that comes up very quickly is when you maximize space in this way, particularly at Herrick, we really do lose the ability to do any kind of movement, even with the most appropriate distancing and PPE. So as Jessica was talking about the potential for some pullout instruction, this would significantly limit the possibility to do that. It would give us very little levers to move. It wouldn't allow us for, on, you know, for it to even have PE as a movement break on a rainy day in the gym because all of those spaces would be occupied. It also, frankly, would present challenges with having those, those spaces if a classroom needed to be relocated. And with 40 of those classrooms, you would anticipate needing perhaps more than one space in that scenario. It didn't take us long with the feedback from the working group and really, and really looking at this closely to, to recognize that, yes, this is possible. But at the end of the day, the instructional sacrifices, let alone the logistical challenges and everything else, really did outweigh the value of spending too much more energy going down this particular road. And so then we shifted our focus to a blended model at the middle school. The model that we're looking at would be that alphabet split where students would attend on site every other day. The on site instruction would really look pretty similar to a middle school schedule. With the, you know, with essential standards, with, with that on-site instruction, prioritizing the interactive pieces of instruction, the discussions, the, the, the back and forth, that inquiry-based process that, that is more difficult to replicate via Zoom, quite honestly. The off-site instruction would be a little bit different. In this case, the off-site instruction would be provided by another middle school teacher who would be, in most cases, a, a content area teacher, so a math teacher for a math teacher, Sub scheduled similarly by class periods, but it wouldn't be that same teacher. And so let me, let me back up and explain this a little bit. With the, two, with, with the synchronous instruction requirement for those off-site days, we would need to make sure that that was available. But we also know, just as Jane mentioned, in any on-site, off-site model, if I have a first period math class of st 16 students on Monday, A through L, and I have a first period math class of students M through Z on Tuesday, I, as that teacher, am not available to those students on their off-site days, on the opposite days. And yet we have run a, a sample schedule which shows us that another math teacher would be available during that class period. So this is a scenario where I would have an on-site teacher on Monday, for example, who would provide me with on-site instruction and prepare me for what my off-site day would look like. And then on my off-site day, the next day, I would open up a Zoom call at that same time. Because again, taking a step out of it for just a second, one of the pieces of guidance from ISBE that is different than the spring is the expectation of students participating and the expectation of us monitoring attendance and doing all of those types of things. So we would want that to be a component of the off-site instruction. So that math teacher opens up the Zoom, takes attendance by face, and again, we're talking about, you know, may, it could be up to, up to 30 students. It could be two sections of on-site math looking at an off-site day. And that teacher reminds the students of where to find their materials, their digital materials, what the expectations are, and remains available to answer questions and offer support. Because again, we have to go back to remembering that in any instructional model, we are relying on the collaboration and consistency of our teachers. So though I might not be that child's eighth grade math teacher, I certainly am collaborating with my colleagues to know what is happening and to be able to support that instruction from an off-site lens. Another piece that's important to note is that in this model, students would not be moving throughout the day, teachers would be moving throughout the day. So in most cases, a student would be in one classroom and they would experience their seven of their eight periods of instruction while um, a teacher would rotate through 
so that the con again the content area teachers are teaching in those in those specializations. The one potential exception to that that we are talking about right now is there are we know that there are a number of special of different math classes that are available that students are placed into. And one of the instructional practices we are trying to avoid as much as possible is what's called tracking, where you take all of the students at the same ability level and leave them with the students at that same ability level for the entire day. There are, you know, educational research, et cetera, et cetera. It's, just, it's not the best thing to do for students on all ends of the spectrum. There is great value in diversifying classrooms as best we are able. And so one solution that we are exploring right now is the students would move but only for their math classes. And because we would have fewer groups of students, we'd be able to designate two classrooms per math teacher. For example, I would teach a group of math students who would come to a classroom, first period, and then during second period, that room would be cleaned while I taught in the second classroom. So that we would never have a situation where students were using a space, or reusing a space, I should say, without it being properly cleaned and disinfected. As we talked about this, the variance really became, are we talking about longer periods of instruction less frequently during the week or shorter periods of instruction more frequently during the week. And essentially, the feedback from that working group was a preference for, I would like to see my kids more often on site. So if that means that I'm dealing with shorter class periods, I'll accept that rather than waiting four days to see my students. So the next slide is just sort of a visual representation of what that might look like. There are many ways to break up the week, and what we're proposing at this point would be to look at this as that A day, B day, which is similar to the middle school structure we had in the spring, again, keeping that consistent schedule on each day, so that each, you know, each sequential day you have your on-site instruction, off-site, and then you can come back and receive feedback from your on-site teacher on that very next day of school. Approximate hours, when we start to talk about hours, all of this is pending, working all of this out with the transportation companies, and we, we are in process of that, but again, until we have a final direction, we, we wanna make sure we know what we're asking. So what we're looking at here would be maintaining the early bird period, and then beginning first period at 8.30, and ending eighth period at 12.40. The reason for the length of this day is that in the model we're proposing, lunch would not be eaten at school, at the middle school. It's a challenge and it's a concern in every, that's okay. It's a, it's a challenge and concern in every setting. In the elementary buildings, we at least have things like indoor recess where you can almost start to conceptualize what it might look like. At the middle schools, we, we don't, we, we've never explored a model of, of, do, of lunch anywhere other than 150 to 200 students in the cafeteria. And so that is something that would take significant time to explore when we continue to talk about feasibility. It's something we want to look toward but it's something that wouldn't be part of an initial recommendation. However, we're also talking about what is the greatest distance between meals that we are comfortable having students, right? Because you've got to factor in transportation. So the suggestion is to implement that sort of healthy snack break like we do at the elementary school during what would be the home base period. So somewhere in the middle of your day, you would have that opportunity to, for a snack that you brought from home, and that would also include the SEL or executive functioning instruction for our middle school students during that time. So at this point, we're gonna transition into what we would propose as our steps to return to learning. And so I'm going to kind of walk through sequentially what we, what, is, what we are placing forward, and then a little later, Dr. Russell will do an additional summary to make sure that we, <laughs> neither of us miss anything. As we think about that transition plan and recognizing the need for time, what we're identifying is August 24th and 25th are, are currently designated as institute days for all certified staff. Those would remain as they are. They might look a little different, but in some ways they wouldn't because the truth is we still need, you know, we had planned for significant training on a new math curriculum. Obviously the instruction is maybe a little bit reconceptualized, but that needs to continue to happen. We also have training planned on implicit bias and cultural diversity, and that's a topic that we are certainly not going to abandon regardless of the pandemic. The 26th is identified as a, de a dedicated training day for our instructional assistants, that would also remain. And then what we propose is to take the 27th, 28th, and Monday the 31st and access three of the five state approved planning days 
to continue to give our teachers time together to review those procedures and all of those protocols to prepare for student arrival in, in so many different ways, creating those instructional activities, beginning to think about what, in, what collab instructional collaboration is going to look like, thinking about physically arranging environments and what that's going to look like, thinking about the ways we want to communicate. We've had, in working groups, we had wonderful suggestions about taking videos of here is what a space looks like and here are the types of things that we will be doing together and, and sending those out ahead of time so families can begin to prepare. All of that takes time. However, we're not recommending utilizing all five of those days because of the likelihood in all of the guidance that we could have to prepare for a transition at some other point. And so reserving two of those planning days to be accessed at a later point in the year feels appropriate to us at this point. The next piece then would to begin on Tuesday, September 1st with student attendance. However, we would be calling these days, the first through the fourth, and then the next Monday is Labor Day, so Tuesday the 8th and Wednesday the 9th, transition days. And basically this is the concept of we're going to need to build up to whatever model, to whatever on-site model we would, we would be working toward. And so we would need time to teach routines in smaller chunks, to build that mask stamina and all those kinds of things, to really develop that off-site portion of instruction as well. Obviously, to, to begin with building classroom community and connections, but there are, there are just so many structures and it will be a lot for everyone to take in. There's also the reality that we can plan and prepare everything, but until students arrive, there may be scenarios that we either didn't fully anticipate or didn't, or, or will want to revise our approach to, and this will give us a, a, a nice amount of time to have a chance to respond to those things, to have staff on site and really working through what that looks like. Another great example of this is the kindergarten transition. We know that that can be a source of anxiety for, for all family members as we go through that. And so a suggestion made by one of our working groups was to have an appointment set up where a, a few family members brought their students, their kindergarten students. Perhaps we could meet first outside at some distance without a mask to see who we are as, uh, without the mask and then practice putting the mask on together. Teacher brings three students into the room, shows them the, the bit of the layout. Maybe in the meantime, hey, new kindergarten parent, here's how you turn on this iPad that you're now going to need to know how to use. And so we can accomplish some of those kinds of transitional things because we can't do the traditional everyone come drop your supplies off or welcome back nights. That we, we can't have those kinds of crowds on site. In all of those cases though, we would include an off-site portion so that these transition days don't have an impact on our overall calendar. The state gives us flexibility to combine those however we would like, and so we would work to ensure that those days didn't require us, for example, to stay later in June. And so then Thursday, September 10th, and Friday, September 11th would be the days that we would implement our initial phase of full planning, which at this point we would recommend to be the preschool half-day model that we've discussed earlier and kindergarten half-day model. For grades one through six, what we're, what we're asking is to start with elementary blended option A, where students attend the five days a week, but from 8.30 to 12.45, and then the middle school blended option that I mentioned. The reality is one of the biggest differences in the, in the, the times is lunch in both cases. And we have so very many structures and systems that we need to build to be able to bring kids on site at all. If we can take one of those major hurdles away, for the time being at least, it will give us time to ensure we can devote to everything else. And so then longer term, yes, our, our plans are, in, are an intention to prioritize on-site instruction. The only way to increase that on-site instruction, however, would then be to add lunch. Because again, once we get beyond four, four and a half hours, that it, it, it doesn't, it's too long to have kids without serving a full meal, without the opportunity for a full meal. And so in that case, we're kind of targeting that week of October 26th. We'll have had seven or eight weeks to see what this all looks like on site. In the meantime, obviously, with any new scenario or initiative, as we always do in District 58, we convene a group of people to monitor and assess and study and reflect upon what the implementation looks like and how that is all going with a goal of developing that plan for lunch with the target of that week. We would intend to get there, but we would also acknowledge that this would be a work in progress and something we would have to continue to evaluate. Similarly with middle school, if we can accomplish a lunch plan with elementary school that meets all of the requirements and, and, and ensures everyone's safety and comfort to some degree, then we would pursue scaling that to the middle school and considering what that might look like with a, a, a possible implementation at second trimester. All of this assuming that we remain in phase four with the same parameters around instruction.
So through this process, there's been several questions of what is this cost? What are we at? And certainly the budget process will be coming uh, in a few weeks uh, for this next year. The district, like every other community organization, uh, government, uh, industry in the world has been hit by this and will be hit for the next several fiscal years. Um, on a revenue side, with our structure of uh, growth of, of um, property taxes being our base uh, funding system, uh, we grow by the consumer price index. Uh, that has been negative for months on end here and there. It went up a little bit, but you know, we'll see what that is at the end of the year, and that will have an impact into fiscal years 22 and 23. Uh, in this fiscal year, we certainly will have uh, loss of revenue and interest income, corporate personal property, uh, because that is based on on production and, and so forth and, and corporate taxes in the state, uh, local fees and, and, and so, you know, in those areas. Uh, that isn't to say that there's a, you know, that, that changes depending on system and, and, and format as to how we, we deliver instruction. We do have added expenditures, the PPE, cleaning equipment, rented storage uh, facilities as we um, eliminate as many touch points and items uh, in, in the buildings so that we streamline our structures and, and cleaning and uh, the tents. Um, you know, there's an inflated cost um, to masks <laughs> and plexiglass and everything else. Um, yeah, so those are all will have impacts into that uh, into that format. How much is that? Um, actually, next slide. So looking at the two plans uh, or at the at the different formats, regardless if it's modified in person or blended, if there's any point where we're having people back in the buildings, there are base costs that we're going to do. And it doesn't, you know, the one doesn't, there's not going to be a huge impact either way. I mean, they're both going to have in, increases in cost. Those pieces are going to be hundred, hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, we'll have a surcharge in cleaning buses from our transportation companies because they will have that process, uh, that they will have that cost increase to their, their base service. Um, what that total is going to be will depend upon on which format and which program we go with. And in some cases, you know, we're, we, you know, we have some unknowns yet. Uh, we're working through tent rentals and, and that, and that varies um, because that too has an inflated price right now and is in high demand. Um, but we, we will have a better accurate number when we get into the budget, but it w I will tell you it's it's in the hundreds of thousands of dollars range. Um, is it in the millions for this next year? I wouldn't say that um, as far as an impact for COVID, but, um, but there is certainly a piece. And that isn't to say that there, you know, the, there was money that came through as the CARES Act. Um, I would be very, very surprised that there wouldn't be some type of funding coming from the federal government between now and next June uh, to help and assist. Uh, I believe everyone understands from both the state and the federal level uh, our cost and impact into doing this and what it will take to do. Um, they're going, you know, they'll, they'll have to have some, some assistance there. Obviously the easiest, the, the most efficient funding format, you know, as far as reducing costs and expenses is a remote learning format because at that point we have conversations about not having to pay for transportation, you know, that lowering costs on, on operating buildings because we won't be opening them, those type of things. Um, you know, we'll have some increased costs for online postage, hotspots for students who don't have access to uh, internet uh, that will need that in those pieces, but you know, um, that certainly from a financial standpoint, those two differentials. I want to thank 
thank the board and, and the audience and everyone at home. I know this was a very detailed presentation and, and we're almost to the end here. And so to, to summarize the end of this, I, I want to talk about the next steps. Uh, obviously, the biggest thing that we need as an administration is for the board to approve a model or models and a path forward uh, so we can begin uh, these final four weeks before students arrive and, and you know, solidify everything. When the board makes a decision, I will email all families tomorrow a brief summary of that decision. We will then spend the weekend finalizing um, the packet, as I'm starting to call it, or, or the online PDF that will go out to families um, that details uh, what the plan will be. That would be sent out. The target date would be Monday 8-3. However, it could be Tuesday, depending on how long that takes to put together. We are going to be asking for a commitment from families, and that's going to be due Monday at 8-10, or excuse me, Monday, August 10 at 12 p.m. <laughs> excuse me, we've been <laughs> talking all day. Um, <laughs> I, I do want to briefly talk about this. Um, when, when we had talked about asking for a commitment from families, some people, wrongfully so, uh, made, made a statement that, that said that we had already made up our minds. Uh, this commitment from families was going to go out regardless of any recommendation that we made, even if we made a remote recommendation, because we've had numerous families inform us that if we go remote, that is something that families won't tolerate and they'll withdraw their students from the district. So by asking our families for a commitment, um, in, in letting people know that we were going to do that in board briefs. That had no, um, you know, any kind of impact on our final decision. So I just want to make that point for the community. We also want to ask the Remote Learning Task Force to get back together uh, Tuesday at 9 a.m. The reason for that is we had a lot of people in our community, members of the staff and other stakeholders and families come together and say, when you get a plan and when you finalize that, we want you to consider all of these factors. It's our duty to go back to that group and see how well we hit the mark. And if we haven't hit some of those, then we need to make sure that we check off all of those boxes. That's something that we committed to. We are also committing to a YouTube live event. If, if you uh, checked out our parent uh, series uh, where we had uh, parenting in the pandemic, where parents were able to submit questions and then we answered them as best we could, we're committing to that next Wednesday at 5 p.m. And the offer I, I uh, gave to all three of our associations is that we would be happy to do the same thing for our staff, should they want that. Uh, additional Zoom meetings for our special education parents would also begin next week. Jessica Stewart would lead those uh, Zoom meetings. Um, as a special education parent myself, I know just how many questions there are around this, and, and uh, we definitely want to make sure that uh, we provide as many opportunities for our special education families. In terms of what this looks like for families and when they'll be notified of classroom teachers, whatever the board should approve, we're targeting the week of August 17th. And that's in line with what we do uh, during normal uh, school years. One caveat to that obviously would be kindergarten. Should the board choose a half day option, obviously communication needs to go out to our kindergartners sooner than that so we can get our preferences down for AM, PM and then start that division, uh, which is a, is a process that will take some time. So that would obviously be before the week of the 17th. Next step with staff, uh, one of the things that we are working on, just like the packet, uh, is an FAQ for our staff. Uh, we do an FAQ for our family, and we would also do an FAQ for our staff. We would continue our collaborative work with all employee groups and union leadership to plan and problem solve. Uh, then we would have the creation of grade level and building level teams to plan and problem solve what this looks like. So again, that, that's a process I talked about going from 5,000 feet all the way down uh, to the ground level. So in conclusion, I really feel it's, it's important to state where that recommendation came from that Justin just talked about. These did not come from any one of us uh, with a bias, or they did not come from any one of us uh, making anything up. We read that guideline, or the set of guidelines from ISBE, the Illinois Department of Public Health, and the DuPage County Health Department. We were not comfortable abandoning the guidelines set forward by the state, and so that is why we made the recommendation uh, that we make. Board of Education uh, throughout the state they can choose whatever path they feel is the most appropriate. It's our duty as school administrators 
to adhere to the guidelines and, and make those recommendations accordingly. So again, this isn't coming from any personal bias or anything like that. It, it's coming from, as the superintendent, my duty is to read the guidance and inform the Board of Education and then allow you to make your final decision. I also want to highlight that we did ask for input for, from all stakeholders. I'm not saying everybody always agreed on, on how that input went or, or, or the final recommendations, but uh, we did survey people. We got feedback from our associations. I can't tell you how many conversations and emails, well, I can tell the board knows because you were getting many of the same emails on, on all sides of this. And so we have poured through, I mean, thousands of different forms of communication. Factors that we also considered making this decision. Safety, health, and well-being is obviously the biggest factor that we consider. And I can assure you that any recommendation we have is always under the premise that we will strictly follow the IDPH and the DCHD guidelines, ever evolving. Equity is one of the other big factors driving this decision. Throughout the spring, we heard from several of our staff members concern about equity in remote learning and what a different experience it was for so many of our students. The fact of the matter is not every one of our students has the exact same home life. Not every parent can support in the ways others can, whether that's financially or because they're working multiple jobs. There's a whole host of reasons there. And so my view as the superintendent, the more you get kids in person, the less equity issues you have uh, when you're talking about instruction. There are also significant special education equity issues, and there are significant English learning uh, equity issues when you're not able to have students on site. Quality instruction, another huge component. In, in, in I stated on the 13th, and I'll state it again, I am extremely proud of what our school district accomplished. It's nothing short of amazing in terms of remote learning. We hit it out of the park. I'll put our district up against any other district. But I think we all recognize that remote learning is not the same as in-person instruction. It isn't. Uh, it, it, again, we did a great job with it, but it, it doesn't match what our teachers can do in the classroom. That is not putting anything down that we did because, again, we were leaders. I'm so proud of our staff for what they did and how we pulled together. Feasibility was a consideration as well, and how were we able to follow the guidance with online or, excuse me, on-site instruction? And I think you see really the difference there between our two recommendations. It's, in our view, a little different for the elementary school than it is a middle school setting. Working groups. Um, again, working groups did not make recommendations here, but they did provide feedback. Um, a lot of which you saw incorporated into the various plans and uh, scenarios. And then, of course, having options for families. This was something that was important to us um, long before the guidance last Thursday said, you have to do this. Uh, options for families is something that is extremely important. James, we can skip over these two slides. Uh, that just kind of summarized the conclusion. Um, I do want to hit that last one, though, if you don't mind. Excuse me about that. Just want to remind everybody that what we're talking about here would be a half-day program for kindergarten and a half-day preschool program. Preschool is already a half day. Um, it has to be two and a half hours because of the preschool for all grant. Kindergarten, we have an opportunity with busing. It doesn't have to be exactly two and a half hours, but obviously we try and stay as close to that as we possibly could. I want to take a minute as the superintendent to talk about the recommendation of moving any group of children from one building to another. I shared at the last meeting how tough this is. As a parent, I've had this happen to me this school year. Um, multiple uh, kids of mine are going to different schools that we weren't planning on. I do not take that lightly. I understand how hard that is at any point. But the reality that we face in DG 58 is that some of our buildings are very overcrowded and some of our buildings are underutilized. We, we've been talking about this for a very long time. And here you see kind of a direct result of that. Granted, no one could have ever anticipated uh, something like COVID-19. Uh, and we did not take this decision lightly. There is no good decision here. Um, I've had so many kindergarten parents contact me and say, please don't, don't do this if you recommend on site. I've had just as many, if not more, sixth grade parents contact me. And they're all right. Uh, there is no easy decision here. Justin really made some good points earlier about the precedent that we set in our school district with kindergarten. But for me, the, the deciding factor in the recommendation was that kindergarten is going to be a, a half-day program in our recommendation. 
and because of that shortened amount of time and with past precedent. But, but again, I want to reiterate, I understand where our kindergarten parents are coming from in these two schools. I understand the frustration that they have. I'm in the same situation as a parent myself, and I know how hard it is. And so please, for everybody watching and in, in, in attendance tonight, know that this was not an easy recommendation whatsoever uh, to make. We are going to be working very hard with our building principals. They are ready to go. I was so proud of them today at our first day of our administrative retreat to start configuring everything. They worked so very hard. And um, you know, the, the next four weeks, no matter what decision the board makes, it's going to be really centered on transition, 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 and getting everything up and running. So now comes the time for board questions and dialogue. Um, Please know that no presentation, document, or FAQ can account for all the questions and details about reopening. We have over 5,000 students and approximately 700 staff members, each of which views this very uniquely through their own eyes and their own family situation. Everybody has questions. Everybody has concerns about child care. Everybody has concerns about their child safety, staff safety, all of those things. Work will continue throughout the summer and fall. We're not resting until this thing is completely done and like I said, at the ground level. We're happy to provide answers, clarification, and or additional information. Regardless of whatever decision the board makes, we recognize that questions will continue to come up. We recognize that guidance will change. And we also recognize that we're gonna have to make these documents as comprehensive as possible. And we've already started that, but of course we're gonna have to build onto those. So with that, that concludes the presentation. And we are certainly, as an administrative team, ready to answer questions uh, that the board would have. So for, for sake of ease, I, I think I'll go back over to the, the uh, desk over there. I'll let Justin and Jane have the uh, microphone up here in Jessica. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Russell. Um, I'm assuming there's going to be very few questions or dialogue around this tonight. Um, <laughs> Uh, no, but no, so normally I, I, I like to hold my comments towards the end, but I did want to take a minute and just uh, and acknowledge a, a, a couple of things here. And, and one is um, what an incredible amount of work, and we really appreciated that presentation today that came in. I mean, that was in, uh, two hours and 20 minutes. I mean, uh, a lot of granular detail there. There's seven of us that, that sit up here representing our, our community and are, have been asked to be here to provide governance. And... Of this group, we've got former teachers up here. My wife is a teacher. She's uh, reporting back to work in a little over a week. We have people that were asked to be essential workers during this time or have a spouse that has been essential workers. But every single one of us has kids who are currently and will be currently in the district next year. And this process has not been easy on any of us. And, and, it's, and it's been challenging. And, and because of that, as great as this presentation was, we're gonna poke and prod at it and, and try to put holes in it. So before we do that, I just wanted to take a moment and acknowledge the fact that in March, we had no idea that we were gonna be leaving school for the, for the last day for the rest of the school year. Um, and we watched our staff turn to remote learning, to Zoom meetings, to, to keep our kids calm and, and look out for their social emotional needs. And we watched you spin up a task force and, and, do a lot of, um, and do a lot of great work leading up to us. But we didn't get guidance until June 23rd. And in July, the July 13th meeting, you guys came back with that 50,000 foot view. And some of us were not sure that we could hit it, but, but we said, you know what? Um, we put a vote and, and, and we put a challenge out, I think to the staff as a whole that said, Let's try to find a way to get our, our students back in, in, in the building. And I don't remember the exact number, but it was an impressive number of um, amount of staff members that, that came together over the summer to, to make this happen and to actually roll up their sleeves and work. You know, it's really, really easy to point at something and say, that's really, really hard or that's really, really scary. But to sit in a room and say, this is a huge problem, let's break it into pieces and try to solve it. Um, is, is a pretty amazing thing and, and it makes it it's one of the reasons that we want to live here uh, and be part of, of Downers Grove so th that teamwork I just wanted to acknowledge that as, as we're about to, to start trying to poke holes in this I, I did I just I've watched a significant number of board meetings and in, um, in other districts and I've been following what they're doing and I'm just really really impressed with how you guys came together on this and I just wanted to say that 
uh, before we got started. So uh, with that, I will uh, open the floor to questions and dialogue. I don't know if it, I'm just throwing out an idea here in terms of how to kind of organize this. I don't know how other people feel. I have a fairly decent amount of questions and I kind of broke them down into categories like questions related to special services, questions related to health and safety. I don't know if people have a similar mentality of looking at it if we want to try to ask our questions in that format like let's start with special services any questions on that topic so we don't feel like we're bouncing all around i don't know if that makes sense to everyone else i, I think that's a great idea and I, I would actually um encourage you to maybe start off and then like after each topic kind of just pause and see if uh, anybody else up here has any questions on that particular topic so i think okay. that's a, a fantastic idea could, could I also request that we put on uh, page number 79, the one with the actual recommendation on it, so we just have that in our line of sight? Thank you. Right, yeah. Okay, so I guess just first on my notebook of papers here, uh, in special services, that's just kind of where I, I happen to start with my questions, um, so I guess I'll, I'll start there. Um, one of the things that was talked about in terms of um, helping to meet the needs of our special education students in the district um, relates obviously to IEP goals and how those will have to be obviously adjusted accordingly to whatever particular model of learning the board suggest or the board votes on and also what model of learning individual families opt for as well. Um, I believe it was it was explained that there would be um, meetings for IEP families shortly before school started like perhaps within those um, teacher institute type days um, I am wondering a little bit I, I have a little bit of a concern about that just because I think for families myself included it with with two students who have IEPs um, it might be a little bit challenging to make a decision on what I will choose for them without knowing how their goals will be met in a given scenario. Um, so I don't know, and just just kind of thinking through feasibility, if, if at all possible to either allow for flexibility in that, like if I decide, oh, I'm gonna say I'm choosing X model, and then after I have an IP meeting, I decide, oh, that didn't sound, I, I like the sound of something different better. I, I don't know what kind of flexibility will be in that, or if possible to attempt to um, address parents questions and concerns about how goals will be delivered in various models before they have to make a decision yeah and that is that is part of the reason we're offering some of these zoom sessions you know but I recognize too you know that those zoom meetings are not going to be a place where you're going to be able to ask a very personal question about your child's educational services and systems and you know so I think we'll be working with our building principals to try and get as much front information out to our families as we can and have some of those personal conversations on the side so that you can make a commitment and I think we all recognize you know there's a lot of maybe staffing con um, both staffing decisions as well as scheduling decisions that happen on those numbers but we also I think have to leave room for families not fully being informed or decisions being made that really are impactful to what a family is envisioning for their child so I think you know we're really committed to working with each of our families and so I would say whereas we would love it that if every family could identify perfectly for them where they're headed I think we could see some instances where you know as we get into the planning for students who have more complicated IEPs and a lot of services you know that that maybe a family would get into it and and we would be working with them to find a different solution so okay. um, there's also some some conversation um, in various parts of the presentation about um, special services being utilized in both push-in and pull-out models. Um, I am, obviously we're trying to limit the number of people moving between classes and in and out of different rooms of the buildings and things like that. So that is a little bit of a concern um, for how we'll go about doing that. I know obviously the, the staff is going to work to, to reduce that as much as possible, but I think that can sometimes be challenging, especially when we talk about um, utilizing potentially Zoom or things like that to provide services to students where that might be, there might be some like privacy concerns if a student is trying, is supposed to be having a, you know, speech session or a 
social work session or whatever on a Zoom in a class with 15 other students. Um, privacy issues with that, and also even just the stigma. I think there's, you know, I, I can certainly envision my children not perhaps being as ready to, you know, as readily open in things in that type of a setting as they would in a more traditional um, plot setting with it. So that is something that I have a little bit of, of concern about. I don't know if you can speak a little more about that. And also just in terms of, I know when we talked about space in the classroom and um, Justin talked about kind of um, envisioning a classroom and, and making sure that there was space for students and one staff member, but oftentimes in a classroom with special ed students, there is an instructional assistant who is with a student or um, that resource teacher who is pushing in to that classroom at a particular time. And so is that being factored into the equation for social distancing? And can we ensure that social distancing will always be achieved even with additional staff having to occasionally push into a classroom? Is that going to be factored into the space equation? So maybe just to start there, you know, I think to say that we can guarantee that it will always be achieved wouldn't be realistic, but I think we can say that we will always set up scenarios where it is possible and we will be working with our staff and all of our students to understand why it is so important and to implement it to the best of our ability all the time. Like that hundred, and, and I don't know that that's even what you're saying, but that hundred percent perfection piece, you know, that's part of the reason why we're wanting to start slower to try and just develop everyone's understanding of what six feet really means in all instances. Um, but that being said, you know, to speak a little bit to some of these model options, you know, a lot of that is, are those conversations that we want to be front loading with our families. You know, not everybody is going to be comfortable with doing pull out. And, and we do not want to be pushing models that families aren't comfortable with. And that's where, you know, some of that give and take on, okay, you know, if, if pull out isn't a, a model we want to use because of the health and, health and safety piece, you know, how can we work on an articulation goal within a general education classroom? Are we kind of saying that's going to take a back seat right now? We're really going to focus our efforts on maybe reading instruction, which is a little bit easier to deliver in a large group setting, for instance. So, you know, we're really, we really have to get to that individualized piece for each of our families and each of our students, because I think there are so many nuances to, to where a family is going to be coming in at and what circumstances, you know, a student's presenting with in terms of what their needs might be. You know, just to address that privacy piece, mm -hmm. that confidentiality and privacy piece is critical to everything that we do. So, you know, we, again, we, when we put that into our presentation and, and we included that in kind of our, our model ideas, it really is, it will be taking into consideration all of those pieces, but just recognizing that we do have some flexibility to be creative and we'd be working with our teachers and our staff and our parents if we saw a place to put that that was appropriate. Okay. Can I speak to the space? sentences. If, if you look back to that hypothetical school model that we looked at, there's at least a, a 87 was the lowest number, square feet buffer in all of those scenarios, uh -huh. and in many cases a couple of hundred. So with without taking into consideration which classroom might typically have an instructional assistant joining, I can generically say there's room for it, but again that would be where when we start to look at, at classroom configurations, it was actually a question a principal brought up today as we first started talking. Well, okay, but now as I'm thinking of scheduling, I have a student who typically is supported by an instructional assistant, so I have to bring that into consideration. So mm -hmm. that is the work that we would do as we go forward with building level teams. But, but in terms of is the space there to accomplish it, I do believe that it is. Okay. Thank you. Uh, and then my last question, just related to special services, um, in, in t uh, just mostly from, from my, my personal experiences, I think that there's a lot of challenge that's going to come, um, particularly in special programming with um, FBAs and BIPs, and for those people who haven't spent a lot of time in IEP meetings, um, those are behavior intervention plans and functional <coughs> behavior analysis where we're looking at kids who have pretty extreme emotional needs and concerns and, and um, very specific plans to address those needs. And oftentimes um, staff members are unfortunately expected to do a lot of hands-on with those students when they're in a um, increased agitation state and things like that. Um, even to the point where they're where they're dealing with being hit and kicked and spit on and bit and, and things like that. And so those staff are gonna be at a really increased risk and I'm concerned about that um, and how we're going to hopefully try to do, what what can we do to mitigate those risks for those students, especially because I can, I can anticipate um, some of those children have their level of anxiety, their level of tension is going to be especially increased coming back to school after being gone for so long that 
instances of that might be increased at an even more, at an even higher level than in a normal um, school situation. So how, what can we do to try to ensure the safety of those particular staff members who have to you know, deal with those students on a daily basis? Yeah, I think that's a really important question. And we have spent some time developing protocols with SACID specifically around that physical intervention piece because there are times to ensure the safety of a student or to ensure the safety of others in a classroom that we do have to go hands-on. So, you know, it really was the, the challenge of the working group to really think about what things can we put in place to to put more safety features in, in, um, in instances where we know that that may be more likely. And I think looking at our best program would be a, a, a place where we could start because it, it would be a place where we would more often see some hands-on support for students. So, you know, it all starts with setting the stage for success. So. We recognize that we've all gone through a certain amount of trauma and that's going to impact some of our, our students more than others. So as students are coming in, our teachers are going to be setting up trauma-informed spaces and practices so that we hopefully can start to just alleviate some of that uh, unrest that can then lead to more kind of physical manifestations of feelings of not being safe. Along with that, we're kind of setting up the environment to not only be inviting, but also to assist us a little bit in, in keeping that environment safe so that we maybe can um, use the structures of the furniture to be like a first line of defense. So as a student um, starts to become elevated, and, and remember, in our specialized programs in particular, you know, we're doing more te frequent temperature checks because we want, you know, if we have to have more physical management, or hands-on support for a student. We want to know that both the student and the staff members aren't exhibiting um, symptoms of COVID-19. So those things are in place. There's additional kind of hand washing and disinfecting that's occurring. Let's just say a situation starts to elevate. You know, we're going to look at, okay, if the student's really struggling, you know, can we exit the other students to one of those additional spaces that we've identified where it's kind of a, a, a kind of a ready waiting instructional space for um, the teacher to take the rest of the class out to continue whatever was occurring instructionally within that class. And then the adults that are left, and it's probably gonna take more than we typically would have used. You know, typically we have at least two staff members supporting that kind of event. We're probably talking about there being a third, so that, you know, if just using the environment itself to help de-escalate the situation isn't enough and we have to go hands-on, that somebody is there supporting some of the use of the PPE. Because the reality is, like the masks start flying, right? Like we know what those situations look like at their worst. We, we could be using situations where staff are kind of um, switching out, which is, which is a method we use frequently to help with de-escalation so that nobody is in that close contact for more than 15 minutes. So, you know, there are some things that we're putting in place because it, it's bound to happen. I mean, it is just the nature of some of the work that our students mm -hmm. need. Okay. Thank you. That's all I have. Any questions for Jessica? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you, Jessica. So, are we starting another category of questions? We can, or? I, we can start if someone else. I don't know. I don't always have to start if someone else. Yeah. Wants I, to jump I, on another topic. And I feel like you. I feel very comfortable with you being our category leader. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Um, I, my next one would be Online Academy. I just have a couple of questions about Online Academy Basic. Um, I don't know. Um, my first question on that is, is um, do you have, I know you obviously talked about how there, there will be larger numbers in a, like a class grouping or whatever. But do you have you identified like a maximum? Like we are not going to have more than one of more than X number in a particular grouping before we assign a second group. We've talked about numbers, you know, and, and I'm hesitant to speak about absolutes. But I, I think a number that we talked about, and again, I, you know, this is not something that I'm going to say that the the, the working group kind of had one meeting to, to parse these numbers. But mm -hmm. To spit it out, I guess I'd say we talked about for, for a number of around around 30 students in each AM and PM section, uh, you know, so 60 total for a particular student. Okay. Uh, I, I think we talked about numbers that were a little bit lower at the primary level. I think you know when you start talking about uh, those students and their ability to, to, to function in that environment online, I, I think we we thought 25 or 20 would be a little bit more successful in those lower grade levels. Um, 
you know, the, the, the 30 and 30 number is, is obviously a, a big number, um, but it's something that, you know, as we're trying to look at the math uh, mm -hmm. in a preliminary way, we want to give ourselves that option should the need arise. Mm -hmm. And Emily, just to kind of piggyback off of that, I'm sorry. You know, and that's really where the conversation is going. What does it look like for a typical elementary teacher that may have less than 30 in his or her classroom versus a middle school teacher that may have 150 students per day? In trying to figure out how you set that up, mm -hmm. so so much of the conversation, again, will be student interest, um, available staff, but sure. but really trying to make the experience as much as we possibly can that would match. An elementary experience or, or, or a middle school experience. Mm -hmm. okay. um, and then will the um, will the synchronous aspect of the online academy look similar to what the synchronous aspect of a remote learning model would look like? Like in terms of, of having some larger group instruction and then breaking down into maybe some smaller group instruction, kids working together collaboratively over a Zoom or something like that as to how it was kind of explained in the remote model, would that look similar in the synchronous portion of the online? It would look similar. I, I think some of the limitations w would be the, the number of students that, that teacher is working with. So I, I think as we potentially lay it out in the remote learning model, uh, the teachers maybe having the whole, you know, a small group mini lesson, then, then some people sign off the Zoom call, mm -hmm. and then their time becomes asynchronous. Uh, I, I think to be able to fit in a whole day like that in online academy, I, I think you probably wouldn't be able to have students signing off. I think it might be more, uh, again, you know, the initial approach that we're thinking to make that work, to have an AM and a PM would more likely involve a longer Zoom call. Uh, but I think we talked about some strategies where, so, so it would all technically be synchronous time, but it might be, you know, you're on the call, you, you can unmute your microphone if you need to, but you're kind of working on something, uh, and these group, these set of students are working on something else, or potentially, in, in Zoom, uh, there's the breakout room feature, and if we had an instructional assistant who was able to support, you could start using you know, the, the, the breakout room so everyone's supervised, and these group of students are working on some independent practice, and maybe there's an instructional assistant that's in the breakout room with them to answer any quick questions uh, while the, the, the teachers, the certified teachers with another group of students. So I, I think, I don't think we'll have the time in the day to, to necessarily achieve that same structure of kind of signing out, out, off, uh, on and off the call, and I think we probably would have some more sustained longer calls, but we would try to have some creative strategies to replicate the structure, I guess. Does that, does that help? Yes, yes. Um, and then my last one is just, uh, Justin talked a little bit about um, efforts that will be made in, in the earlier days and in, in beginning of the year in terms of trying to create um, meaningful relationships between teachers and, and staff, and um, whether that be online in some sort of a, a you know virtual meet and greet type of setting or something like that will something similar like that also be offered for students in the online academy with their online academy instructors and classmates so that 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 is a good question and, and this is where different working groups probably haven't necessarily necessarily uh, you know <laughs> melded to, together mm -hmm. yet so i think once a plan is adopted tonight i think we'll look and see how uh, you know, what do we want those online academy teachers doing at that time? You know, mm -hmm. So there might be some what of a parallel track, but there might also be some integration in, into some of those experiences. I, I guess what I mean is it, it, potentially the days may not need to be shortened as much for the online academy mm -hmm. to be able to capture all the time. So mm -hmm. I, I don't, I don't want to commit to an answer mm -hmm. on that just yet, but I, I think there's some, I, I think my biggest concern would, would, would be to still ensure that our um, online academy teachers are having time for that professional development because uh -huh. uh, this is going to be a really new experience for them. They're going to be teaching in a completely different way and they're going to have a whole set of challenges uh, that they're going to have to work through. So I'd want to protect that time, uh, but I also would need to make sure that we're honoring the, the five clock hours throughout the course of the day sure. and the 2.5 hours of synchronous. So, so those would be the challenges that we would, we would have to work I, I just think, I think a lot of the feedback we received from people who were potentially interested in an online option was that they still really were looking for that connection with the District 58 staff and other students and being able to also have the opportunity to kind of before actual instruction begins, like a student who is attending on site gets to like yeah. meet their teacher in some setting of some yeah. sort, whether it's virtually or, you know, scheduled times That's in person or whatever, as was mentioned, 
that could be beneficial and useful for students in online academy as well. So just something I think that the committees should talk about and consider because I think uh, that would be helpful. Uh, and I, I really appreciate that, that, that suggestion. We've definitely built in, in general, the SEL component to be, to be <laughs> we, you know, really strong. We want those students to develop a community, even if, mm -hmm. even if they are spread out across the district, we want to have right. a community with their classroom teacher yeah. and, and peers. So thank you for that. that is yeah. a, and, a and Emily, just to kind of piggyback off there, um, I don't think any of us envision a, a, a situation where we wouldn't have something like that in there. Um, the thought of just starting a, a, a class off without building a school community um, just isn't something that, that any of us would ever subscribe to. So mm -hmm. we would work very hard to ensure that that took place. Perfect. That's all I have for online. I have a question for online. Mm -hmm. um, so piggybacking on what Emily said, uh, a lot of the feedback in the 3,572 single line spaces of the survey that I read through, um, when he's counting, um, uh, people were asking about the online academy and wanting more, something more robust than um, just to sell us. Um, so now that with the ISBE guidelines of the two and a half hours, the synchronous instruction with the certified staff member, is it, this isn't like, it wouldn't necessarily be recreating the wheel, right? Like the, the grade level instructor for that academy, that grade or whatever, would be following the scope and sequence of like what the math kiddos or what the kids in first grade math are doing in person. Is that using the same materials and everything else? Absolutely, yes. Yeah, the, the, the intent is, you know, you're, you're talking about first grade, so the, the instruction would be with the Bridges resource that, that, you know, that we've uh, just recently adopted in, in uh, English language arts that would be with uh, with benchmarks, so so those resources will be utilized, you know the, the w w with some different timing and structures. Uh, we think about I don't know how closely it will align, but we really absolutely talked about well, you know, if, if our goal is to have a semester uh, a trimester, I'm sorry, commitment, you know, uh, and obviously you know we don't know how long things are going to last, but you know that is at least the the the, the, the benchmark we've got right now uh, to really look at that end of first trimester alignment to make sure. We're preparing those students potentially, uh, you know, hopefully, to, to, to reintegrate into the on-site experience. So a absolutely taught by our, our certified staff members with our resources, um, absolutely. Would it be like, um, you know, Johnny sitting in first grade has one, t like there's usually like, well, at my, my kid's school was two first grade teachers. So would it be a cert one certified, one staff member to do math and ELA, like, that's or would it be a different? I'm sorry. Would it be a different teacher? That's a great question. Yeah. Yeah. That's okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a great question. We, and we talked about there's you know there, there's some economies of scale to say, and again it really depends on the numbers. But you know mm -hmm. if it worked out that you had two sections uh, at a grade level or you know four A and B M sections at a grade level, you, you could potentially say well this teacher is going to do ELA, and this teacher is going to do math, and that might uh, reduce the, the you know the, the, the preparation and planning that the teacher has to do. However, something that, I mean, th that exact topic came up at our working group meeting and, and a lot of the, especially at the primary level, uh, you know, this didn't come up at the intermediate level, but it might. Uh, just the, the idea of relationships and, and that, you know, I, so I, I think the teachers in the primary level, for the most part, seem to feel pretty strong that they would rather have to prepare for multiple courses and, but be able to build those communities and not have the... the With the same kiddos. Yeah, not, not have the students, this teacher for math, this teacher for ELA. I think the preference, especially primary, was to avoid that. Um, but it's certainly an option, you know, if the teachers and the administrators working on this decide that that's beneficial, I think it's something we could adopt, but I think we would definitely look at the relationship component. And so that asynchronous part um, with using either um, a cellus or whatever, that would be directed, like it would be, it would be, it would be clear to the kid that this is your social studies or this is your science, synchronous, follow along on this and we'll touch base that's the back, the back and forth, and there would be regular touch bases between the synchronous instructor and the work and the kid. Yes, yes, okay. the synchronous instructor, and potentially also, like I said, you know, an instructional assistant helping along. But but the the, the guidance would be coming from uh, from that certified staff member. Uh, you know, and and Acela is, is a new tool, and we use it in summer school. And so there there are a few different modes and ways to use it, and, and what tracks you're signing, and how much work you're signing, and and you know, do you let students progress through multiple lessons? Uh, but uh, the, the short answer is yes. So it, it, the idea is that it's monitored, uh, and they have an and the students are going to have an opportunity to ask questions and check in uh, on how they're coming along with that. It, it, it isn't necessarily a 
it, it isn't a you know, like kind of set it and forget it solution. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, recognizing that also does you know that is another burden for for the teacher, and so that is why we're cognizant of class sizes and really trying to make sure it's a, a situation that that the teacher can handle it and the teacher can do it well. Thank you. For the synchronous portion, where you were talking about how they're going to be utilizing the same curriculum that the on-site students would be using bridges, the science curriculum, et cetera. So online academy students would be given all of those same resources, whether it's like a workbook or a textbook or whatever the yes. whatever is needed, those we, that will be provided as well. well too. Yeah, between the digital materials and the, and, yeah. the, and the physical materials, we have all of that stuff. Okay. Uh, you know, it's a, the curriculum department's been busy this summer as, as they are every summer. But uh, yeah, all those resources are available and they've been purchased and allocated okay. for, for 5,000 students. So yeah. absolutely, we, okay. we want to get those in the hands okay. students. I, I just wanted to ask about the the new requirement. You know, from Thursday, the, you know, if you yes. kind of look at it in terms of five hours, you got two and a half hours of synchronous and two and a half hours of asynchronous. I guess um, you know, Jane mentioned you know there's going to have to be some level of assistance at home. I guess it, as you've kind of evaluated that with the working group, how would you kind of classify how much assistance, say, Johnny, the, the first grader, would need at home during that five hour period? You kind of look at it purely from a a parental or, or guardian perspective. Mm. You know, and that's, and I think for online academy and for, for fully remote, I, I think that's a, that's a, a, a lot. I, I think for, for a first grader, to, 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 for me to stand here and say that a first grader can do any of this stuff largely independently, I, I think would be really misleading. I think we all know that that's not the reality. So the, the better the support that the student has at home, uh, the better that experience is going to be, and and so I, I think that is again, you know, not to, to be redundant, but I think that's why, um, you know, th th that factor that you mentioned, I think, is a big driver in the overall recommendation that we're making. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, parents that elect the online, online academy will, will, you know, I, I think they'll, they'll something we work to make clear that there is a, you know, a, a parental commitment, or you know, a caregiver is going to have to provide some support. And the younger the student is, the more support that's going to be needed. I mean, I think we all know you, you can't just hand a, a first grader an iPad and say, hop on the Zoom call. I mean, yeah, obviously, some are really, are, are getting to be pretty professional with, the, professional with their technology and, and that sort of thing. But, but, you know, support and, you know, they're going to get stuck in certain things and they're going to need guidance. And, you know, a lot of them are still evolving their reading skills. So we can't imagine that they can, they can just read all the instructions. So does that, I, I know, I don't know if that's yeah, no, I, I, I just that think, uh, you know, Personally, when I saw that on Thursday, you know, I, I kind of looked at it as like, all right, you know, this is a, you know, I start thinking of from a teacher's perspective, but then I start thinking of from a parent's perspective. And I, I think, you know, a lot of what's in the community members' heads is, is the experience back in the spring. And now we're, you know, some people kind of said it was too much and that was an hour and a half. Now we're kind of jumping up to five hours. So I just want, pretty much everybody to be aware that this is a, a pretty sizable jump and and, and mandated by the state not by yeah. us correct and I and I want to hop in there and I I often get asked why are so many high schools looking at blended or why why would you even consider blended for middle and then fully on site for um, elementary schools in, in um, you know when you're looking at it from a pure instructional and, and look I understand there are other considerations here very important considerations this is, in my view, why the guidance emphasizes in-person instruction for those under the age of 13. As our students transition to the middle school, and, and I think I'm very qualified to say this because I have a kid in just about every grade level, um, <laughs> <laughs> it is much more independent as you get toward the middle school and the high school. And again, I don't even want to pretend like that's fully independent because I have middle schoolers and high schoolers. It's so dependent on your child. But when you start talking about a five and a six-year-old and a seven-year-old um, and all the way up, the, the reality is that they need a lot of help with any kind of remote learning uh, to be successful. I also want to point out I, I have the privilege of joining several Zoom calls, uh, you know, and I know many of you did as parents to read to children. Um, asking five, six, seven-year-olds to stay focused on a computer screen is a very, very challenging thing. It, it is. Um, and, and to be taught that way, it, it is a huge concern. Um, and, and again, if we're looking at it from a pure instructional lens, I understand there are other lenses that we need to view this, but um, in my view, that's precisely why the guidance is the way it is. Thank you. Uh, that segs nicely into my question. Um, prefacing my, my question by stating that I, I do have serious reservations about whether or not we can 
offer a remote option that meets the quality of instruction that our students, our students are used to um, on, with on-site instruction. Um, I'm deeply concerned about um, the, the accountability measure of that. So I'm thinking about, um, it, as a classroom teacher, I'm regularly gonna have my principal walking through the classroom, giving me feedback, coaching me to get better. That's, that's par for the course, that that's a typical thing that you see in, in education. But if I'm, a, if I'm the, the teacher who's tasked with on-site instruction, or, excuse me, remote instruction, what kind of supports do I have? What kind of supports am I getting from my, from my team, from my principal, um, in order to be the best dang remote learning teacher I can possibly be? Because I, I do feel like we're going to struggle to um, bridge the gap between remote and on-site. So how can we make sure that we are doing our best to ensure quality in that, that alternative option? So I'll jump in first, James, and then let you go. Technology is our friend in many of these areas in terms of collaborating with staff. But um, again, many people know this. I'm married to a middle school teacher. And it isn't the same for our staff either. Um, I can say the same thing, you know, having been at work every day since the pandemic started, when many of our office staff were working remotely, it is more challenging when you have a remote type of, of setting. Uh, again, looking at it from a lens of efficiency and, and trying to get quality feedback, it takes a lot longer to have those good interactions. So instead of a principal walking into your room like I could when I was a principal and say, hey, you know, if you got 30 seconds after class, I'll, I'll talk to you about that. Now it's often setting up a separate Zoom call or a phone call or typing something out and sending it to them via email. It, of course it's more challenging. Even staff meetings are more challenging. It's been my experience with Zoom calls that, um, you know, it's harder to participate when you're one of 40 people on that, that Zoom call. I'm not saying that people cannot do that. Um, so on one hand, Zoom and those things, we've gotten so much better at it, it does make that collaboration a lot easier um, in, in terms of where we were pre-pandemic. Uh, our, our, our staff has done amazing jobs. But again, in my view, it's not the same as when you're in person. So your, your expectation is a principal will say, hey, Kev, uh, can I join your Zoom meeting today and just offer the same kind of um, appraisals that he or she would be giving to the classroom teacher down the hall? Yeah, I, 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 I'm going to answer that very directly. In any of these models, the load on our building principal is significantly different than we're in a, pen, uh, you know, a, a normal thing, if there ever is such a word anymore. And while principals, um, in, in all of our principals have hopped on Zoom calls and they do those things, they're also now um, doing so many other things uh, because of this. So they're helping troubleshoot connectivity issues. They're, they're helping you know, do so many different things, all these job responsibilities. I'm very proud of our principals. They've done an amazing job of hopping on and giving that feedback. But whenever you're under these conditions, no matter what situation you're in, it's just not the same uh, because of so many other factors that you have to be responsible for as an administrator. Mm -hmm. James, I'll ask a question about online academy. The, the, uh, this is really about just remote learning in general with online academy being the offering if you are, if we offer on-site and you choose not to do on-site. But uh, one of the uh, uh, asks I think the community is making is if in the event we have to be remote because we go to phase three or for other reasons, the online academy is going to be our opportunity, I imagine, to start to build that muscle as a district. Or if we have the four hours of on-site and then you have that last hour of asynchronous time that's happening at home, those are our opportunities to build that muscle. So help me understand in the recommendation where there are off-site components to the learning, right? Either you're doing online academy or you're doing the off-site part of your, uh, if you're an on-site student doing the off-site part of your instruction. Um, how much of that is going to look similar to what we would be doing as a district if we were in phase three and all going remote. In essence, my question is how much muscle do we build as a district, as families, as teachers, as students in this recommendation for being remote and being in a remote setting? So I, I think it's something that I know Jane and Justin and Jessica and Kevin and I have talked about quite a bit is, is we, we know we need to be prepared for this. You know, the, 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 the world was, was, and the community was very forgiving 
an understanding of the scenario in the spring. Uh, I, I wouldn't expect that they would be or should be uh, should this happen again. It'd be, fo it'd be foolish for us to not be prepared for it. So I, I think, you know, again, one of the things that you, you've heard talked about in any scenario, uh, we're, we're using that opportunity on site, should we have it, uh, to, to prepare those skills. And I, I think that idea of, uh, I, I think we're really excited about that idea of having perhaps on site, off site, and then back on site the next day. It really creates a really nice feedback loop that our, our, our teachers are used to. They can say, okay, you know, I, I, just, I can just imagine the first day. You know, today I want you to be able to go home and do this one thing in Seesaw and then see if they can do that. And the next day you're going to layer it on, especially with the younger, so layer on another skill. Now you're going to create your own post and you're going to do this. And then, you know, and okay, now I'm going to, we're going to bookmark the weekly plan document so you know how to find that and open this link. So I, I, I mean, I, I, think, I, I think we all know that it's a responsibility that we have to build that skill. Uh, and, and I think, uh, I know that Jane and Justin were talking about it in their group, and I know in our group it's something that we talked about as well. The, the online academy portion of it, it's an interesting component that is, I, again, I, you know, it is kind of a different slice and, and the way that they operate is different, but I do see those, I think you make, raise an interesting point, those teachers, um, you know, should we shift to full remote, I, it could become leaders in developing skills and strategies uh, perhaps in advance of the teachers that are spending more of their time on site. So I think there's a, there's a great opportunity that we can leverage there as well. It looks like Justin wants to chime in on uh, only, only to add that that is actually one of the one of the benefits identified certainly with the elementary working groups in the in these models having that offsite piece as James was mentioning gives you that opportunity to do some of those daily uh, back and forth also those early transition days because again if we're anticipating a transition to phase three we, we need to be realistic that we can't predict when that would be so a major portion of those those transition days in would also be learning right away how to how to work in both on-site and off-site environments the other piece, and, and I want to be careful how I phrase this, but five instructional hours is the requirement. But that doesn't mean that there, wouldn't, there couldn't be additional independent work that might take us beyond that five hours. So even in a model where we have only an hour to practice that, uh, that off-site, it, it, it could look a number of different ways. You know, that off-site hour sometimes may be independent and might extend a little bit further in the elementary model, but it could also be a synchronous piece. You know, the, the 2.5 hours is a minimum of synchro synchronous instruction, but as we are learning how to function in that remote model, to just give another example on top of James's, it could be, okay, this afternoon at 2 o'clock, we're going to log into a Zoom call, we're going to practice the expectations for what video conferencing looks like, and then when we're back together tomorrow, we're going to talk about that experience. And so it really does, in this model, we have a number, I think, of opportunities to leverage that practice. Um, real quick. With that, the way that you're talking about it, the tool sets that we're using, like Google Classroom and Seesaw and, and these, are we going to continue to use them inside the classroom as well to build uh, some muscle memory there so that when they go home, not just in, in off-site time, but in those hours that they're in the classroom, they, they get used to pu pulling up Google Classroom and finding their assignment in there or or wherever it might be. Yeah, the short answer is absolutely. I think yeah. we got a lot of feedback in the spring that said the more consistency of platform we can have, the better this is for everyone across the board. So that speaks not only to the transition between environments, but just the reality of a classroom environment. So yes. Perfect. I just have a question about, this might be you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> one, so stay there, no. Um, one, have we heard anything about fall testing? Has the state well, so this, the, the state required assessments are, are typically in the spring. Oh, just And okay. so they, you know, they have, set, they have sent a calendar out okay. in terms of what that would be, but certainly we've heard nothing more. So we, we have a, there's a proposed testing window, but that is the extent of the detail that we know from state mandated testing at this point. But and, to, to piggyback off that, Jill, um, NWA is exploring options with its member districts. Should we, you know, choose to do that, um, that perhaps, and I want to say perhaps because we want to see how this works, they are stating that there's a remote option now. So um, I, again, James is digging into that. We're waiting for NWA to really give us that um, information and that look. So that is certainly something that we'll be uh, taking a look at. Well, and I would say, I would, I would continue to add that locally, we would absolutely want to administer benchmark assessments at some point in the fall. That's part of that assessment plan for any re-entry model. So, so, the, so, so the method in which we do that will depend on both the model and the availability of the resource. Is there a way for us to then amend or add a little asterisk next to the strategic plan accounting for what those goals might look like or switching that so that 
Um, I mean, I know we're all going to look back on this this time fondly anyway, but the asterisk might um, explain that there's different goals, mm -hmm. or at some point are we going to set separate goals for this coming so, school year based on the differences that are going on? I'll let Justin go and then I'll, I'll yeah, jump I, in. I, well, my, my first answer is I'm certainly not prepared to talk about adjustments to the strategic okay. plan tonight. However, <laughs> we did look into, when we, when we reached the point where we would have had the key performance indicators for the spring of 2020, we did exactly that. We, we, we marked on the document the data was not available because of the suspension of in-person instruction. So, you know, the question as to how would we note that difference, how would we account for some of that, or would we make adjustments, I think, Fortunately, we have some time, and that would be a collaborative effort involving the district leadership team and a number of other of other stakeholder input. Justin just said it. Uh, my recommendation would be that is precisely why we have a district leadership team to hold us accountable to the strategic plan, and I think that is a, a great agenda item um, as we get a little more clarity when we go into the fall about what will those key performance indicators uh, look like, whether that's an asterisk or whether we uh, amend those. I would be hesitant to amend them until we got a really good set of data uh, because then we would know kind of where our benchmark should be at that particular point. Thank you. Just want to make sure we're still looking at all those yeah. measurement, measuring goals. Yeah, and We've the district set. leadership team, obviously you, you all are aware of this as board members, but for the community, continues to meet um, you know, quarterly in accordance with the strategic plan. So we will certainly continue to have this conversation. Are we still on Online Academy or are we mm -hmm. moving on? I was going to say, I don't have anything Everybody specific for remote, but while we have James on the hot seat, if anyone wants to jump in with <laughs> any kind of questions. They're doing really well. A new category, right? Yeah. <laughs> I don't have anything specific to remote, so jump on it. I do reserve the right to have a catch-all category at the end. If you want. <laughs> <laughs> oh, by the way. Oh, by, oh, no, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I'll be your own. I have, I have another question about um, kindergarten. Sure, mm -hmm. go ahead. So I don't know who, who this would be about. Um, actually, just basically on, on the recommendation and with the switch and um, putting O'Keep on pause for right now, um, what considerations for families do we have or what um, leveraging relationships with community partners or whatever do we have to accommodate because um, you know my daughter and my son both were PM kids so I, and they're thriving and it's all it's great um, but I was at home so and it was a different time is there considerations for like if somebody ends up getting a PM and they're at work or like just if you could t flesh that out a little bit sure. for me and plus with um, the recommendation from the administration, it is starting out where we're um, going in baby steps. Mm -hmm. So there is an issue about what, what to do right. with the kids. And, and let me go in reverse order. So obviously, yes, those transition days are, are going to have a different impact on families than, than what would happen as of September 10th, than what might happen as of a future date. So we certainly, we, we recognize that and we understand that and I think what we, you know, what we would hope to do is communicate as we're beginning to tonight some of the, again, this, the more specific details of those days that we would build out and, and really define the value of those days. I think that can help. I, I, we've seen our community be willing to be flexible when, when the value is apparent. And so I, that my hope is that we would be able to approach that in that way. Thinking about the half day model itself, one of our first steps in, in part of the, the communication that would be going out next week would be to send a kindergarten survey of sorts. We typically do this as part of registration, but we, we would add in that, you know, that initial question. Do you have a preference? Do you have, is it AM or PM or no preference, which is exactly what we used to do five, six years ago when O'Keefe was not part, right? And, yeah. so, and so that's step one, is to see you know, how, how, how well can we accommodate that. We've also begun conversations with the Park District to see what they might be able to offer. And this is an example, again, of some of that detail is in the written narrative, there, there's so very much that, that, that's attached to the agenda. But we've, we've begun those conversations to see if there might be the availability for programs to align with the timing of our half-day programs. Again, going back to when we used to offer only half-day programs, many of the, the, the child care agencies around us did accommodate that, and in some cases even provided the transportation back and forth. So we're certainly working very similar to what we did when we initiated Professional Learning Mondays. We definitely would be working with providers to see what options may be available 
for our for our families. But again, all of that is tentative until we know where we are and what the times are. And so it's just each domino helps us get closer to those answers. Yeah, that, that's precisely correct. So we have had conversations with both Champions and the Downers Grove Park District. Uh, both have expressed interest in, in working with the school district um, for not only our kindergarten program, but for uh, other programs as well. I think um, any outside group is going to be hesitant to say we can't do X, Y, or Z until two things happen. Number one, we've got to make a decision tonight and move forward, and then we would have to survey stakeholders, as Justin uh, alluded to, to then give them the interest that, that they would have. But um, I, I've personally spoken with Bill McAdam at the Park District. We've got really great relationships with all the organizations in Downers Grove, and uh, it was a very encouraging call, and uh, you know, he w is more than willing to um, put something together uh, depending on uh, how much of a need there is in our school district. Thank and I would encourage you guys to, to look at that for some of the older grades as well. If we're doing something unique in the middle school, um, I know that at, at 12 or 13, many kids can be home alone for at least a, a certain period of time, but I also know many families that wouldn't feel comfortable with that. Mm -hmm. So they're not ones we would traditionally worry about before after school care, we, you know, Champions doesn't normally yeah. reside in our, our middle schools and stuff like that. So I, I, would, I would encourage us to try to build those relationships and, and survey families to see if there is a, a need or desire to have um, some additional care in some kind of arrangement where they would be able to successfully engage with mm -hmm. remote learning on those, on those off days. Um, so j just, a, just another point that kind of ties in with the kindergarten as well. Okay, I've got kind of just a couple in relation more to the modified slash blended on-site mm -hmm. models. Um, Justin, you talked a little bit about the guidelines talking about um, assessing where students are after the spring um, stay-at-home order and how that kind of might have impacted like loss of learning for students and, and let's let's assess where our students are when they come back to us in the fall and build from there and the need to not kind of resort back to basic teaching to try to fill those gaps. Um, obviously, if we're trying to, as we always do, try to meet students at their level and scaffold and differentiate for students wherever they are within our classroom setting, um, that's a lot easier to do um, pre-COVID, quote unquote, so when you could have small group instruction settings taking place, you could have more teacher one-on-one -on -one instruction taking place that's going to be much more difficult to accomplish in our current models when you have to maintain that six foot distancing and you can't utilize group work and, <coughs> and things like that as we used to so can you speak a little bit about how you're going to differentiate and scaffold to students in a modified blended approach sure um, I would actually be hesitant to say we can't use group work. I would say we can't, you're correct, the, the, the idea of pulling three kids to a table in the back while everyone else is working, that is probably not going to happen. Mm -hmm. But a number of different conversations have emerged, again, and I want to be careful, initial ideas through working groups where there are ways that we could leverage that. I mean, one conversation was as simple as the four desks that are on the outside, I can turn and work with those groups, you know, and, and, I, and I, I could be doing some kind of instruction by just the way I, I physically arrange the room. That's not you know that that has its own challenges as well um you know we had a conversation where the other thing we need to remember is when we are on site we also still have the technologies and the abilities to leverage those technologies while we're in the classroom so another example could be you know we're talking about how could i do guided reading for example what would that look like and so you could have three simultaneous stations happening let's just picture three groups of five in your classroom everyone's at their desk using their device with, with headphones, and I as a teacher open up a Zoom for five students, and we have a conversation while the other 10 are working <coughs> independently, or even better, while a few of those students are Zooming in with a reading specialist who might be getting support in that way. Is that as, is that as beautiful and pure as the, as the models that we're used to pre-COVID? It, it, it's not, but that certainly is a way to replicate some of that in-person differentiation. Obviously, you know, the materials that, you, that we give to students can also differentiate in those ways, and so whenever there is independent practice happening as part of a lesson or even guided practice, the materials we put in students' hands can be differentiated to some degree. 
there also is, you know, differentiation within whole group is not impossible either. You know, the, the, there are certainly ways you can differentiate by question. You can, if I'm doing a discussion in reading, I can walk up to a student and say, in just a couple of minutes, I'm going to ask you to, to, to give me what you think the main idea is. So I want you to think about that. So now I'm, prep, I'm giving that student the, the, the preparation time I know they need to meaningfully participate while I move on to something else and come back and ask that question. Or I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to ask the higher level questions of certain students in the classroom and things like that. So just off the top, there, there are ways, but, the, but it's also worth acknowledging that this is, all the, I mean, I will keep using the word reimagining, like these are things we're going to have to continue to do because yes, there are some best practices that are much more logistically straightforward that won't be available to us. And then I had one question, or really, I guess, kind of two questions, um, more specifically related to like preschool and, and kindergarten. Um, obviously, preschool is very a very different animal, and the the um, way that we go about instructing in preschool. You know, I, my son has been in, in growth for the last two years, and I spent a lot of time going into those classrooms on occasion and, and being able to see how they. Um, how they teach through play, really, for the most part, which is, I think, the best method in preschool education. And there's a lot of, you know, bins of toys and puzzles and book stations, and that's kind of how you give instruction to those students at their at their level. And a lot of getting down to their level and looking them in the eye and giving, you know, instructions that way, which is how they best can take it in and to learn. And so, obviously, with the idea that we're not really supposed to be sharing materials and, and things like that. How is that going to look in preschool? Are we going to be removing most of those items from the room? Is there going to be sanitation? I know you talk, obviously we can sanitize in between the AM and the PM classes, but are students going to be allowed to use those book stations and the puzzles and the toy bins and play as, as much side by side as six foot distancing will allow? And, and how is that going to look? Because I think that is such a huge part of the preschool curriculum that it's hard to imagine what that would be like in this environment. Well, I, will, I can share a couple of the ideas that came through the working group, and I can tell Jessica's got some ideas too, for sure. So. <laughs> So, you know, as we were talking about that, obviously the individualization of materials is one piece. And so we really got, I mean, a couple of our teachers got to the point of suggesting, okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to do yoga mats on the ground. So now I have my space and I know where I'm at. And then we're going to get a Rubbermaid container. So now that's this student's materials. And look, it's also a tabletop. So I can do Play-Doh on there. I mean, I would not have come up with those things. <laughs> these are things, these are things that, that came out of very initial conversations with our teachers. So in terms of the materials and the space, I think there, there are some great ideas. Um, and I'll pause and let Jessica jump in too. Yeah, I mean, I, I would agree. The things that Justin shared are certainly ideas that we've heard from our preschool staff. But um, in addition to that, I mean, it is true that some of the items that our students are used to seeing in our classrooms aren't going to be there. You know, some of those soft and fluffy um, items just won't be appropriate anymore. But some of those other um, toys, thinking about instead of having kind of that free roam through various stations, you know, really instead having students playing in, in more controlled settings with options, but once they make the option, that's their option for that time, is really some of the other things that we've talked about. But really we've seen some pretty um, phenomenal kind of schematics for a classroom setup coming out of the, the preschool group. They've really kind of taken it and run with it. So. Mm -hmm. And in terms of also, and this, I, I think this this aspect of it would also apply to kindergarten as well. Um, a lot of those younger students need still need a lot of assistance with shoe tying and zipping their coats and washing their hands and going to the bathroom and putting their mask on when they've taken it off at recess or snack time or whatever. All of those types of kind of really more hands-on things, just given the age of the student. Um, obviously, that creates additional risk for those those teachers as well coming into that, that more closer contact with those students. Um, how are we, what kinds of strategies have you guys thought about in terms of trying to ensure safety for those staff members in those types of environments and, and those activities? So a lot of that's really gonna come down to kind of on the spot. I, like, as the adult, I'm hand sanitizing and the child is too before I'm reaching in to assist them with something hand over hand. Um, additionally, you know, we may limit you know, certain adults may only work with certain students in a hands-on kind of way, and, and you know, so mm -hmm. these four kiddos are being supported in that way by one instructional assistant so that we're not kind of all working with every student just to try and control some of that. Mm -hmm. So, um, and then also just really thinking again about some of our procedures and the things that we can proactively put in place to really reduce as much as possible. But we also know in a preschool and in a kindergarten environment that is going to be inevitable and we're, we're not, um, we're not doing our due diligence and, and, and moving them along in 
for education if we're not able to do some of that hands-on modeling. Mm -hmm. so. I think to, to piggyback off of that as well, one of the things we pride ourselves is giving parents choice in, in really allowing them to experiment with certain things. Shoe tying is a great example of that, right? Um, however, this fall, whether you're talking about self-certification or whether you're talking about shoes and, and things like that, we're going to be very direct with our families. And, and you know, Velcro shoes. Uh, Crocs. It, it, yeah. I don't know if I'll go that far. There's a lot of issues with those. But um, <laughs> we have to be very blunt with people. And, and I'll apologize in advance to our community if that seems very forward and direct. Because again, we pride ourselves on, on working through things with families and all of that. However, uh, because it has to look so very different, I, I think I can comfortably speak for teachers here. It would break a teacher's heart not to be able to tie a shoe mm -hmm. of a first grader or a second grader when they ask to be able to do that. In fact, I've talked to some of our teachers and they've used that as a specific example. I remember coaching basketball and in, in, in driving home in, in, in the dead of winter and seeing a kiddo in the, the freezing cold walking home. I wanted to do everything to just say, hey, get in the car, and I'll, but you can't do that. And, and the same thing is true here. We can't ask our staff to uh, break social distancing and stuff to put themselves at, at risk unless it's absolutely essential. And so here we have to be very, very upfront with our families. Also, this is where we can help community partners. So if families can't have things, I know Velcro shoes is just one of many, but you know we have a foundation uh, that, that has set up a COVID-19 relief fund. We have so many people asking, just let us know what and when. And these are great examples of where we'll tap our community partners to really help assist with so many of those things. Would we be able then to use those um, when you're in talks with the park district and champions as far as um, families whose both parents are going back to work and they're going to obviously have um, cost problems or being able to pay for things? Is there going to be a sliding scale or are we going to be able to, to um, offer assistance through the education foundation or something um or 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 let and somehow the messaging when we say that there are programs to assist um that it does not mean that certain families are not going to be able to um, enroll because they cannot afford it yeah, and, that, and there brings up the equity issue again right and, and um it's it so one of the things I, I can never guarantee is to speak for any outside organization and say, you know, do you have this or do you have that? I know Katie and Todd have worked very hard with champions about scholarship programs because that's something that's very important to us. Park District does very similar things to a school district uh, on sliding scale and things like that. Again, I can't put words in the Park District's mouth, um, but we will go back to our foundation in, in groups that have set up funds and ask should these programs be available you know can we divert them uh, there are other funds available to us as a school district under title one for homeless students and remember that definition of homeless is very very broad and so there are other groups out there uh, being part of the homeless uh, conversation in downers grove over the last year that uh, started at our library and, and really has expanded out i cannot tell you how generous people have been when we make a call out to our community. And uh, our COVID-19 Relief Fund is a great example of that. And so we will certainly be asking all of our community partners. And uh, my guess is the Village of Downers Grove will not disappoint with that. Uh, they've always done a fabulous job responding to that. And just for those that may not know, listening, the 800 plus, uh, that we do have homeless students who attend Downers Grove School District 58 schools. Uh, we have a significant number of homeless students and so does District 99. Homelessness is a real problem here in Downers Grove. Uh, general question, Dr. Russell, um, you mentioned right at the conclusion of your presentation that the work will continue beyond the first day of school and I expect certainly that's the case. I mean, we're going to encounter obstacles we never dreamed and we're gonna have to pivot. Um, as, as, tell me what that just looks like in your mind um, how are you and your team going to be, um, like, continue to listen to staff, um, hear their input, because um, they're going to be the ones who are going to be on the front lines presenting these challenges to us. To us, How do you continue to, to listen and respond and be continuously monitoring uh, the effectiveness of our plan and, and the safety of the environment we're creating? 
So I am so fortunate to have the team of assistant superintendents that surround me. Um, you know, being in a previous district with no assistant superintendents, I, I said to Jane the other day, uh, I don't know what I would do in this kind of a situation in, in a previous district. Um, I very much envision that these working groups don't cease and we continue with this work. Now, uh, granted, they may be condensed and look different, uh, but I very much um, anticipate that. Uh, talking with our remote learning group, uh, that, that's another um, you know, key community group that we're gonna uh, do. Uh, the work of our building principals, having them back on site, and, and I wanna reiterate, they've been working all summer, but now that they're officially back on site, that's another big piece of the work that we're doing, and, and so building principals working with their uh, building leadership teams will, will help a lot of this. So uh, the, the short answer to your question, though, is just continue the, the process that we've set up with our assistant superintendents and really making sure that we bring that to the ground level. Thank you. In, in case in point of that, um, you know, James already has remote group scheduled um, later on after this board meeting, so the, the work continues. Great. I have a category of health, safety, and well-being. Can we go to that one? For 200, please. For 200? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. What is? The, the answer is... <laughs> We thought we all come up, we might be here a little bit. <laughs> so uh, I'll kick it off with the first question, but I imagine we'll have a number. Um, do you mind walking through the self-certification process? What is it that a parent would be certifying? And how do we as a district verify that? So one thing that I'll say as a caveat is we still continue to get emails about why do we need to be wearing masks inside a building? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and so when we know that that is still a question that people are asking, um, how do we verify the self-certification that we still have standards in our buildings and we're asking parents to self-certify? How does that process work where we can assure that the bubble we're creating inside these buildings is safe? So I want to jump in first with the masks. Um, I've been very consistent. Um, the mask communications have died down significantly uh, post 4th of July, but many of us remember in June. However, we're still getting mass communications. This is a non-negotiable. Uh, masks must be worn at all times. Uh, we've even reconvened our policy committee. I know uh, Jill and Tracy will talk about this later and I implemented a mandatory mask policy or temporary rule until the pandemic is over. We'll be asking board approval for that. Um, I've been very upfront with our parents uh, that masks are not optional and a student will not be allowed um, to attend school if they are not wearing a mask. Um, the next piece in terms of self-certification, education is our best friend in terms of self-certification, but by no means is a self-certification a foolproof system. Uh, so really educating our parents, educating our staff on what self-certification looks like because it's not just our children who have to self-certify. It is also our staff. And so educating them on exactly what that process looks like is so very important. And then teaching our children when they're at school what that process looks like is so very important. Um, in addition to that, we will also be doing temperature checks of our students. Now this is a tricky one because um, we are not going to allow a student into a bus or into a uh, school until they have demonstrated that they have self-certified, uh, meaning that their parents have signed off on it and having that daily ticket before they come into school. I think so many have asked, well, why not just do an app or a form? Uh, the reason we're going with a ticket is um, it is a much more equitable system and it's a much more efficient system because the people at the doors are not all going to be standing there with laptops being able to check and see, hold on, let me scroll through the spreadsheet, right? The problem with the temperature checks is that you could get false positives and false negatives because students are outside and the thermometers aren't acclimated to the weather. So the self-certification is our first line of defense, but then also when students come into school, as soon as possible on the school day, we will be assigning staff 
to go into the uh, grade levels and then quickly check temperatures to make sure that the self-certification matches what they've done. Um, uh, again, having that rigorous self-certification process is essential, uh, but we also want to back that up with temperature checks to ensure that it was matched. Um, I think one of the things that is difficult in, in why so many parents and staff members have raised concerns about uh, COVID-19 is, is the amount of people that are asymptomatic. I've gotten uh, emails from people saying, how can I ensure that um, the self-certification process will handle those who are asymptomatic? And I've been very honest, I can't. If they're asymptomatic, they're not showing any uh, symptoms. And, and I think that is also, or I don't think, I know, that is why we're also taking additional steps on top of self-certification to assure six feet, to ensure mask wearing. So all those secondary and third and, and, and fourth layers to make sure that self-certification is not the only thing. The other thing I want to emphasize with self-certification is this process is not just taking a temperature. It is going through a detailed list. So in the um, self-certification packet that Todd and I are talking about or booklet that goes home, it has how you self-certify on there uh, so, so people can run down uh, that list. Uh, Karad, I wish I could tell you that every single person would do this process with fidelity, um, but I can't be in all our different homes every single day and I, and I know no one is asking that. That's why we feel so important about being so stringent on these guidelines because it is another layer of protection. But as I stated earlier, um, the administration does not claim to provide a risk-free environment. Uh, no one can do that. The second we leave our houses, we're, we're uh, all at risk. We're all at risk right here this evening, but we're all doing the proper social distancing, wearing masks, plexiglass dividers, all of those things. Um, that's the best answer I can give you on how we're going beyond self-certification and, and kind of describing that process. I actually have a, a related question. I guess, you know, we, we typically talk about preventing exposure, right? I mean, that's the goal is to prevent exposure to the virus. But in, in the case where, you know, somebody is exposed and, you know, whether it's a staff member or a student or a community member that needs to go out and get testing, right? Um, can you maybe just talk about what the discussions were within the working group as to, you know, how do we kind of support everybody in our community to kind of get that testing, um, knowing that we're not a, a testing facility. You know, what, what sort of support can we give to our community? Right, and, and that is one of the big, that is continually, as, you know, we keep seeing and hearing, one of the issues and concerns. Um, you know, if you're headed towards a medical procedure, they have a process and, and, and work and immediately get you through. Um, so that that can continue uh, for employers uh, and you know we are rather limited um, in asking to get that through and that's one of those things you know, we're going to be working with Aetna to see what we could do um, you know our, our our health insurance program is Aetna they have a head you know an office here in in Downers um, and so we work with them and group alternatives to see what options we have that we may be able to expedite in some fashion uh, be that we're you know uh, a school district uh, also reaching out to good Sam and see what availability they may be able to assist us with this and that um, barring that you know we are at the whim of you know the, the, the governmental structure of, of going and getting you know those tests um, for you know, in line and so forth. But that's that's one of those pieces that we've got to work through yeah, to try I wanna to improve on what that is. But right now, that's what we've got. Yeah, I want to piggyback on, uh, on that, and I'm going to take a slight detour from COVID-19. One of the things that Todd has worked on this year, which I think is essential in any year, especially this year, uh, it, flu season is coming up. And having opportunities for our staff to receive their flu shot on site. I, I think that is so very important is a piece of that. Uh, and that's an example of a local health partnership that, that we're working on. Um, also working with the health department, superintendents have asked the health department these precise questions. What can we do more when the health department says, you know, what do you need from us? We're saying we need you to go out into the communities and provide flu shots for everyone, right? Because that'll help with so much of this is these two 
viruses converge on each other uh, coming up here in the, the late fall to winter months. That, that's something that um, is very important to us. Right now, uh, the County Health Department does offer a free testing site uh, to residents of DuPage County. Um, and it is their commitment that they're going to continue to get better and better and ramp up at that. But, but Todd is right to a certain extent. Um, we don't have testing. Um, no school district no. does. The CDC guidance and the IDPH guidance doesn't um, suggest that we should test every student. However, when we have a positive case, I, I get a lot of questions about this. Well, what are you going to do? Um, the very first thing, as I stated earlier, when we have a positive case is notification of families, getting the health department in there, and then really talking with the health department about where we can get tests for people that are impacted, especially our staff members uh, that are in those buildings. And, and so being a public organization, we are dependent on the health department to really help with those. And uh, they are getting better and better at that. The tests are getting better and better. But there are significant concerns in any public setting with testing, just because even if you can get a test, sometimes it's four or five e days even longer before you get the positive result. One key piece in the guidance that I want to uh, emphasize with everyone, um, and Jane and I have been working with this through uh, various staff members or community members, even if you get a negative test, you still have to quarantine for the entirety of the time. So if you were exposed to uh, someone or if you had it and you get a negative test, you are not allowed to come back until that period uh, the 10-day the period has gone all the way through. And so I think that's another important piece on top of testing to strictly adhere to those quarantine rules so that, um, you know, we can make sure that we're making people as safe as possible. We are accelerating our conversations, though. Uh, most school districts are with our health care providers about how can we get our staff members quicker access to those. Contacting Advocate, we've got one of the biggest hospitals uh, in the state of Illinois right here in our town, uh, seeing what resources they can have uh, made available. So right now we are only um, able to share the county health department besides telling people to go to their individual providers. Uh, but certainly uh, the more we can expand not only COVID testing but flu shots are something that's extremely important to all of us. So kind of following up with that is, um, so if a child does test positive and is self-quarantining is is there going to be an immediate response as far as um, their teacher to get them into remote i mean obviously they could be well enough to participate in things or they could be sick sick so mm -hmm. is there a is but is there something so that it's that there's not four or five or six days of oh we'll get you all your stuff you need i mean they would go right into to something. Yeah, so I want to make sure I'm understanding the, the, the question correct. Uh, if a child in a classroom tests positive, again, we're going through the notification, we're working with the DuPage County Health Department. The guidance that we have right now is if anyone was in close contact for more than 15 minutes on a given day with that child, they have to quarantine as well. If you're not sure or if you, you know, they, everybody has to quarantine at, at that particular point that isn't sure whether or not they had close contact. So I don't think we can assume that everyone would be ordered in a quarantine situation by the health department. No, just for the one student or for the, the class. Oh, I'm sorry, Joe. Thank you. So what will we yes. do for that student? So, we, we've right. actually had a lot of conversations with that. And this is one of those questions where we ask, you know, what did we do prior when we had students that were out? Okay. You know, one of my kids was out 10 days in a row last year because of significant flu. That is where we're still, we wouldn't switch that student to the online academy because that wouldn't make sense. Right. They, they wouldn't be in the same situation. But that's where we're working with our classroom teacher, the building principal, about how we support a student uh, that is sick in the same manner that we would have done uh, post, or excuse me, pre-COVID. Thank you. Can I come back to the self-certification for a minute? Mm -hmm. um, so if a student comes to school or comes to the bus without their self-certification form, which obviously we're going to do everything to encourage that to not happen, but it's, we know what's going to happen. People are going to forget, whatever the case may be. So can you walk me through the process of what sure. happens when that happens? So if, in, the, in either example, there is going to be someone there that is going to go through that, that, that certification, that verification process. If it's the, on the bus, it's the bus monitor. 
you know, before they get, you know, going through that piece, taking a temp, um, talking to that student, making sure that they have not had any of those symptoms or have been in contact with someone that they know that had a positive COVID, which is one of those items that's on that list. Um, then they'll be on the bus and go through and they'll have, we're looking at the idea of the fast pass being a white piece of paper, the other pass being maybe a yellow paper because we'll want to track that back and make sure by the end of the day there's a communication back to the family to make sure that they are doing that self verification because we don't want to you know, we want to minimize those lines we want to have people working through that and being cognizant of of their their students health each day um, if it's a student who walks or rides or however they get to uh, the school not on the bus uh, and they don't have it then there'll be a separate line place um, section for that verification from a staff member and the same thing will happen that you know they'll get that you know we'll go double check that piece and then there'll be a follow-up so that we continually work to behavioral modify to make sure that parents are going through that process um, and trying to minimize that as much as possible I have some significant concerns with um, relying on students to self-certify for themselves let me, I think let that's very risky yeah let me let me jump in there and, and elaborate um, I think all of us who have little kids when you ask them if they're sick they say yes if you ask them if they have a toothache they say yes right they're, they're unreliable reporters I, I think that's very important uh, to, to recognize right and, and um, so the key line of defense here is if someone hasn't completed the self-certification with their their parents they're not getting on the bus they're not getting inside because then if you bring them inside you have potential of now causing um, a, a greater risk so the, the thought process behind the self-certification in a bus monitor is if a child does not have that self-certification that's where we're going through with the adult that's where we're taking the temperature if the bus monitor is unable to complete that self-certification because the, the the kiddo can't you know talk or, or they're nervous or something like that that's really where that bus monitor would would get off socially distant call the building principal building principal would get in contact with the family and uh, you know we would complete that process there uh, before the child would enter the bus and we would do the same thing at the school building uh, we would make sure that age appropriateness in, in, in going through that but it is um, you know a difficult challenge with any self-certification because there are so many symptoms on here but that's why completing this at home is a real essential uh, process yeah I understand I think even not even just with young children and young children are especially concerning they don't even understand what half of these symptoms are and what they mean or what it means to were you exposed to someone with COVID-19 in the last 14 days they are not going to understand what that even means so that's that's a whole nother animal but even older kids who do understand all of this stuff I don't necessarily feel comfortable just trusting that they're gonna give you an honest answer every time I, I think that's pretty risky I don't necessarily think that is a particularly safe approach to take I understand that there's gonna be situations where parents are gonna forget to do the self certifications and we have to have a process in place I think we might need to, to think that through a little bit more and come up with something that is a little bit less risky. Yeah, personally. I, 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 no, I, I definitely hear your concerns, Emily. And, and one of the things, too, not, not being a, a, a hospital or anything like that, I will say, though, the IDPH guidance, and you know, even here when you're coming into the village hall, this is an example where I do believe that we're going further as a school district. Um, in any school in Illinois than, than when you would walk into a restaurant or when you would walk into you know the village hall or or a place like that right really in society right now it's basically you need to wear a mask um, but in schools we're going through a self-certification process we're going through a temperature process we're making sure that we're adhering to six feet of social distance so again to me the best defense is just these layers of redundancy but but nothing in society right now is a foolproof uh, system it, it isn't and, and and so I totally understand the concern uh, my response to that is I agree with you on everything that you stated uh, but I think that's why the IDPH really went further in making sure that you got to do this 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 and that's why our, our, our safety committee 
um, really said, we're not comfortable with just self-certification. We also want temperatures taken. Now, I know there's issues with, with temperatures as well. But again, how many of these layers can we do? Uh, there is no risk-free environment. I, I, I keep saying that. It's how many layers of that uh, can we put in to mitigate risk? Mm -hmm. As long as we're talking about the, the bus, uh, one of the um, survey slides talked about um, bus transportation. I don't know how many kids in the district actually take the bus. I know my, my kids have qualified for the bus. And um, in, in this instance, when I filled this out for myself, I said that I would drive my kids because I'm blessed to be at home and I'm able to do that to alleviate traffic on the bus. If it's, it looks like it was pretty 50 50, is that, is it, can you say, can, can we glean from that that potentially the buses might not, could be half full? Mm -hmm. So yeah. I, I think you can certainly glean from that information that ridership will be down. Um, I think it's one thing to ask people on a survey, and then it's a much different question to ask them to finally commit, right? So we do sometimes see numbers change between you know, a, a survey in your final commitment. One of the, the points that I want to continue to emphasize is that we are still staffing our bus routes as if every kid was going to ride them, and we're still staffing our schools as if every kid would attend. Uh, that's being done very deliberately, not to waste money, but to make sure that if somebody changes that commitment, A, we've got enough room, but B, also, if people don't come, then it, it, it is just more space that would be available. So yes, we are anticipating that the buses would be um, less full than they normally would be. Could we encourage that? As it, <laughs> you talked about, like saying that um, if, no. if people are available to. Emily, I, I think we could encourage that. Or excuse me, uh, Tracy, I, I think we could encourage that. I think we have to be careful uh, about telling people who qualify for a bus route that that they're not allowed to take it, especially when the guidance says right, that they can't. That being said, though. We can certainly encourage people to drive to school, but, but we have to be careful with that as well uh, because one of the things that we're already anticipating is traffic and, and, and how that's going to go into school now. Um, we can deal with longer lines of traffic as that means in, enhanced safety, but I, I have to be very careful about, and I'm not suggesting you were saying this, uh, about people who qualify for something telling them that they shouldn't take it. However, if people have their means or other means, excuse me, uh, certainly we would encourage them to, to do that because um, it's just less crowded on that bus then. So we're sharing buses, with, we, are we still sharing buses with um, St. Mary's and St. Joe's and? The St. Mary's, St. Joe's buses, those are separate routes. And that's so a separate bus. We provide bus, buses, yes. but we don't. We provide busing for um, students who live within the district that attend St. Mary's and St. Joe's uh, but, those but are separate bus routes. Not, they, right. We do not. They are not on our. Uh, those students have it. Yeah, we we have our own separate bus structure for that. Okay. They do have their own separate routes, but yes, the buses are reused. So there is a cleaning process for in between, if that's what you're getting at. That, that's where I was going. Thank yeah. you, Katie. <laughs> sure. Mm -hmm. While we're on buses, I have a couple other bus questions. Um, we talked about having a monitor on the bus um, to handle the self-certification slips and temperature checks and, and things like that. Um, are those monitors, are those going to be District 58 staff members? How are we planning on, on doing that? Uh, first student does not have staff to accommodate for that, so they would have to be District 58 personnel. And so they will, so those staff members will then go from their bus to a classroom in a given school for the remainder of the day, theoretically. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. Yes. Okay. A um, little bit of a concern there for me with the exposure to 50, potentially 46 students on a bus and then moving into a classroom with a different grouping of students. That's, again, kind of a, a little bit of additional risk there. Um, I also, is there going to be a monitor on, I know we, I had heard something about a monitor on the, on the way to school because of the self-certification piece, but potentially not a monitor on the bus on the ride home from school. Is that accurate or is that not? Correct. We, we would, I mean, the process for the monitor is to ensure that uh, there's a verification process, not for other issues and discipline. We, we, you know, I don't believe the district has had a history of having monitors on their buses, right. at least for some time. Okay. Um, my other concern or question there, I guess, then is, is in terms of um, because we can't necessarily guarantee six foot distancing on the busing, um, we're obviously in requiring masks to be worn at all times like right. any other time but mm -hmm. again 
we know that these are kids and we know that there could be whether it's just you know kids being kids and they their mask falls off and they don't put it back on or they're willfully taking it off on the bus um, because we're not six foot distancing and we will those kids could be on a bus for more than 15 minutes um, having someone to be trying to um, kind of monitor and ensure that masks are remaining on on the bus is a concern and I think relying on the bus driver to do that is a little risky they should be focusing hopefully on driving and, and watching the road and not looking in the river mirror and even the idea that bus seats are pretty high I don't know how many people have been on a bus lately bus seats are pretty high looking in that rear view mirror you might not even be able to see every kid that's on the bus so what if there's a case where you have students who have their mask off for the entirety of the bus ride and no one ever knows and they've then caused a lot of exposure and risk I have some some safety concerns in that area as well I'll jump in on, on that one in particular. I, I've had so much experience in my career as a teacher, assistant principal, dealing with busing. And um, one of the things that I always want to say is, um, yes, do students make bad decisions? Sometimes they do. Uh, 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 of course they do. But the overwhelming majority of our students listen. They're super compliant. And they do a really good job once we stress the importance. I can never guarantee that kids will always behave on the bus. We, we always have issues on the bus, uh, you know, but, but they're not significant issues because our families emphasize the importance of proper behavior. We do the same at school. We talk to the kids. But again, I, I can never guarantee, just like I couldn't guarantee right now if somebody was going to take off their mask here in, in, in the village hall. What I can assure the, the board, though, if you vote for this option, we will be educating our kids, we'll be educating our families, we will make sure that everyone knows that wearing a mask is, uh, you, you must do that. But I can't guarantee you that a kid would never uh, take off a mask in school, out of school. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it, it's just, I, I never want to paint a picture as a school uh, or as an administration that we can always have a, a, a zero um, sum or, or a guarantee where that these things aren't ever going to happen. But I can assure you that we will be working with our students and our families having this math policy is a is a huge step toward that uh, but again I, I i could never guarantee that someone wouldn't take their mask off i just wanted to follow up on the the certification mm -hmm. um if there's I, I i'm just seeing all the um so socio emotional issues with some kids having yellow slips and having yeah. to go to a separate line and at, and by the end of the next hour, you're going to have, or there's going to be name calling. There's going to be, um, and most often those kids that are going to forget, or maybe their parents aren't home to do the, um, they already have an issues that they're dealing with. Um, and I don't want to compare this to anything, but I, I don't like the labels. I don't like the, I don't know how else to do it, but if there's another way to do this instead of having visible ways of labeling and sticking kids into groups of haves and have nots, because uh, again, to your point that I, I, my sixth grader still, you know, is struggling with what COVID is and their little heads are going to start talking about. And I just, there's a lot of, I mean, there's already a lot of emotional stress going on. I don't want to add um, coming to coming to school will have its own mm -hmm. bag of excited, scared, whatever. Um, but I feel like that's one that we can control. Um, we uh, and I'm just our, coming our at first, it from our a, first hope was to talk therapist. about therapist. Yeah. <laughs> I just right. don't no, like I, it. I don't like the <laughs> the, oh God, the, the the the, commi the the group talked a lot the first about hoping to have some type of electronic um, yeah, right piece and I think you know ideally that would be ideal you know our preferred method uh, that we don't ha that is something we are not yet able to do right. doesn't mean that we won't stop looking to figure out how to do that because you know it it is an easier structure and format though that too has its own limitations if someone you know logging in and, and so forth and if they don't have a smartphone or something like that um, but well, what was and that's kind of the thing that we're going to and, and that's I think this is part where when we move forward we're going to you know that's something where here's where we're at today right here's what we need to, to function and make work 
how do we, with working with you know, our staff in those areas, make it so that it is not going to be an issue? And I think there's some, some things obviously staff can do. There's some pieces that you know, they can work through and, and, and to get that done. Jill, I want to jump in with you because I completely agree. So I, I don't want to mislead the board. You know, as we're throwing out hypotheticals or all that, um, we, we actually did have really good conversations about this in particular, about being very sensitive of, of um, student privacy concerns. Uh, no one, um, I, it, this is so important to so many families, myself, uh, you know, as a parent too. Um, we're not going to be having color codes for one group versus another. Um, elementary school is hard enough. Middle school is even harder. Uh, you know, so really uh, talking to, especially our little kids, about this is the process we're going to do. And yes. just because someone, you know, is asked to step over here or, or walk with the teacher doesn't mean anything is wrong. You know, all those different things you really have to go over. But um, the idea of having, you know, different colored lanyards or different things, that, that's not something that I, I think really any of us can get behind is, is educators because it goes against everything that we right. do. So how do we do this in a manner that, um, you know, respects student privacy? Same thing that, you know, when we have kiddos go to the nurse's office right now or, or the social worker or the, the counselor at the middle right, school. But not being able to get on the bus, that's all. Yeah. You know, and this is, what, this is the tough thing with COVID. It, it, it really is. Um, Balancing safety, health with social emotional well being in, in, in education. Uh, I, this is why I, I think all of us resent even dealing with these things right now and being in this position because there are some of those times where you know that can happen, but how do we limit those as a school district? Um, because again, safety is more than just physical, it's the social emotional well being of, of a child. In, all of us have, uh, have stories, you know, when we were kids about having a situation like that that we all remember, right? And so we, we really need to be conscious of that. This might seem like nitty-gritty, nitty but um, thank you. Uh, there's been a lot of attention, like there was a great picture, so thank you very much to Justin and the team in the, about what physically, like what it would look like in the classroom. But could you just kind of walk through a little bit, um, because I was reading in some of the documents about um, trying to limit, you know, it's not like March 10th when you walk Johnny to the playground and drop him off and wait in line and have your coffee clutch with your, the other moms on the playground anymore. That's not happening anymore. Is there, um, have you started flushing out ideas about how, you know, like at Jewel and Trader Joe's and everywhere else, there's demarcations for the entrances to socially distance the kids? Can you kind of talk through that a little bit? Because I don't, it wasn't part of the presentation just to give parents at home listening, like an understanding of that you're already on the ball with that. Yeah, and I'm going to ask Justin to pop up too, especially in terms of our rooms. Um, so one of the first things, and, and I know this is going to be very tough to hear from our, for our parents, but again, this is one of those things that with, with COVID, we are going to be very strict about only essential visits to the school. We all love being the guest reader in our kids' classroom. It's something I love very much, but that cannot take place. Only essential visitors to the school, which when you think about that, it pretty much eliminates all visits. So even things, we love our PTAs. They, they, they do so much for us, but you know the copying during the school day, that can't take place. Um, the, the hanging around by the playground with the other kiddos, that can't take place. So being very, very upfront and very direct with our families. If a child forgets something, uh, which we all have been in that situation as a parent. They'll be fine. They're gonna be okay. <laughs> our staff will take care of that. If the board votes to move forward with this, um, we are not gonna be allowing parents to drop off items for their children. Uh, especially if we're gonna delay lunch for two months, that pretty much takes care of it all, right? Everything else can wait, except if we had something like a medical situation, of course, or if a child needed medicine or, or something like that, but all of that has to end. Now, in terms of marking up areas, uh, spray painting outside, uh, you know, areas six feet apart, uh, the middle school principals, I, I was in a conversation today and they were discussing what the bathrooms could look like in, in terms of you know, a, a sign on the door that flips. First, you have to hand sanitize your, or sanitize your hands. You flip the sign to show that it's occupied. 
then you have X's six feet apart. So, you know, imagine, like you said, Trader Joe's or, or, or Jewel, you know, imagine arrows, imagine signs, you know, all of those things. Um, we have sensory paths through our schools right now, but it, it would look a lot like that. Uh, really trying to be deliberate in, in, in to train our students, but I'll let Justin keep going about the, the class sizes and, and, and things like I, that. I'm even talking about like out, outside for drop. So, so you are saying that there would be like marks like they would have fourth yeah. grade line up here, sixth grade like that. And yeah. So, so this is one of those things that um, our building principals are, are, are going to get the outline in terms okay. of what we um, expect from them. Uh, there are two things to consider w with dropping off students. And so we, we spent a great deal of time talking with us and, and um, different schools may approach this differently. But one of the things we feel strongly about is making sure that our students aren't allowed to arrive, whether it's on a bus or by foot or by car, until after our contractual hours for our teachers have begun. The reason for that is we don't want students congregating outside like we've had in the past, where you know if it's eight o'clock, uh, we, we let students in, then and I'm making that up, but you know they start coming at 7:30. That is not allowed. Students are not allowed to come until after that contractual time because then we can open up the doors. Now, a school could adopt two models under this framework. They can adopt a model, all schools will be assigning children doors and we'll be very clear with our children which doors they need to go in. Um, you need to, if you're going to allow students to line up outside, what that's going to require is literally spray painting and marking six feet apart by class where students stand so they're not congregating. Multiple areas around the school. So normally we only encourage people to go through certain doors, right? Yeah. In the morning, you're using every oh, door that's, that, that's possible. But you also have to plan for inclement weather, right? Because that falls apart if you have a thunderstorm in the morning or it starts snowing or whatever the, uh, the weather may be. And so the other model that can be deployed is that if students are all arriving after the contractual hours of staff when you have supervision, they go to their assigned door, but they're immediately allowed in after the self-certification process and or temperature checks. <coughs> that way, you don't have to worry about people congregating. They can just go right into the school. So as we work with our building principals, those are the things that we're discussing. Those are the things that they will be setting up. Again, the non-negotiable is you must have six feet, must be self-certified, must have all of those. Um, how they choose to implement that has to be in adherence with the guidance. Right, and wearing a mask. What's that? Oh, and, and wearing a mask. That's I thought I wasn't telling you. I wasn't telling you. I was saying. <laughs> I thought you were telling me to go closer to the mask. Yes, yes. And of okay. course, wearing a mask. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, that answers. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, just, I think I have a, a quick question, hopefully. Um, just the, the thoughts and um, discussions around open concept buildings. Yeah. You know, tying that to the guidelines, is there any specific actions that we need to take? to Bel Air and El Sierra to make sure that we're fully compliant and keeping safety top of mind? So I asked the health department, um, when you're looking at a, a space, would our open concepts count as one space or would they count as a school? And the health department has told us that we are okay in El Sierra, in Bel Air, that each one of those individual units inside of those schools count as a space. Um, the health department has continued to stress, even in, in, in environments like El Sierra and Bel Air, social distancing, mask wearing six feet apart but we have been told that we're permitted to use lcr and bel air those yeah those set up of walls and those partitions you know are enough to make that space uh individualized so it allows us to do that okay. but there was no dialogue at, within the working groups of anyone having any reservations we didn't really talk about, I mean, I, I'm trying I've to... I've received we, parent I questions. I, I can't recall if there was a dialogue. I'm not saying there wasn't. I, I can't recall only being at two out of the four meetings. Um, I, I do know this was one of the first questions that when we got the guidance of 50 people that I called the health department and asked them, you know, whether or not that this would be uh, permissible. We've received more questions in terms of El Sierra and Bel Air about being air conditioned. Uh, in, in what is the impact on that. We talked a little bit about that at last uh, school board meeting. Right. But we have been told by the health department that Bel Air and El Sierra um, do count as, as, as schools and not a single space and that we need to limit the, inside of those units that we have, those classroom units in, in both of those schools, you can't exceed 50 in, in one of those spaces. I, I think the conversation we just had 
we had at the group, and that was about the extent okay. of it. Okay. All right. Well, well, thank you very much. I'm just. Can I ask one, one other thing about the cell certification in terms of policy? I know we talked about how the board um, and the district implemented a mask policy for the situation. Um, has there been any talk or any any thoughts behind the idea of a of a policy related to families who? habitually do not comply with the self-certification requests and it's becoming like a routine type of scenario and problematic to the functioning of the school in terms of how many times that is allowed to happen without some sort of quote unquote consequence i don't know i'm just curious if there's been conversation yeah there has been not at the same level as um so so one of the things that we had said that you know, we have a discipline policy. Uh, we just adopted a new one, 7190, and we would certainly be implementing that, and we would have tools at our disposal, whether that's through, um, you know, uh, suspensions and, and, and things like that. I can certainly, uh, if the board uh, would like me to, um, I am more than happy to go to our attorneys uh, in the same way that we did about face masks and, and see, um, you know, if we need to go further than our current policies of, of 7190, which is student discipline. Um, so uh, I have no issue. You, uh, going back and in, in, in further tightening that up if, if the board would like that done. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I had a point. I'm sorry. Just coming back. I'm just looking at my notes. Um, in the conversation around, around lunch, if we get to, to a place where we found solutions for, for offering lunch in schools, um, I know I had read in, in the narrative a little bit about the procedures for cleaning um, after lunch when students are potentially hopefully outside in, in a recess type situation or something like that. I was just curious, are, are we looking at custodial staff handing, handling that cleaning for that time? That's like kind of a more of a deep sanitation after, after a lunch. Um, and kind of how is the feasibility of that in terms of staggering the lunch periods and making sure that that's we have enough time to accomplish that within each Cer school? Certainly we will not have enough custodial staff to clean every classroom in that format after lunch. So there is going, you know, we obviously students helping clean up everything mm -hmm. and, you know, we will need assistance from uh, whoever is doing the supervision at lunch uh, to help clean that up and go through. The chemical, the, the uh, cleaners that we have do not require any additional, you know, gloves, masks, or anything like that to use to clean, um, you know, or any special pieces. So that's something that others can assist with because certainly we would not have, you know, uh, a custodial staff to do every room at the same time at, right. within a very you know short time frame. Short yeah. attention. Emily, that, that's a great question in, in one that we still have open questions on. And so I think that is very much why you saw the recommendation that you saw this evening. Um, knowing that we have so many more uh, supervisors that are required for lunch if we're not eating lunch in masses like we would typically do in a school. So one of the first things that we need to do is to secure enough lunchroom supervisors once we build the model and know how many sections that we have and what that would look like both at the elementary school and then the um, middle school as well uh, if we're able to accomplish that at the middle school then um, we need to train those people and let them know what that would look like and practice that to make sure that it's feasible and this is really one of the things that i um, like about the recommendation that we have you have several board meetings in between them that if we weren't able to deliver that, you then could, um, you know, theoretically, if the board were to pass that tonight, you could then go back and offer um, an amendment and, and simply say that since we can't do this, we're not able to move forward with lunch. And that is precisely why we're recommending that that be uh, moved back mm -hmm. until we can uh, get answers to those questions. Mm -hmm. In terms of the lunchroom supervisors, just that was another point that I wanted to, to Touch on. Um, so that is not, at least, and obviously we haven't come up with that plan yet, but we're still working through the options. But in terms of lunchroom supervisors, are we anticipating that being that classroom teacher and being, I know there was some mm -hmm. in the financial piece about stipends for lunch supervision. Are we anticipating just having that classroom teacher mm -hmm. be the lunch supervisor and receiving an additional stipend, or we're having other individuals come into the classrooms at lunchtime for? Supervision. We're going to let Jane uh, handle this one. Uh, Jane is in charge of all of our uh, lunchroom supervisors. 
we would, you know, as Kevin said, we want to explore, we need to get up our numbers, but as we would before COVID-19, obviously there's more classrooms, mm -hmm. we would put that out so staff do have the opportunity to sign up for a stipend. It is a stipend in the mm -hmm. contract. Our ESP group as well mm -hmm. could choose to take the paid stipend and then our, the next step in that process would be our out hiring our outside staff once we know how many we would need for the outside. So our staff would have the opportunity first. We would not be requiring that they supervise lunch. So and then those supervisors. Could be someone with outside of that classroom cohort who would be coming in during a lunch period when masks are removed. To, to supervise. Situation. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And again, in following the guidance and following the cleaning protocols. Sure. Absolutely. But yes. Okay. Are there any other questions? Thank you um, so much for all. Yeah, I have, I have, oh, oh, sorry. I'm Go sorry. for it. I have a few more. Health okay. and safety was my biggest one. I'm sorry. Oh, don't, don't be sorry. This, this <laughs> is the time to get it up. Thank you. Um, we talked about the idea of having uh, at least one, hopefully uh, several uh, ex sort of quote unquote extra spaces within a school if there is a situation where we need to move from one classroom for a period of time to sanitize mm -hmm. and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, Kind of looking at the the rough outline of what was provided in terms of what buildings have extra after utilizing the additional spaces we need for for classrooms um some of them had a gym some of them had a gym and a, a classroom or two classrooms or whatever um what are we envisioning i could at least envision a scenario where there will be potentially times where more than one classroom will need to be vacated at any given time, especially given the fact that we have lots of siblings within a building. So it's likely that if one sibling from a family is exhibiting symptoms, other siblings from that same family might be exhibiting symptoms or testing positive and need to also vacate their given classroom. So what is the plan, I guess, if you don't have enough additional spaces at any given time to leave certain classrooms to sanitize and move those students to somewhere else because I could potentially see that being a, a realistic scenario I'll jump in Todd and then I'll uh, I'll let you go on that particular okay. one um, this is why one of the the things that we wanted to do was to free up the gyms in all of the school precisely for this situation because remember the gym is counted as one space and you can fit up to 50 people mm -hmm. so there there is your, your your plan a and plan B if we had to evacuate those rooms, and, and let's hope we would never get to this situation, but we have to plan for that, right? Um, if we had to do that um, and use that gym for both of those classrooms, um, one of the things that we would deploy immediately, and we've already spoken with our buildings and grounds department. Remember, we have maintenance staff who could then you know, help come and disinfect those spaces right away. Mm -hmm. uh, the preferred method is always to leave those as long as possible. That's what the guidance says. Yeah. But in those situations, we would have to get in there right away and disinfect those rooms so those could be used uh, uh, again. Um, again, having backups and backups. Now, could someone theoretically argue with us that, uh, or, or um, argues the wrong word, excuse me for that, say, what about a plan C? What about a plan D? What about a plan E? The same thing is true if we had a gas leak at a school or something like that. What happens in those situations if you run out of rooms, and we could be in that situation with a fire, we could be in that situation with a gas leak, is you evacuate the school and um, you know at, you go to the secondary location if that's not available. So, so we have these plans in place mm -hmm. uh, with our current emergency plans and we would implement those. Um, but the, the short answer is if you ran out of rooms just like in a gas leak or something like that, you have to get all the kids outside and if the school is no longer available, that's where we have to get in touch with families and, and, and um, you know, cancel school for the day if that would be the case. Mm -hmm. I don't say that lightly, but sure. that's the plan that we have in place for all of our emergencies right now. And we have the tent, I mean, that's also part of the help with that tent area and so forth that we may, you know, can utilize mm -hmm. uh, some of those spaces that, you know, I if we need to. Mm -hmm. And um, obviously, I'm assuming that, or I, I, maybe I'm wrong, but um, is there going to be additional custodial staff that needs to be hired? And if so, have we begun that? How is, how is, how is that looking? And um, yeah, I guess. So one of the things right now, um, we have, only a couple we have a couple open positions that we're working to hire uh, obviously build up our sub pool and um, and as, as, as dr. Russell said you know we have other operational staff that we can utilize uh, if necessary in those in those circumstances uh, 
we are working with custodial association uh, in going through and figuring out as part of this whole process as to how this looks and what this what this format will be there is also going to be fair save hours and time saved because you don't have a cafeteria to clean for lunch you don't have some other things one of the pieces we talk about with uh, minimalizing the buildings with you know the soft furniture and some of the uh, and, and desks and so forth um, is to remove obviously things for social distancing touch points that need to be cleaned um, and so those also will help reduce some of those needs of cleaning the process that will allow some extra time in, into the cycle so we're, we're and we're going to be looking at all those aspects is what we do in a day and how we can adjust time schedule to make sure because we do know there's additional cleaning process in all of this and how do we how do we look at that and what can we do to make sure that we're meeting all of that and so um, right now today as we sit here we don't believe we need additional staffing for this um, we need some different staffing you know and so that's the pieces we'll be looking at okay. then just one last question uh, Kevin, you mentioned that the DuPage County Health Department has a staff member who has basically been designated to work with schools in terms of the contact tracing and notification if there are positive cases in schools. Do you mean there is one health department staff member per district or for all schools in DuPage County there is one? For the 41 districts in DuPage County, there is one dedicated staff member. However, I don't want to paint a picture that that is the only person that's responding to sure. schools. Um, and I, I do want to share with the board, we have had um, many COVID situations that we've dealt with since the close of school. The board knows that because, you know, obviously we've been communicating that. And so contact tracing does not just happen at the health department. It actually happens inside of our school district. Um, we have had, uh, I, I, I can't share specifics obviously, but we have had situations where um, staff members have reported symptoms. We've had situations where, um, you know, family members have tested positive and all that. And we have been contact tracing as a school district since March in, in doing all those things. And um, I, I don't want to paint a picture that the county health department is only going to have one person that would ever respond to schools. It's actually quite the opposite. Um, they've been doing a really, really good job. Um, they're adding a staff member on top of what they're already doing to solely work with schools. Uh, a lot of that work to what we're being told. Um, and, and again, uh, I don't want to speak for the health department, but to help us with, with protocols, to help us with flow charts, to help us with all of these things to assist. Because right now, when you look at the health department, remember, they work with schools, they work with villages, they work with restaurants, they work with swimming pools, they work with all of these things. So I think it, it's very encouraging that they're hiring one person to really you know, dedicate themselves to schools, but in no way is that the only person that's responsible for schools. In fact, every Monday when we have our calls with the health department, uh, there is sometimes three, four, even five members of the health department who are there advising us. One is always a doctor, one is the director, and then they have lower level employees there too who are assisting us with our questions. It's a management tool that disaster management uses so that you have one point of contact so that information isn't lost. Mm -hmm. um, and that was all after September 11th with just communication so that we have one person to contact with issues and then mm -hmm. they will work it Deploy down just like what Kevin was here for. Okay. There's you. just that one person working for all 41 school districts. Yes. You said that so much better than me, Jill. Thank you. <laughs> No, I was just wondering if we need a recess before public comment. Or anybody else need a recess? Is there, is there any other questions or any comments? Questions? No. Thank you. Thank, thank you so thank much. You yes, much. thank you all questions. so much. Right. And I, w I would like to thank the board for their questions. Um, and I also want to share with the public that this is not the only time the board members are asking us questions. Uh, board members are constantly in touch with us and asking us questions and uh, we appreciate it and uh, we thank you because we know how important this is to all of you as well. All right, uh, I had a request for like a, a quick five minute breather before we go to, to public comment, but kind of right before we step out, just uh, something for you, Dr. Russell and your team. 
I have a feeling tonight at, at public comment we're going to get um, a slew of questions coming in here. So we'll have cards, uh, hopefully with some contact information. And, and the same thing with the online responses. We're not going to be able to be doing a kind of a dialogue here. So um, I'm going to make sure that this spreadsheet, it, it's already shared with your team. I, I want to make sure that not only are we making sure that we respond to all of these, if there's key questions that we need to get, but to really be looking at these for that FAQ. Yeah, that I, that you know, I appreciate that. As much as I would love to be in, in, I pride myself on communication and getting back within 24 hours to our families. Um, there are so many moving pieces right now that that is a very, very difficult thing. We're still doing our very best to do that. I anticipate after this board meeting receiving several emails, voicemails on, on all sides of wherever the, the board lands. It is very, that is exactly why we're having this FAQ. And so all the questions that are on public comment, if we're not able to get to them, uh, we will do our very best to incorporate those into the FAQ uh, next week, no matter how the board votes on, on whatever model. So I appreciate you uh, bringing that up because I, again, I know a lot of people during public comment will want that immediate answer. It's not set up that way in these meetings, but then also the follow-up. And we will do our very best to follow up with families, but that FAQ is going to be the, the, the method that we do that. Yeah, because not only the person asking the question wants to know, I'm, I'm sure there's a, hundreds of people behind that, you know, that question that have that same question. So, Correct. All right, let's take a quick five minutes and, and we'll come back for public comment. Welcome back, everybody. This is now that opportunity for members of the audience to share public comment with the board. But it is not intended to be a time for members of the public to enter into a dialogue with the board. Issues raised during public comment may be added to future agendas or addressed by the administrative staff as appropriate. Criticism of individuals is not in order. And also a reminder, as we said right before we took our break, that uh, a lot of these things will probably be ending up in the FAQ that will be coming out uh, um, on Monday and continue to get updated. The board tonight has allotted 60 minutes for public comment this evening. We ask you to keep your comments to three minute limit to allow everyone an opportunity to speak. At this time, we've received seven cards. We will ask that each person who submitted a card to please come up to the podium, state your name and give your attendance area and then provide your public comment. In an effort to give everyone a chance to speak, if the substance of your comment mirrors previous comments, we ask that you keep your comment especially brief. After all those who have submitted a card, a car, um, uh, submitted a card have had a chance to speak, we will read those submitted remotely. In the event that we run out of time to read all of the remote comments aloud, please know that we will be publishing all comments submitted remotely on this agenda in board docs if you would like to refer to them after the meeting. Should they bring any time remaining, we will then take any additional in-person comments. So first up, I have Karen Ryan, who's a teacher at Indian Trail. Uh, my name is Karen Ryan and I have been a teacher in District 58 for 25 years. Um, in addition, I uh, am an alumni of District 58, attended Alcira, um, O'Neill, etc. Um, I have prepared a statement um, for you tonight and hope you will take it into consideration as you make the decision tonight regarding our Return to Learn plan. As we have seen from tonight's Return to Learn plans presented, you are tasked with the very difficult decision of choosing which plan best meets the health and safety needs of our students and staff. For as we all know right now, that is the most important priority as we as a country battle COVID-19. Unfortunately, I have firsthand knowledge of the devastating impact that COVID-19 has on an individual. My mother died from COVID-19 on March 31st at Edward Hospital in Aprilville. I was unable to see her during the last two weeks of her life due to the restriction of visitors at the hospital. She was unable to speak on the phone for more than 30 seconds due to complications with breathing. When she was able to speak, she expressed being scared and alone and would beg me to come and get her. She was so confused. Thank you, Till. 
<laughs> she was so confused and she didn't understand what was happening to her. I felt completely helpless knowing that she was only five miles away and I wasn't able to provide her with any comfort. Three weeks prior to her death, she was a vibrant and happy woman. She was living independently and looking forward to seeing her first grandchild, my son, graduate college. She was the best grandma to my three children who absolutely adored her. The rapid deterioration of her health was frightening. The virus attacked her body and spread so quickly and I could sense that even her doctors were overwhelmed and felt helpless. An hour before my mom died, her nurse called us to share the sad news that there was nothing left to do to keep my mom alive. That kind and caring and amazing nurse opened the blinds in my mom's hospital room to let as much sunshine in as possible for my mom. She began playing quiet and peaceful music in the room and she gently held my mom's hand until she took her last breath. Now, as we are faced with the start of the school year and the overwhelming data that indicates that this virus is not, this virus is not contained, how is it even possible for our district to consider on-site instruction? Our number one priority needs to be the health and safety of our students and our staff. I'm absolutely sick with worry about the thought of being put in a situation where death is one of the possible outcomes. We're in a global pandemic and need to focus on the basic health and safety needs of everyone. I have no doubt that once a vaccine is found and or we are able to contain COVID, our teachers will be able to do what we've always done in District 58, is do the best to educate our children. I strongly feel that our district needs to begin the school year remotely. Why would we ever consider anything but the safest plan? Thank you. Thank you very much. Andy Schmidt with the DGEEA. Good evening, I'm Andy Schmidt, eighth grade teacher at Herrick and vice president of the DGEEA. As you saw since July 13th, the administration and staff of District 58 rolled up their sleeves and got it done. We have a roadmap to bring kids back to school. Now it is your turn to approve the safest plan for the students and staff of District 58. It's a decision that will be difficult for sure and it won't be embraced by everyone. When considering the direction of our district, look not toward what we can do, but rather what we should do. Today you are provided with our 53 page document outlining the safety issues and concerns identified by members of our health and safety working group. The DGEA is highlighting safety issues because the safety of our students and staff is our number one priority. Yesterday the IEA and IFT issued a joint statement reinforcing safety of students and staff above all else. They stated, quote, some types of in-person instruction can be achieved with health and safety mitigation, but absent a practical safety plan that includes a clear line of responsibility enforcement, the IEA and IFT call for the school year to begin with remote learning. They added, if safety measures outlined are not met, the IEA, IEA and IFT will do everything they can to protect our students and those who care for them, teachers, bus drivers, classroom aides, secretaries, custodians, and everyone else in between. The list of school districts in Illinois that have decided to begin with 100% remote learning is endless. In our DGEEA survey, about 20% of the teachers indicated they have an underlying health condition that increases their risk for serious illness from COVID. The district survey identified about 20% of parents who will not send their kids back to school. Why are these numbers important? Because it shows there will be several students and teachers who are incredibly anxious and may not participate in returning to in-person instruction. However, with remote learning, 
I bet we could get 100% of the teachers and students participating without the underlying health anxiety. In closing, I've reflected on our work over the past few weeks. In doing so, I can't help but notice the juxtaposition of the Apollo 13 analogy to our return to learning, to learn reality. In Apollo 13, they had to solve a problem to prevent a potential catastrophe. We, on the other hand, are challenged with solving a problem that has a known catastrophe, a challenge that will expose our students and staff to this pandemic that has already killed 150,000 Americans, and it's not slowing down. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Emily Hahn. Good evening, my name is Emily Hahn. Uh, I am an instructional assistant at Herrick Middle School and president of the DGESP. First, I would like to acknowledge the incredibly long days and hours our administrators have worked since this pandemic began. Secondly, under no circumstances does this statement diminish the role or the work that has gone into trying to determine what is best for our entire District 58 family moving forward. Thirdly, I want to go on record in expressing our appreciation for the opportunity Kevin and Jane granted all three bargaining units to meet and discuss the challenges we are facing with the potential reopening of our schools. That said, the DGESP feels as it stands today, any in-person learning options should be delayed. This pandemic continues to be unstable and potentially hazardous to all students staff and family of District 58. After surveying our members, there are deep concerns, countless questions and extreme anxiety pertaining to the very specific roles that the sports staff members play. A secretary not only comes in contact with all students, staff and other district personnel, but is the first point of contact for all visitors entering the school building. In many scenarios, they are also the first person who sees to six students dispenses medication, or takes care of other medical needs when a nurse is at their other school. An instructional assistant wears many hats, including that of a preschooler's caregiver, opening a juice box, tying shoes, buttoning pants, and supplying a much needed hug to a crying little one. None of that can be done when practicing social distancing. An instructional assistant also cares for our most needy students in the developmental learning program helping with bathroom duties, diaper changing, feeding, and a multitude of other tasks impossible to do without masks, gloves, face shields, gowns, and not to mention the unlikeliness of six feet of social distancing. An instructional assistant can also work with our most emotionally and behaviorally challenged students, where wearing a mask will not only be enormously challenging, it also might cause incredible frustrations ending in outbursts and physical aggression like biting, spitting, kicking, all occurring within six feet. The DGESP is made up of educational professionals dedicated to the well-being of all students they work with. Many of us, including myself, have had a lifetime in this community, de developed lifelong relationships with our students and their families and have devoted many, many years to the roles we see as careers. We feel at this time returning to on-site learning too soon could risk the health and God forbid a life of someone in our district family. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Craig Young with the DGEA. Hi, I'm Craig Young, uh, fourth grade teacher at Kingsley Elementary and president of the DGEEA. Uh, and I want to start by thanking the board and the administration uh, for giving staff members the opportunity to provide input and feedback through the working group process uh, regarding our return to learn plans for the fall. Uh, I hope, you know, not only the over 200 staff members that volunteered, but also the time and energy that they devoted to reading guidance and truly being focused and engaged in discussions uh, helps to demonstrate our commitment to finding the best path forward for our District 58 community. 
and the DGEEA is committed to continuing to provide input and feedback as the planning process moves forward. I want to make sure the board and community understand, however, the, the working groups operated in an advisory role. Working group members have been provided specific topics and potential plans and have given feedback on the impact of those ideas, but have not been asked to agree on any certain topic, idea, or proposal. And this is different from our traditional curriculum uh, committee process. Uh, those decisions are always arrived at using a consensus decision-making model. And these working groups, well, they have been a genuine uh, consensus, I'm sorry, a genuine collaborative effort in collecting feedback. They have not given staff members a chance to decide which plan should be recommended. That decision has been given solely to administration. And there's one important issue where the working group opinion really differed so significantly from the administrative recommendation, and that was around lunch. In every in-person working group, as well as the health and safety working group, lunch was seen as an exceptionally risky endeavor. During lunch, of course, all students have to remove their masks to eat, and this poses an important safety concern and has the potential to undo all of our work to ensure that social distancing and face coverings, smaller class sizes, cohort groupings are used to keep students and staff safe. As we consider this risk of having all our students in an indoor space with no masks on, we must weigh these risks against you know, the potential benefits. Without including lunch, working groups considered plans uh, that were able to include four hours of in-person instructional time. When the groups included lunch, they were able to get one additional hour of instructional time in person. So the question in my mind is, you know, do the benefits of this one hour of in-person instruction over remote instruction outweigh the risks? And in my mind, and I think the minds of many of those on our working groups, it does not. Uh, a few days ago, Dr. Russell shared with the board the results of a survey the DGEA conducted. And obviously, I don't have time to talk about a lot of it, um, but it was uh, responded by over 95% of our members. And I did want to highlight a couple items. Uh, we're not health experts, but we are student experts. And we know about getting compliance with students. Uh, about having them day after day do what we ask them to do. When asked about how difficult it would be, 78% said it would be extremely difficult to maintain six foot of social distancing. And I'll just finish with 60% 60, 60 said it would be extremely difficult to get them to wear PPE all day. Thank you for the time to speak this evening. Thank you, Thank you so much. Uh, Kelly Coleman from uh, Whittier. Good evening. Uh, my name is Kelly Coleman and I serve as the teacher librarian at Whittier School. Uh, if any Whittier families are watching, I'd like to say hello and miss you, love you. I would like to speak as to why I feel it is too dangerous to support any iteration of in-person instruction this fall. My first year of teaching ended, shockingly, with the Columbine High School shooting. I've spent the last couple of decades wondering if one day I'd be the teacher with a gun pointed at her head. Or worse, if I would see children with guns pointed at them. With each passing year, with each headline announcing the killing of children, with each safety drill to prepare for active shooters, that possibility seemed ever more real. But I never considered that the gun might be a deadly virus. And I never dreamed that I would be asked to enter a school building every day amidst gunfire. The bullets will be invisible, of course, but the shooter could be anyone, and the attack could come from anywhere. I certainly never anticipated that my own school leaders, people I respect and care for, genuinely, would hand me a bulletproof vest and tell me, we know this isn't perfect, but we, we think it's enough to keep you alive. I feel like a soldier who is about to be deployed to the front lines, ordered to carry out a mission I find immoral in its unnecessary risk of collateral damage to innocent human beings. I've thought long and hard about whether speaking up is the right thing to do. Eventually, I recalled the countless conversations I've had with my students over the years about how important it is to advocate for yourself, to speak up when you're feeling afraid or uncomfortable, to stand up for others who, for whatever reason, are unable to stand up for themselves. And ultimately, I'd rather risk being unpopular than be a hypocrite. As I tell my kids, let your 
conscience be your guide. And so I need to make it clear that I am terrified for kids, for my colleagues and friends, for the Whittier families I've come to know so well over the past six years, for my 91-year-old grandma at home who is at risk of taking a bullet even though she's never set foot in my school. Unfortunately, I know what it's like to lose a student. I've taught three students who died, one of cancer, one in a car accident, and one shot to death. Their deaths could not be foreseen, and they could not have been prevented. But I wonder if your decision tonight will add more names to this list. And how many? Can your conscience bear the burden of having chosen the risk that led to a student's or teacher's desk? Will you be OK with saying, it's a shame to have lost Ms. Coleman, but at least we had in-person instruction? Or worse, we send our thoughts and prayers to the families of little Susie or Johnny, but our intentions were good. What value do you put on a human life? What is my worth? What is, is this your place to decide? I'm not comfortable gambling with lives. We all know how gambling works. Sometimes you get lucky, but the house in the end always wins. So I, what I'm asking of you is no more than what I'd ask for my students or of myself. Please stand up for those in your care. Follow your conscience. The right decision is hardly ever the easy decision, but please do not open school campuses during a pandemic. In the end, you are responsible for whatever happens. Thank you. Michelle Shannon, a nurse. Hello, my name is Michelle Shannon, and I'm one of the district certified nurses who oversees health services in four of our buildings. Since June, I've sat on both the Health and Safety Task Force and the Health, Safety, and Wellbeing Work Group, charged with how our buildings could safely return to in-person learning. The first thing I'd like to do is remind everyone, a building is not only made up of children, but it also dedicated teachers, instructional assistants, secretaries, janitors, and many specialists who all come together to create a perpetual space for children to learn, always understanding that safety has to be at the forefront. Even our own DG58 mission statement uses the word safe as the first adjective to describe the environment children will learn in. As a school nurse, I know I will be greatly impacted by our return to school. I have read the ISBE guidelines and their numerous updates from cover to back too many times to count. The latest guidelines state that if a student or staff member display any of the following, they are not allowed to enter the building. A fever, a cough, shortness of breath, chills, fatigue, muscle and body aches, headache, sore throat, new loss of taste or smell, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, congestion, or even a runny nose. Please consider these symptoms. I guarantee someone in this room is experiencing one of those symptoms as I speak. Now consider how many times your child has complained of one of these. I pulled a health office log from last September from one of our elementary buildings. On this day, there were a total of 22 health office visits. Of those, six students complained of a stomach ache, headache, or a sore throat. Not one of those kids went home. However, when I followed the latest ISBE guidelines, as I'm required to do, those six students all would have had to go home. Imagine being a parent receiving my phone call. Your child has a sore throat, and you have to pick them up. You have to leave work. You are not able to share with me that your kid is most likely suffering from seasonal allergies, and you know that that's what's causing this sore throat. Under the guidelines, your child will need to see a health care provider and obtain verification that they are not suffering from COVID-19 in order to return to school. Alternatively, if I use my best nursing judgment and send that child back to the classroom, place yourself in their teacher's shoes. Would you want to have that child in your classroom without knowing for certain that that, that child is or is not a COVID threat to the rest of the class or even the school? Based on ISBE, that is a risk they do not want to take, and neither do I. Since March 13th, our last day with students in the building, our knowledge relating to COVID-19 has increased exponentially, but much is still unknown. Guidance from state, national, and global organizations seems to change virtually every week. After participating in the health, safety, and wellness work group for the past 10 days, we have been left with far more questions than answers. 
As one of your district's health professionals, I fear we are rushing to get back to a normal without knowing enough information about this invisible, potentially deadly virus. And as a nurse, I cannot imagine any plan that includes on-site learning as a safe solution for our students, staff, and their families. Thank you. Thank you. Tracy Moriarty from Indian Trail. Good evening, everyone. I am Tracy Moriarty. This is my eighth year in District 58. I am currently um, in the role of an interventionist at Indian Trail. Tonight, I am going to read a statement on behalf of a teaching colleague who was unable to attend the meeting tonight. So here is her letter. My name is Sabrina Burrow. I'm a first grade teacher at Pierce Downer and have worked in the district for 18 years. After the last board meeting, I was excited to be placed on the district's health, safety, and well-being committee. The group asked to help guide our schools to safely open. Our committee has spent hours reading and rereading the ISBE guidance and talking through scenarios for our schools. Our committee discussed many aspects of our school day and developed ideas for possible procedures to use in our schools. However, we still have a significant number of unanswered questions. It is very challenging to follow the ISBE guidance and realistically talk through how that could look for our students. The Health, Safety, and Well-Being Committee is unaware of the recommendation that will be presented by Dr. Russell, and this is ultimately his decision. Our committee still has many items to discuss and questions to be answered. However, I would like to draw your attention to some of the specific concerns about lunch. There is a time, safety, and financial cost of having students in the school for lunch. There is a cost of time to perform hand hygiene before and after eating, wipe desks and disinfect rooms after lunch, precious instructional time that will be lost as we prepare for and clean up after lunch. Is the cost of time and its negative impact on instruction worth the benefit of having students in the school for lunch? With lunch in place, there is also a cost of safety. I can tell you from my perspective that all of the other measures we put in place throughout the day to keep our students and staff safe, physically and emotionally, are lost the moment that all students take off their masks in my classroom to eat lunch. Even if I'm not the one to supervise my classroom during lunch, I'm walking back into a room where about 14 to 19 students have had masks off for at least 20 minutes. Our students will be in that room for the entire time, eating and socializing with masks off. Even with ISBE guidance that states this is allowable, as long as we keep our six foot distance as much as possible, is that risk worth the cost of safety for our staff and students? There is a financial cost to the district to properly disinfect the increased number of classrooms set up throughout our buildings and pay a significant number of lunchroom supervisors to monitor all of these spaces. Is that worth the financial cost to our district? It had been mentioned at our meetings that any plan being proposed to the board isn't going to be a full 8.15 to 3 o'clock day. So I ask, is the cost of time, safety, and money worth the risk of keeping the students in school for lunch. As a parent of three elementary aged children, I understand that involves daycare costs. However, if the time of day ends at 1.15 or 2 o'clock, I still need to cover daycare. So is the loss of time, safety, and money worth 30 minutes of having kids in the building for lunch? I apologize, I have two more for sentences. I'm gonna finish. Right. We are considering sending thousands of students and staff members into buildings while still having pages of unanswered safety questions with brand new procedures and protocols that have yet to be fully developed and have never before been practiced. Please prioritize the time, safety, and financial costs of the plan that you select. Thank you for allowing me to share. Thank you. Thank you. At this time, I will read any public comments that have been submitted remotely through the Google form. We have 48 responses today. First one is Samantha Acock from the Fairmount area. I implore you to consider an option for returning to school that allows children who require SPED services, uh, children who are homeless and children whose parents are frontline workers or essential employees of supply chain, grocery, waste, etc., are allowed to return in-person instruction with masks and proper social distancing. Limiting in-person attendance to these populations will greatly reduce the number of children in the buildings, reduce the risk to vulnerable teachers and families, Remote learning, uh, 
of an updated online curriculum with a district teacher and classmates should be made available to the rest of the district students. Tom Doherty. What has changed with COVID-19 since May of this year when schools were closed to in-person learning? The Illinois positivity rate has increased to 3.8%, about a 1% jump in the past few weeks. Younger people are increasingly testing positive for the virus. Health experts are petitioning for another shutdown across the country as places that have reopened too soon are seeing a large spike in infections and an overwhelmed healthcare system. Now we're actually considering reopening schools amidst this dire environment. How can we expect kids to follow all the safety precautions when many adults can't or refuse to? Will we all be safe? Five years from now, those who survive will look back at this decision as a time we could have stopped or slowed the virus locally, and we do not want to be on the wrong side of history. The health and well-being of our kids and citizens are at stake, and these stakes are too high. I think it would be irresponsible at this time to force students to go back to school part or full-time if the full-time is or hybrid models are chosen, families who opt out must be given an educational and effective online option with teacher direction so that kids do not fall behind. Julia Mazurek from Leicester. Reading through the parent survey responses, there is so much focus on what happens when someone tests positive. However, I have a concern that starts at the step before the, the test result. Currently, COVID testing turnaround is locally at 24 to 72 hours. What is the district's policy for that wait period? I would assume the policy would state that an individual may not return to school until a negative result is received, but that could require one to three days at home or more. And there is an important question that hasn't been addressed on that. What is the learning plan for that student while they await results? Whether a positive or negative result, how will the time away from school be handled? I'm unclear if, um, Oh, yeah, that's, I guess it's supposed to be a Celis, is a uh, plug and play kind of remote option. Administrative details, obtain passwords and logins and online lessons are unlikely to mirror the day to day lessons plans in person. This must be addressed. Every time there is a possible exposure to a symptom, kids will be forced to miss multiple days of school. There is simply no way around this. So there has got to be a fluid option for equity in learning, whether inside the building or outside the building. And right now, I'm not convinced that a Celis provides that platform to achieve this. Even if a family chooses modified in-person learning, how is the district going to maintain continuity and offer the same level of learning for all students, whether they choose or are forced to attend in-person or learn at home? Ryan Gadia, Indian Trail. I would like to commend the board for soliciting parent feedback and making these decisions. I'm not sure if this will be addressed in the meeting, but if the district decides to have in-person classes in August, what is the plan for families that are not willing to go to school because of the possible risk? Will online-only families be given the option to have online classes? I think there could be enough demand for online-only families across multiple schools to justify offering some classes as online-only, meaning if 33% of the families in schools A, B, and C are online-only, can we combine all of these families into a single online cohort? Linda and Zbiglius uh, from Hillcrest. Thank you for taking the time to hear from us re remotely. We reside in Kingsley Boundary, but my special needs daughter attends Indian Trail through the Sasset and Multi-Needs classroom. This year, the classroom has been moved to Hillcrest, which we are elated about. She turned three and aged out of EI in February and had two and a half weeks of school before the pandemic hit. Having five plus therapies incorporated within her school week, we are really left with no options as we went remote. With her having a significant hearing loss and being nonverbal, Zoom calls and e-learning is not an effective tool for her at all. I understand all scenarios and I truly feel for all parties involved in the safety for everyone. But in our special needs community, where does that leave us? This gap keeps getting larger and we have no resources. Finally, we were lifted off of an outpatient clinic wait list for some therapies, but now we're having to pay out of pocket, which of course is costly on top of the other financial stresses of the pandemic and having the special needs kiddo. Is there going to be special considerations no matter what mainstream decision will be on for SASED kids? Thank you so much in advance for your time and hope as a community we can um, come back as an educational family whenever, whatever capacity our new normal will allow.
Susan Chavez Jimenez from Henry Puffer. First choice, five-day in-person model. Second choice, blended model. Please make a decision. We understand that cha a change of plans may become necessary if cases spike, but parents need time to plan accordingly. But a starting plan is needed, and we are too close to school starting to not have a plan yet. This one does not have a name, but it's the Highland area. I support Superintendent Russell, the CDC, ISBE, AAP, and other experts and believe that our children should be back in the classroom. While I hope as much classroom time that while I hope for as much class time that is safe, I lean towards the moderate return originally proposed. I do have concerns about safety during lunch with no mask when no mask would be born. I also I'm, I am also a parent of a sixth grade child who could possibly be affected by moving to O'Neill. I'm very opposed to this idea. If Herrick had room, it would be okay with the move since it would be close proximity and a feeder school. But O'Neill being on the other side of town and not one of our feeder schools is impractical. With commuter train traffic, morning work commutes, and what seems like a regular road construction, commute times on the bus would be very long and beyond my comfort level for the safety given to the social distancing limitations. But the alternative of having to do a daily commute myself, easily a 25 to 30 minute round trip twice a day, while managing other children and work schedules is not practical either. Kids are under a lot of stress right now, so take time, uh, take them out of school. They, ha they have been in at for six years and relocating them across town when the pandemic is already adding stress is not a good or fair solution. I would much rather have my child stay at school in a hybrid situation with only part-time instruction in the classroom instead of getting shipped off to the other side of town. On a side note, I think it would be a good idea to add face shields in addition to masks for those taking the bus, walking to the bathroom, and other scenarios where six foot distancing is not as possible. Finally, I implore the board not to follow the footsteps of District 99 board took this week during a sudden 180 degree turn to pursue a fully remote plan. This is not the recommendation of our quality qualified administrators, the CDC, ISBE, and does not represent the majority of parents in this community. Please get our kids back in the classroom, whatever the safest option is. Sarah Rousen from Highland. Hello, thank you for the effort being put into safely reopening the schools next month. I know it is a big feat and constantly moving target. My daughter is an incoming kindergartner at Highland. I oversee 20 dermatology practices, which includes operations and compliance, and have been living and breathing this situation since February. I sympathize with how challenging the situation is and the nuances that go into different policies and protocols. I have a few questions that I'm requesting be read at the meeting tomorrow night in lieu of my attendance. I know you are working with the local health departments on exposure protocols and that they follow the CDC guidelines. I want to ensure that you're aware that the guidelines for quarantine after exposure is irrespective of face masks. Therefore, groups, buses, classes could be shut down for quarantine, not just who were thought to have had close contact while not wearing a mask for 15 plus minutes. CDC guidelines state that for exposure, a person is to quarantine for 14 days following the exposure. This is irrespective of whether that person with COVID-19 or contact was wearing a cloth face covering or whether the contact was wearing a respiratory personal protective equipment. How will the district handle um, symptomatic employees and students during flu season? If employees or students call in, will it be asked, will it be asked the reason for the call off Per EEOC and ADA, this is allowed given the unprecedented situation of COVID. What is the time frame that they would need to be out, or would they need to provide documentation of other illness or negative COVID tests prior to returning? As the district navigates between in-class and sections in quarantine, small groups, classroom, cohorts, etc., with the academic transition look like? When people, when multiple people are quarantined, will they transition to a cellus? What does a cellus allow? How does CELUS align with the curriculum teaching styles and timing of the classroom ease to the transition so we can have an easy transition as possible? The shortened days, in-person attendance, etc. how much curriculum time will be spent on test prep, standardized testing? What core curriculum items will be carved out to account for shorter academic times, whether hybrid, full in-person with shorter days or e-learning? How much more of the day will be spent being stationary per grade level in contrast to normal pre-COVID movement? within a class, including independent work versus small group, et cetera. Current Chicago, currently Chicago has a travel ban that mandates quarantine after travel to certain states. List is updated weekly on Tuesday. This is for residents who live or work in Chicago. 
Cook County and DuPage County have travel guidelines that recommend quarantine for 14 days following travel. How will you implement and help support this for employees and families who travel? And how will this be accomplished to include travel that occurs outside of school, i.e. long weekends? Heather Chulp, Whittier. The period called for absolute transparency and collaboration between the district, the board, and the school community. Instead, your efforts have undermined us as parents. Your survey was untimely and intentionally biased against a blended learning option, rendering the results skewed. Wasting two more weeks on making your plans clear has uh, trended against the pattern of numerous other districts relying upon the same state guidelines and facing the same uh, predicaments. In turn, this has only fueled the anxiety, tension, even outright uh, conflict within the school community and various social media platforms. You have sadly been outdone in your performance by other districts, and you must now make it right. Let science, uh, let science lead this charge and leave political bias out. Remain objective and partial about the assumptions that you make about data that you have collected. You absolutely must deliver on a robust remote learning plan that is based on strong pedagogy and not limited to virtual platforms like Acellus. It is the right of all students, but especially those receiving IEP services to benefit from face-to-face -face instruction, teachers, and related services um, personnel. Furthermore, this needs to happen regardless of what the e-learning environment or what the learning environment for district families choose for their child. This one has no name from Kingsley. If we decide to use the district's third-party e-learning when the schools are closed again because of the cases rising, will all children have the option to join their class or will they remain on their own through the program the district is providing? This is a big part of our decision to homeschool and drop from the district enrollment. Thank you. Alan Doherty from Herrick. Were the school nurses heavily involved in the plans? Will we hear from teachers and staff about their involvement? James Escarano from Indian Trail. Looking for clarification for preschool for the 2021 school year, I've only heard and read about grades K through 12. When plans are set in place, does this include preschool or will they have separate guidelines and plans in place? Kendall Grant from Henry Puffer and Kingsley. If, some, if someone in my kid's class tests positive for COVID, will, I be, will we be notified? Can you please explain what the markers will be to notify a family when someone has been diagnosed with COVID? What metrics to determine when a classroom will quarantine or a school or a whole district? Thank you. Anne-Marie Prevnekis, Highland. My comment is regards to the data that has been compiled from the parent survey. In my opinion, I hope the board has seen the questionnaire because the educational jargon that was used to create the questionnaire did not have the audience in mind. A simple question asking which option do you prefer would have provided a better and raw results for the board to consider. Also, the experience that would have happened if you were to pursue modified in-person or hybrid will not look the same as the education in the past. A first-time student in kindergarten will not get the emotional bond from a teacher taking their hand if they are nervous on the first day. First grade students will not have the luxury of playing math games with their peers to learn math facts. Teacher will not be able to console an upset student. The differentiated instructions as we know it will be gone if, pursued, if we pursue hybrid. If we go remote, all students can meet remotely with the teacher and have their learning needs personalized. Gifted, support, resource personnel can provide the opportunity for our students. If we go remote, students ahead of math in math will receive their independent instruction. If we go remote, small group math and reading can be tailored because the teacher will not have to attend to the, the 20 other students in the classroom to watch them safely. I am hoping that the board considers a fully remote option as it affords much more opportunity and differentiation than the hybrid model does. We, can't, uh, we can then take our time to plan for what a hybrid model could look like in the future instead of leaving teachers with such a small window planning. Veronica Barah Barajas, no school listed. My family and I are still fairly new to the community, having moved here less than a year ago. The fall will be my child's first year attending a school in Downers Grove as they just finished their last year at their former school. 
As excited as they are to start a new school and make friends in person, I strongly believe that it is not safe for them to do so under these circumstances. I support remote learning for the upcoming school year because I believe that this is the safest option for our students, teachers, staff, and families. According to the CDC, people with underlying health conditions and people with certain race and ethnicity are at higher risk. We are a Latino family and my daughter has congenital heart disease, which puts her at a higher risk than others that do not share the same factors. If your district does not vote on a remote instruction for the entire community, then parents should be given the choice to decide what is the best for their family. Annalise Price from Bel Air. Hi, my name is Annalise Price. My daughter, uh, Sigrid Price, is currently enrolled at Bel Air School and will be going into fifth grade this fall. The first thing I'd like to say is that our family loves Bel Air School. Um, Sigrid has amazing teachers and it was always such a joy to drop her off in the mornings and see her greeted by name by so many caring staff members and fellow students. Regarding, uh, repeatedly during quarantine, my daughter has cried because she can't go to school and be with her friends. And while she continued to make good academic process during distance learning, I've seen her stress and frustration go. I am very aware of the value of in-person instruction. That said, I do not feel like I can send her back to school at the current time under the current plan. As things stand right now, the number of COVID cases in Illinois is increasing. On Wednesday, the governor announced that if the current trend continued, we are heading towards having to reverse course on opening up the state. In addition, two new studies have been recently released that suggest that children are more likely to spread the virus than previously thought. The first, a study of 65,000 people in Korea suggests that children 10 years and older are likely to spread the just as likely to spread the virus as adults. The second release just today suggests that infected children have at least as much of the coronavirus as adults and that children younger than five uh, may have host up to 100 times as much virus in the upper respiratory tract as adults. Both of these studies have led experts, um, have lead experts cited in the newspaper articles reference above and conclude that the school reopenings are likely to lead to new outbreaks of the virus. We also need to recognize that different families face different levels of risk in returning their children to school. Fortunately, the viruses seem to have very low fatality level in children. Most kids who are infected do not seem to become seriously ill or even show symptoms. This, however, actually increases the risk that they inadvertently spread this virus to the adults in their lives. I'm a primary caregiver for our daughter. I am 51 uh, years old and I have four out of the five pre-existing conditions that most increase my risk of dying should I contact the virus. My daughter will be 10 this year and everyone in her class at school will be at least 10 years old. That age is which the study says children start to be likely to spread is, is adults. I can't wear a mask every day while I interact with my child. Furthermore, Bel Air School is effectively one big room, uh, only uh, partially divided into classrooms by bookcases and screens. It is air conditioned. Air conditioning systems have been shown to spread virus beyond six feet. I realize that the district is doing their best with the regulations from the state to allow them to count sections of large areas as separate rooms so that they can meet limits no more than 50 children in a room. However, I have seen no evidence to support that this is actually safe. Masks can do a lot to reduce the risk, but as I read the plans, the children will be taking off their masks to eat lunch every day. In third grade, in third grade, my daughter caught strep throat three times from interactions in school. Last year, she picked up a nasty flu-like illness that developed in the secondary pneumonia. All right, we will post this comment online and it's full as there's still uh, a decent amount left there. Carissa Doherty from Whittier. I appreciate all the time and thought teachers and administrators and staff are putting into our school reopening plans. I would like to encourage the board to consider an equitable remote learning option for those families who are not comfortable sending their children for in-person instruction, especially when there are pre-existing conditions that can make the decision to send children to school a matter of life or death. Using an online platform that does not involve district teacher instruction, as suggested by the board's current plan to use a CELIS, we leave those families as a significant academic disadvantage. In addition, the FFMLA option is available to their district that requests uh, uh, rules for parents taking time off work to support their family care needs, state that if an in-person option is available in their district, their request will not be considered. This would leave working families in a very, very difficult place. Stay at home without pay to support kids learning or send them to an uncertain and risky environment. I hope the board can put this, put into place a true remote learning option with quality synchronous instruction as we've seen in neighboring distance, districts. Thank you. 
Ben O'Malley at Whittier. Families should be able to send their children to school in person if they feel comfortable doing so with a remote learning option available for those who don't feel comfortable attending school. The science overwhelmingly backs up that it is safe for children to attend class in person and it will be the most beneficial for the development and mental health to have this option available. I have heard statements from several pediatricians and psychologists on a, a non-political video published by the Advocate Health that it is safe for children to attend school if families feel comfortable doing so. All the, fish the physicians interviewed on the video who had children stated that they plan to send their own children to schools this fall. That statement, that statement provides our family with the reassurance that we need to be willing to send our children back to school. Additionally, the remote option was not successful last year in our household. It did not benefit our son on his learning path. He was not happy. He did not respond to being with his teacher. My wife and I both work full-time jobs during the day and simply cannot continue to handle our workload and teach our son at the same time. Our employers have been understanding so far, but that understanding will not last forever. Please provide families the option to send their kids to school full-time through on-site model this fall. Thank you. Kelly Janzuski from Bel Air. Hi, thank you for your time. I have a question in regards to the updated language from ISBE. Individual rooms and spaces must limit capacity to 50 people with social distancing. However, larger spaces may be partitioned with fire code approved floor to ceiling dividers to create additional rooms each with a capacity limit of 50 people. Large spaces like indoor arenas and gymnasiums may not be partitioned to allow 50 participants or spectators at events. How does this affect Bel Air and El Sierra, particularly if more kids um, would possibly be put in the schools? Bel Air does not have floor to ceiling partitions. Julie Mazurik from Leicester. The audio to this meeting is barely perceptible. Can it be fixed? Uh, an anonymous person from Herrick. How will you ensure the safety of students and staff <laughs> with those who have Fatena been asymptomatic? Atik. What? There's a name. Fatena Atik. Oh, it was an empty email address. Fatena Atik? Yep. Um, how will you ensure the safety of students and staff with those who are asymptomatic, especially if some may be exempt from mask wearing due to medical reasons and will still be able to attend schools for e-learning? Um, Margaret. Geis from Henry Puffer. As a public health professional, a mother of two children in District 58 and a member of the Remote Learning Task Force, I urge the district to consider the health and safety of our children, their families, the teachers and staff, above all else, given the trajectory of COVID and its inevitable confluence with other illnesses, including, including the seasonal flu. Safety should be our community's biggest concern. I also implore the district to ensure the quality of the online academy is fully equal to the quality of in-person instruction. This means high quality, engaged teachers committing to online pathway and parent-student access for all on-site curriculum materials. This is imperative for equity and to avoid major difficulties when children return to regular learning. Thank you. Kimberly Carter, Lester and Herrick. One, how is the district ensuring that the isolation area in each school to which sick kids are to report is truly an isolation area, meaning that it's under negative pressure and exhaust outside to the building and is not a neighboring space where others may be infected. Two, what is the cleaning disinfection plan for a space after a positive case is identified? UV, fogging, who is performing these disinfecting tasks and how will it ensure that it is done adequately each time? Three, what percentage of positive cases in the classroom or building will be deemed access, uh, acceptable before the decision is made to close the schools? <coughs> Christoph. Christopher uh, Boquette from Highland. Not a fan of self-governing temperature. What are the penalties for someone who Tylenols up their kid and sends them without, uh, without a temp, but the temp presents at school? What happens to that classroom? Do all the kids, teachers, et cetera, have to go into quarantine? Uh -huh. This one does have no name. Will fans be allowed in classrooms in addition to the windows being open? Another one with no name from Whittier. Oh, that's the same one. Marina Kasicki, Lester. You mentioned that there 
must be one COVID room per school. What will happen to students in more than one classroom exhibit symptoms on the same day and time? Um, where will other classes, uh, class or classes go? What will happen if there's not enough subs? We already have a very difficult time finding subs. Who will be in charge of monitoring classrooms during lunch when students are without masks if teachers do not feel comfortable being in that room? Michelle Sloboda, Henry Puffer. First, I'd like to say thank you to the board and teachers for their hard work thus far. I truly appreciate all that you've done since March. My question is, if I choose Remote Academy, can I have the school curriculum materials versus a CELUS? I have already paid for my school fees and registration of my child. I'm concerned that a CELUS program will not be up to par with the District 58 curriculum. I'd like to use the district curriculum materials versus a CELUS. I do appreciate having a teacher through synchronous learning. Also, I have concern with temperature taking. Is, it, it is my understanding that temperatures will not be taken at school until they have, um, they have been there for 45 minutes. This doesn't seem like good practice. <clears throat> Helene uh, Schaefer from Henry Puffer. I am not in support of a kinder program that is not full day. I think that you need to understand that the majority of families opt for full day programs. These children will be exposed to more when shuffled around for only three hours a day and two days of on-site um, on learning. Please consider that when you decide to pull O'Keep, what happens with champions? Another one from Colleen Schaefer. Is this a duplicate or is this? Okay, all right. I am against an AM and PM kinder programs. Catholic schools and DG have made accommodations for full day programs, again, bringing children in and out multiple times will expose them to more risk. My final decision will be based on Champions, Oki versus AM, PM program. Another one from Colleen Schaefer. If the numbers for kinder drop due to families opting out, would you consider Oki if classes are under 18? This one has no name, but it's from Fairmount. Will there be many parents who have expressed while there have been many parents who have uh, expressed their desire for their kiddos to be fully employed in school, I am curious to ask the board members if their own personal family workplaces have gone back to normal or are they like so many other businesses, restaurants, churches, sporting events, etc., that are operating under modified rules and structure due to pandemic. Why should we expect our school children and teachers and administrators to go back to normal and place them all in harm's way in indoor tightly packed classrooms? I asked my sixth grader how many of her classmates could remain seated at their desk with masks on for half of a school day. She laughed. Why does District 58 think they can solve the logistical puzzle so much easier than other districts around us have already made decisions to move education online for those who can handle it? We have lost valuable time for our teachers to move this pedag or pedagogy online. It is not an easy task. When our COVID numbers hit a certain level, we are forced to evacuate the classroom and move fully online, will we be prepared? I believe our school buildings and some of our educators should be a security blanket for our students and families who need support, mainly special ed, IEPs, students, families without internet, without childcare, without food, without safety, security at home, etc. All those who can learn at home should learn at home. I appreciate the time and energy the district is putting into examining all models, and I hope and pray that the board can vote with their heads and their scientific evidence around us. No name from Highland. If a blended option B or C is selected, please align the days with the possible hybrid model from District 99. Right now, Monday is remote. Tuesday, Thursday is all remote. Tuesday, Thursday are A and L, oh, A through L, and Wednesday, Friday are M through Z. If possible, we would, it would be great to align the Tuesday through Friday days and have Monday being the rotating days. An anonymous person from Fairmount. Thank you to, ev anyone, to everyone who has worked so hard this summer. We love the community and we need our kids to get back to school. The recommendation to attend five days a week is so important for our kids and I hope we will be on the way, uh, it will be that way the board votes tonight. Another anonymous post, this one from Kingsley. How will you address champions if students are are not to move classrooms, how do you plan to not mix the kids? Vasya 
Manates Goritis uh, Herrick. As a parent of a middle school student, it seems to us that the increased cost of PPE thermometers, increased staffing, et cetera, does not make sense for the middle school plan. The students will have two different teachers per subject, and that seems inconsistent. It's better to just have remote learning with one teacher per subject. We may have to go to full remote model anyway if cases increase this coming fall. Denise Lazar, Whittier and Herrick. Thank you for your hard work. It's obvious that many people have been working very hard to get to this point. I appreciate your efforts and thought. As a parent of a Herrick student, I have significant concerns about busing. The plan that I reviewed for this evening's presentation states that only 46 kids would be in a bus, which is two per seat. It seems that all precautions being taken in the school building will be completely undone by placing so many kids on a bus. Self-reporting temperatures is not prudent. Parents and guardians will be ex uh, experiencing significant pressure to go to work and will run out of time to check temperatures. Students with mild, moderate fevers will go to school. It would be better to practice the ch uh, to check temperatures as students board the bus or as they enter the building. I am concerned for the safety of the teachers and staff is not significantly addressed in the current plans. I want the children to be safe on-site education, but I want to make sure it is safe for our teachers and staff too. Thank you for your consideration. Diane Saylor from El Sierra. Thank you so much for the incredible work that the team has put into to try to come up with the best learning scenario for students. We feel very confident with the research presented tonight. I have two points. First, how are neighboring school districts and or private schools that are holding full days handling lunch? Can we look to them to learn and apply ideas that could work? What, are, uh, what is the plan for open concept schools? This has not been mentioned at all. Thank you. Other anonymous from Pierce Downer. If the state requirement for, from ISB for asynchronous learning each day is 2.5 hours, why is your initial recommendation for four and a quarter hours of in-person learning each day? Why not start smaller with three hours or even 2.5 hours of in-person learning? Less time in the classroom could eliminate a need for a fruit snack break and possibly even bathroom breaks from students, not to mention helping with the AC issue, concerns about mass compliance and providing teachers with more plan time. Anonymous from Highland. Heartbroken to hear the option of moving kindergartners and separating families. Who will be teaching these kindergarten students? <clears throat> what will orientation look like for these families? How will we be reassured that we can get back to our home school when we reach phase five? An anonymous from Kingsley. For Online Academy, what time frame do we need to commit to? Can we go to in-person at some point? Another anonymous person did not leave a school either. Would like to know what is happening with band and orchestra this year. Um, Matt Butts at Whittier. Thank you for all the preparation for this. Once a plan is approved and the family commits to a decision, what options are there to move? For example, if the blended A is approved, but we choose the online academy for our child. Three weeks in, we realize that it still isn't working and we really need to go back to in-person and join the blended A model. Can we do it? Similarly, uh, when we hopefully progress to phase five, will there be an option to transition away from online academy and back to school? Thank you. Ben O'Malley, Whittier. What would be the arrangement? What would the arrangement be with champions, both under the modified on-site and blended model for families where both parents work? This service is extremely valuable. Sam Wynn. Highland. What will happen when students or a teacher are confirmed to have COVID? Does the entire class immediately go into quarantine? Anthony Andreas. No attendance area. Regardless of the decision today, no option will offer the same instruction as before the pandemic. It was mentioned that remote learning will not be able to offer the same instruction as pre-pandemic in-person instruction. However, it is not mentioned that in-person instruction will also not be able to offer the same level of instruction. A school with these proposed safety protocols will be, a very, different, will be very different on site. Children are flexible and the world is moving forward, moving towards a remote mentality. This is a unique opportunity to help teach students the skills they need for the ever-evolving world. If safety is truly the priority, then prioritize it. Don't just do the bare minimum. 
Jason Sealer from Hillcrest. Who will determine whether or not someone <coughs> has had close contact with an individual, student or staff, who tests positive for COVID? And our last comment that we received online is from Jason Sealer again. Do you feel that you have adequate staffing to accommodate the situation where a number of certified instructors are required to quarantine or are unable to teach? Okay. What, how are we at on, on total time? We've used it up. Okay. All right. Thank you everybody for your comments, both online and in person here tonight. We have two items up for recommendation tonight. The first one is uh, a temporary rule 4 180-TR, face coverings during COVID-19 pandemic. Is there a motion to adopt a temporary rule 4 180-TR, face coverings during COVID-19 pandemic? So move. Second. Uh, any discussion? Melissa, please call roll. Oh, sorry. You. Yeah. I had a question on this one. Mm -hmm. Is there a timeline for when this be stops becoming temporary, I meaning like it goes off our books? Yeah, so it stops becoming temporary when the pandemic is over and, and we're officially out of it in, in the governor's term. So that's why it's written as a temporary rule because it's only written for the pandemic. It's during the disaster proclamation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, got it. Thank yeah. you. Yes. <clears throat> that's all. Any other discussion? All right. Melissa, please go roll. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to adopt a temporary rule 4 180 TR face coverings during COVID 19 pandemic. Next up is the resolution to approve the fall 2020 school reopening plan. Is there a motion to approve the resolution approving the fall 2020 school plan reopening plan consisting of a modified on-site instruction five days per week for pre-K through sixth grade with a phase one of two and a half hours per day through September 9th, phase two through October 23rd, and a phase three starting October 26th, which would then run from 8.15 till 2 p.m. and pre-K and kindergarten is a half day program. And the blended AB instructional model for middle school grades seven and eight with transition days through September 9th. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. Any discussion? <laughs> um, I just wanted, I was looking at the calendar. Um, there was a, a lot to absorb and this was two and a half hours yeah. of, of a presentation. Um, uh, there are, I was looking, between now and October 23rd, there is an August 10th monthly board meeting, an August 24th budget workshop, a September 14th monthly board meeting. At the end of September, we're going to have to have a special budget meeting for a budget approval. And then October 14th is another board meeting. So we have one, two, three, four, five meetings yeah. before here so that we can have updates every month or every time we meet on how things are going. Is that how you guys all understand it? Yeah, yeah. and just to clarify, did you say October 23rd? 26th. Okay. Yes, yeah, so we will have an opportunity like, uh, um, I kind of the way when, when I first started talking about this with uh, superintendent was, um, this is an on-ramp, right? You know, so like, the. the the real beauty of the plan is we hear we hear a lot of anxiety about people going back. So the idea was, um, you take those first couple of days, and you keep it real short, um, uh, like we were hearing in the thing at, at two and a half hours. People, it'll be easier for kids to handle their masks. The likelihood of needing to use the bathroom will be lower. There's no need for a snack. You can you can transition into that 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 longer, more inclusive day that then allows for snack. Um, and we have an opportunity for our teachers to, to start working in that environment and get comfortable. And like you said, we have five board meetings between now and, and um, any point where it would automatically transition up to a full day, which um, gives us the opportunity to adapt and make changes. Uh, the state could make different recommendations one way or the other. Um, so, you know, I think that 
that we got to prepare to pivot. I think what this on-ramp shows, too, is that the model, um, what we were concerned about in the last meeting when we were talking about the original blended model of doing just an AB in our uh, K through six buildings, was there was no easy way to transition from blended to full modified down to remote. Like it was gonna, we didn't see a, we didn't see a smooth transition. This very much looks like a, uh, a continuum. So, you know, if, if we had to slide into, if we got bumped down to uh, phase three, uh, they could continue with the, their, their same groups, of, of the same teachers and, and be in the same environment. Same thing as they transition all the way back up to uh, full modified on site. If that answers your question. So that, so we can have touch bases along the way. Yes. And as a board, we can always call a special meeting if we wanted to based on where the data is going. So in essence, we have an unlimited level of ability to call a meeting and an unlimited level of ability to ask for the data that we would want. So yes, we have five currently scheduled, but that doesn't limit us from scheduling more. Sure. No, right. but I mean, we already have a lot on the books. Right. So I mean, that makes me feel comfortable <clears throat> that I don't have to worry about trying to spin up uh, enough board members to have to have an right. emergency meeting, but yes, we always have that ability as well. And um, it, may I suggest that 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 be, Dr. Russell? Um, thank you so much. I, I can't even impress upon. That. We've said it a bunch tonight. The amount of work that the seven of us, along with the administration and the teachers, and thanking all the 175 teachers that joined all the working groups here. Um, I feel very comfortable with this plan because it's reflective of a lot of feedback, a lot of survey responses and so on. So is it possible that for the next four board meetings you're giving us the updates and that's part of your superintendent report or? Yeah, and, and one of the things I would encourage the board to do, especially at the next meeting, we can even put this as a discussion item, um, in terms of what exactly you would like me to bring back each meeting. I, I can certainly give you an update and a status of the working groups as those go through. If there are certain health measurements you'd like to see in terms of things like the positivity rate or you know whatever measurements the board would like to see, I, I don't expect to put you on the spot right now and say, you know, what would you like the plan to be? But I, I certainly well, think I can get back to you on that. <laughs> a, a discussion contacting me as a superintendent. Uh, I can work with the board president as well. But I, I do think it's a good idea that we have consistent and objective data that we're looking at and or, and or benchmarks that, that you would like to make sure uh, that we're hitting. And uh, so at the August meeting, I would suggest we put that as part of the discussion to really define those uh, criteria. I would also um, you know, like to ask the associations for input on, on what they'd like to see as that criteria as well so we can all come together and collaborate on um, you know, what that would look like at all of those meetings, but certainly we are intending to uh, bring you updates at all of those meetings. I just want to make sure that the updates we're providing the board is the information that they're looking for. Looking. Can I have a question that came up from the parent public or the community public comment that I think was at least the way I interpreted it inconsistent with what you shared. I just want to make sure we clarify that for everyone. Sure. Uh, the comment was around uh, Bel Air and El Sierra and the treating it as one space or multiple spaces. I looked up the FAQ from ISB and they updated the guidance on the 24th of July, so just six days ago, yeah. asking for floor to ceiling dividers for uh, large spaces that are in uh, accordance with fire code. How do you uh, rationalize that guidance with what you heard from the Department of Health? So the answer, and I called the Department of Health back on July 8th when I asked this question specifically, um, with regards to what um, they had uh, provided in writing it said finally the concept of keeping students physically separated while in groups of six feet it's much more significant from public health perspective of risk reduction versus having floor to ceiling barriers I then called the health department and asked what does that mean for an open air concept school and the health department had indicated to me at that time that an open air concept school was different than a, a, a gymnasium or something like that um, I am more than happy to uh, double and triple check that uh, you know, we've done that once, but, but again, it, things have changed. Um, but I am more than happy to, uh, to do that if the board would like that to, to get an official statement uh, from the health department uh, on Bel Air and El Sierra. Uh, I'm, I'm more than happy to do that. In the event we weren't able to uh, use those particular sites, which again, that wasn't the information that they shared with me, there would certainly be alternatives uh, available. Uh, the, the first space we would look at is um, O'Neill Middle School. 
uh, because of the underuse of that facility. Uh, also, if the high schools were to go fully remote, you would have two other options um, in, in town with that as well. But I will, um, if the board would like uh, even further clarification on that, I can certainly provide that. Uh, but that was a clarification that I saw it on July 8th. Um, but certainly, uh, you know, this is one of those things that if the board would like me to, to double and triple check, I have no problem doing that. Yes, yes please. Yep. Never want to be blindsided later, you know? So. No, correct. And um, again, that's why we took the precaution. But uh, in fairness to everyone, uh, the world is constantly changing, and uh, we just want to make sure that we have that answer. Uh, if that were the case, of course, we would immediately notify the board. But again, we did seek that clarification earlier, but happy to seek it again. Great. Thank you. Thank you. We are, uh, I'll, I'll make a, this is more of a point for, I think, us to discuss. Uh, we're about four weeks away from what would be the start of the school year and just in the last like, three or four weeks We've gotten multiple changes in guidance. It's pretty clear that we can probably expect some changes in guidance between now and the 27th of August or September 1st uh, That being said we have to be able to give The community parents teachers administration the opportunity to plan for something um, my bias is to give them the best opportunity to plan for as much continuity and learning as possible. Uh, I think this is a unique opportunity for us to be able to build a very real muscle for what everyone's remote learning experience would look like. Uh, the modified on-site plan uh, doesn't ask parents to build that muscle, really, because they would have about an hour of asynchronous instruction at home. Um, students then also don't build that muscle by doing it at home. They do some of that practice, but you don't actually dive into it for full remote unless you do some days of actual full remote. And so I don't think we're taking on the opportunity to provide some very real planning time over these next four weeks. What I fear is that at the moment that we do shift back to phase three, if, that's, if that does happen, we end up with a need to pivot on a dime again like the spring. And we know that the expectations of what ISBE is ex expecting of us as districts is significantly more than what the spring was with the n amount of synchronous and asynchronous instruction combined. Uh, and so my, uh, my challenge is that we have this unique time to plan. I'd like to put all, a lot of our eggs in the basket where uh, we think that the numbers are going. So let me talk a little bit about the numbers. Uh, right now we're at about 3.8% positivity rate and that number is increasing. Uh, just yesterday, we were about 4.3% for yesterday's positivity rate. Um, while we're putting some states on the quarantine list because we don't want to get that spread here, Illinois is also on the quarantine list for some of our East Coast states as well. So uh, some states are looking to us as a soon-to-be or potentially already a hotspot. Um, I really like the plan for ramping up. The idea to phase us in to help us build a muscle, and I like that a lot. Um, what, I, what I would have liked to see is a ramp up starting with remote to build the muscle for that, start to move towards more and more exposure, especially because we're about to get a flood of data in about six weeks. There's gonna be in hundreds of models across the state and thousands of models across the country for reopening. We are gonna get significantly more data about what works, what doesn't work, what people had regretted, what they didn't regret. And so I'd, I'd urge us as a board to take advantage of that ramp up plan by inc uh, including some time up front for building the muscle for remote and being able to monitor the data um, and approve a plan that allows us to, after we meet certain measures and criteria, we move to more and more on-site instruction um, right now, I don't see the data pointing to going from no on-site instruction to having all of our humans in the building all at once. Our numbers are increasing. Right now, the numbers are the same as what they were at the beginning of June, and nobody was calling for us to extend the school year at that time. Everybody was hoping that we would be able to end the school year and get home because the number of cases were so large at that time. We're at that same spot right now in terms of positivity rates. Uh, so I, I think it's too much too fast to be able to go back into buildings. Uh, where the numbers are today. Um, I want to make one last comment around inequities. Uh, inequities do exist on academics when students that uh, are uh, in the lower economic quartile for other reasons, uh, if they are doing remote learning. Right? The, the replacing in-person instruction is 
almost impossible, if not impossible, to do in a remote environment. Inequities also exist, though, on the flip side. Inequities exist for health-related concerns for uh, lower-income families because the health expenses uh, that are related to positive cases are also a very real concern. So the inequities, I would say, go both ways. Are they the same inequities? I, I, I can't even begin to measure it, but I, I do want to just name that the inequities do go both ways. Um, I worry about our uh, first experience for the 50% of kids that qualify for buses that will continue to take buses would be in non six feet distance spaces for longer than 15 minutes already breaking the recommendations. Uh, even though the recommendations allow for that accommodation, it seems inconsistent with what we would be asking them to do inside of a classroom. Um, and so uh, for a number of reasons based on where the guidance is right now, uh, I think there's more data pointing to a slow ramp up starting from remote instruction rather than pointing to a, uh, a fast ramp up towards full on site. So I, I take it that you would like to motion an amendment to the motion? Um, I'm happy to have a discussion if that's okay, but if not, I'm happy to do a motion to amend to... Well, we can have a discussion about it, I mean, first. Yeah. I mean, if, if we want to go down the line um, with, with a potential desire to want to do, uh, to start on a re remote learning, I don't know. I, I guess the discussion I'd like to have is not built, I guess the, the assumption you're making is we're not building that remote muscle. Is, is, is that a fair assessment of, of your position uh, that among other things but yes that's a part of it but I, I guess based on what I've heard tonight and kind of the communications we've been getting um, we need to continually prepare for that so I, I, I feel as though we are building that muscle um, in parallel with with kind of potentially pursuing the recommendation of the administration so I, I personally don't agree with that conclusion that we're we're not building that muscle I so think that at the two and a half hour days we got teachers that are giving guidance on, on how to use these devices we did not transition to using them well last year but they did build a little bit of muscle and sort of getting used to what their framework should look like but I think that that guidance from from staff is, is uh, incredibly important in in setting a tone for what what school is going to look like should we have to go into uh, a remote state because they'll have built a relationship while also understanding um, what what education is going to look like and what the tool sets are going to look like. All right, Steve. I think we can all obviously agree that none of these solutions are what we would consider ideal in a typical school year. You know, basically we're we're being forced to choose between the best of of a handful of honestly bad options. To be honest, you know, this is not ideal. This is not what anyone would say school should look like under under typical circumstances. And it doesn't feel good. It doesn't feel good to have to choose among among options that you know are not ideal. Um, there's pros and cons of all of these models. And almost all of those pros and cons are valid and true for all the models. You know, you have a conversation. I'm sure we've all had conversations with people about their preferences and why they support what they support and in my experience in those conversations i hear their arguments and I'm, that's true you're right you're right that's true that's true and i think it's not necessarily like a clear right or wrong um when you're trying to determine the best route to take i think obviously we all acknowledge in-person learning as we traditionally know it is far superior than anything else but we've also acknowledged that what we think of as traditional in-person learning is not going to be what's happening under any of these models. Um, we've acknowledged there's going to be sacrifices of best practice and things like that. So what we're going to see in in-person is going to look very different than traditional in-person learning. Is it still superior to online learning? Probably, maybe. But it's hard to gauge how superior it is due to the restrictions and changes that are gonna, gonna occur. You know, how superior is our in-person instruction going to look than online learning? Because there's it's gonna look very different than what we traditionally think of. Um, we've already acknowledged we cannot eliminate all risk, that that's basically impossible to do um, in any on-site version. 
we can lessen and can mitigate risk in various ways in different models to different degrees depending on, on how we go about it, but we cannot eliminate risk in any on-site version. So basically it comes down to how do, how do we prioritize our goals and um, where do we put the most weight on our priorities as a school board, as a school district, as, as a community really, and that's subjective because people can value different things and put more weight on other priorities and other goals. And that makes it challenging to make decisions, I think, because we all come from a different perspective and might be weighting things differently than others. And I think that makes it challenging. Um, like Karat said, I, I appreciate the, first of all, the immense work put in by the administration and 58 staff. Um, I was impressed by what they were able to accomplish and what they were able to do in terms of um, accomplishing their goal of making the space and the staffing work, um, at least on paper. I appreciate the phased in, fully on-site model. I think, like, like Kara kind of said, it does help to, um, helps for the students and the staff to kind of acclimate, assimilate to what we kind of think of as this new normal. But I, in my opinion, I don't think it significantly um, reduces the health and safety concerns with just this, the, simply the fact that we still have hundreds of students together in a building and staff at any given time. Um, I lean towards a more cautious approach as well that puts the utmost weight and priority on maximizing our ability to mitigate those health and safety risks above anything else. Um, I think plans to meet the requirements can seem really feasible on paper and you know from that 50,000 feet or even that 5,000 feet viewpoint it, it looks good it looks like we got it but I have serious concerns about the feasibility of, of meeting the social distancing requirements meeting the masking requirements in the reality of a school filled with children who as people have variously mentioned in different scenarios it's not always they're not always going to do what you tell them to do um, and I think in reality, in the practice of, of putting those plans in place at the ground level, I have concerns about that being a feasible reality. Um, I also recognize a lot of the challenges that come along with this. You know, I have two special needs children that did not necessarily thrive in the remote learning environment that we saw in the spring. Um, so I understand that. I understand that, come at that perspective that people bring. Um, I have three part-time jobs, one outside the house, two in the house. So I also understand the childcare concerns and the concern and the need for parents who are working at home right now and trying to juggle caring for their children and aiding and educating their children while also trying to work from home. I understand that. Uh, my husband's a teacher. I understand the burden that he's personally feeling having to go back into a school and feeling unsafe and, and feeling unsure about that. I, I can see all those perspectives. and. You can take them, I, I, can, I can hear where everyone's coming from. I understand people's pros and cons on all sides of these arguments. It makes sense to me. Um, ultimately for me, the health and safety risks just outweigh the benefits of a very significantly altered in-person learning experience that we're gonna be dealing with here. Um, I would rather be proved wrong by taking a cautious approach and being able to transition to an on-site model than be proved wrong by beginning on-site and having to tradition, uh, transition to fully remote because we have large numbers of students and staff becoming ill. So that's kind of where I'm coming from at this point. Any other comments? And, and Karan, I'll just respectfully um, just disagree with like your, your thought, although you- Well, you, how could you? <laughs> <laughs> but I will say, as, a, as an educator, my reaction to um, remote learning in the spring was, thank God this happened at the end of the year and not the beginning of the year. Because I don't know, I don't, I don't want anybody to discount for a second the importance of, of that rapport between the, the teacher and the student. Yeah. That can, I do not believe that can be built through an iPad effectively. And I don't think if you, add, if you just hand a, a kindergarten student an iPad and say, here you go, here's your teacher, she's waving at you through the iPad, be engaged, that that's going to work. I think we have to have that relationship built and steady on day one. You need to have expectations, you need to have... Um, you need to know the rhythms of the classroom, you need to know um, the, the rules and, and, and all those things and, and what's, what's going to be required you throughout your year. I just don't think that for a lot of kids that they're going to respond. I, I think remote learning worked to the extent that it did and I, I'm not, I know there's a lot of people who are, who are unsatisfied with how it worked, but I know everybody did a great job with what they could do. 
I think it worked to the extent that it did because it happened at the end of the year when we had these routines and these rhythms built up. But I, I think it could be very difficult for many of our students to just say, day one, you're remote, yeah. uh, and we're not going to, we're not going to build that, that relationship with your teacher. I uh, that, that's why I didn't want to propose an amendment until we had a discussion. I, I completely agree with you, and I think there's a middle ground approach for us to be able to both do both, to be able to build our muscle on remote. When I say hour, I mean students to be able to go through the motions and do it for extended days or extended periods of time. Um, the blended option C gives us the op opportunity to do both of what you're suggesting and also allows us to uh, avoid the lunch break uh, in the buildings. Uh, and I, I think among all, all the plans that are proposed, blended option B, uh, excuse me, blended option C gives us the best chance to be able to pivot up or down in terms of learning experiences. It's A, B, uh, F, Sorry? I, I, he was looking for it. Oh, okay. It's the A, B, uh, F, the, the thing that I would attach to that is also holding ourselves accountable to criteria around when we would come back together to revisit that plan. Uh, and so one thing that I would suggest is that we start to look at stagnating positivity rates in DuPage County for us to be able to say, if we start to see uh, positivity rates declining or stagnating, Let's come back together and revisit whether we can go from blended C to blended B, whether we can go from blended C to modified on-site, but it gives us a fork in the road forcing point for us to be able to continue to come back and revisit, which we will already do anyway, but it also gives the community a signal of look at this data point. That's when the board is going to come back and start to revisit whether that option continues to work. But I would make the amendment at a minimum of blended option C. Well, and I do just want to say this because you, you made a comment about pivoting. A blended option C would not allow us to pivot back into a modified on-site without having to change classroom structure, right? When, when you're talking about, you're talking about getting half the kids in the building and splitting that teacher's time so they have twice as many um, students just divided in half between two different days. There's no way to then bring all of those kids back into the room and work with the teacher that they've established a relationship with. So that would lock you in the continuum where you would be on. I mean, you could potentially take that and go to B, where you'd still be an A-B split and you went to 2 o'clock, but you wouldn't be able to go to a five-day-a-week plan. Yeah, will so there be... would have will a there modified on-site momentum sure. there without having to change teachers. Yeah, I think what you're suggesting is a challenge that's a solvable problem, not a challenge that makes it a deal breaker. I mean, it all depends on, on what you're saying. It, and I'm saying it's a deal breaker for me. Um, the ability for our kids to be able to pivot from, from a full on site to a, uh, to a um, full remote, to me, is, is the kind of continuum I want them on so that I'm setting them up to work with the same teacher from, from September 1st to their last day of school would be my would be my goal. In a, in what is going to be um, a challenging year to begin with, the idea of, of looking at changing staff, um, you know, for my you know for the, the children, I would like to reduce that as much as possible. I agree with what Krat said about um, blended option C in terms of um, the ability to build both muscles in terms of that create the relationships with teachers on site while also um, preparing more for um, truly robust and, and more effective remote learning. But also I, I see um, health and safety benefits to blended C as well compared to um, the recommended um, model just because you are limiting the number of people in the building at any given time, making it easier for social distancing to occur, making it easier for mass compliance teachers are, are um, dealing with fewer the building as a whole is dealing with fewer numbers of students at any time in the building um, and for me and also you're eliminating lunch as a potential increased risk factor those things are benefits to me for the blended model C as well and I, I read the numbers just so we have it uh, you would reduce about by 50 percent the number of humans in the building but within any given classroom you reduce it by about 25 percent uh, just because of the way the staffing would have to work out to support a, uh, the other half of the students that are at home on that given day, uh, you would have to have a certified teacher teaching the synchronous part of that instruction. So 
without getting too much into the spreadsheeting of it, uh, you end up doing exactly what Emily said with reducing the number of humans in the building drastically. The number of humans in any individual classroom uh, goes down as well, but not by not by a pure fifty percent. But you increase on the the off your child's off days. You increase the exposure points because you have to make the assumption that it's safer. In order, in order to say it's safer, you have to make the assumption that when a child's not in school, he or she is at home, at, at, at home with, with he, his or her family and not outside the home. Sure. But I, I'm fairly confident that most of our families, that's not going to be workable. So there's going to be this group of kids who get together on this day, or I'm going to go to, to a private option. I might send my kid to the Westmont Yard or to the Link or something like that. And you have a number of kids who are, would not be ordinarily associating with one another uh, from different schools, different communities even getting together, um, going to cousin's house out of, out of town, or uh, not out of town, but like in a neighboring community. And there's just, there's potentially more exposure, more germs that when they come back on the next day, all those places where they were, now they're bringing more back into our buildings. Um, you're, you're, th that obstacle you're equating as a student, every student in our district, when they are on the at-home days, would expose themselves to additional 10 families. I doubt that every one of our students will be exposing them to 10 additional families to get up to the level of what they'd be exposing them to in every classroom in a modified onsite. So just the level of risk, well, yeah, it's not going to be 100% reduced, the level of risk is not the same because not every student but, would be exposed to the test. But we're doing, we're doing, uh, we're self certifying, we're doing masks, we're doing six feet. On those off days, there is no guarantee that they're going to be doing any of those things. And there's in fact, no, it's unlikely that no they will. There's no guarantee be. that they're going to be doing those in our buildings because let's just take the situation of inclement weather. In inclement weather situations, we would be welcoming students into the classroom before we do any sort of checks. For that moment of time, for as long as we have to, to get, be able to get through it, we're going to be breaking our six-foot rule. For our instructional assistants that uh, need to provide non-socially distant contact for students, we would be breaking that rule. So we aren't, we aren't following those same rules 100% of the time. It's unrealistic for any of us to expect that that would happen 100% of the time. It's not, all I mean to say is not black and white. It's not one or zero. Uh, what I'm saying is that we significantly reduce the exposure because we don't have 400 Human, 450 humans at Highland, or uh, 520 humans at Leicester, uh, we have half of that inside of the same building. All right, so I, I see that we have at least two board members that would like to divert from the recommendation of the district. Uh, if you want to propose an amendment, I'm, I'm happy to, and and then we can call for a second and, um, and, and put it up for a vote. Yeah, I'd move to approve the resolution approving fall 2020 school reopening in the blended option C model. And so we're just talking about one through six now. And, and so what is your recommendation for, for Sorry, middle yeah, school? Sorry, this is one through six. That's yeah, cool. and, what's your rec and what's your record? What are you amending for middle school? Are you gonna leave that the same? I'm leaving that the same. I'm leaving pre-K and K the same. All right, so we have a motion to modify the resolution. Um, the original resolution was for modified on-site instruction five days per week for pre-K through sixth grade with a phase one of two and a half hours per day through September 9th, phase two through October 23rd, and a, a third phase starting October 26th, which would run from 8.15 a.m. to 2 p.m. with pre-K and kindergarten as a half-day program. And the blended A-B instructional model for middle schools grades seven through eight with the transitional days through August 7th. Um, with a request to amend that to the approval of blended option C for pre-K through sixth, and the blended AB instructional model for middle school grades seven and eight. Um, is that your motion? Yes, thank you. Is there a second for that motion? Second. Is there any discussion on that? Any further discussion, I guess, really? All right, Melissa, can you please call roll? Member Joshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Nay. Member Olchik. Nay. Member Samati. Nay. Member Weiner? Nay. Member Hughes? Nay. 
The motion failed to amend the resolution for approving the fall 2020 school reopening to blended option C for grades pre-K through sixth and the blended AB instructional model for middle school grades seven through eight. Uh, that brings us back to the original motion. Is there any further discussion on the original motion? Mm, just for my two cents. Um, <clears throat> this has been a long two months. None of us have taken this lightly. Um, if you see us laughing or joking up here, it's just because we actually like one another. Um, <laughs> but it is not we have not taken this lightly. We have listened to the amount of time that we've spent talking with each other and talking to people in the community and getting all the different voices. Um, please know that we have heard everyone. We cannot make a choice that is going to make everyone happy and we cannot make a choice that allows everyone to be right. Um, I thank you for your words, Emily. Um, they, it was spot on. I am not a person who works with um, infectious diseases in schools. That's not my job. My job is to help people whose houses burn down and are affected by floods and I go out in the middle of the night if necessary um, and help them. I have a stepson and a stepdaughter who are police officers and they go out. I have a stepniece who is pregnant and an ICU cardiac nurse who is going in every day. Um, but we are all smart in what our choices are within our own job. Our job as a board was to hire the person that we thought was best fit for our district. And we overwhelmingly, the entire community the teachers, the staff chose Kevin for his experience as a teacher, as a parent, as a parent of special needs, as a principal, as an assistant principal, as an assistant superintendent and a superintendent. His job is to make sure that we are making the safest and talking to the people who are scientists in the area where we live because what's happening here and I don't wish to live in Arizona where my niece is right now, and I don't wish to live in Florida where my father-in-law lives right now. But right here, we are his job is to listen to the experts. And again, I am not an expert in this. My job is to make sure that I have faith in the decisions that I made as a board member when I voted to hire, although I didn't because I was in Mexico. <laughs> And it was the one meeting that I needed to, to be at. Um, and so that is uh, after hearing everything and listening and we can all spout out numbers, um, but we can always find a research, something that goes to, there's so much out there these days. You can find something to back your own choices. My choice was to hire Kevin to lead us. This is probably gonna be not probably, pro is the hardest thing that he's probably going to do through his entire career. And I trust him. I trust him with my child. I trust him when I walk into a building. Um, and if he didn't have, if he did not feel that this was right, we would not be going down this road. So for right now, until things change and get closer to us, I don't want to be making decisions based on numbers that the county is providing that's Kevin's job is to check and if he hears from them they say shut down then we do that is not my job my job is Kevin's boss mm -hmm. and after the last two weeks of hearing everything my faith is in this plan that we have created that that allows for the child and the student or the teacher to get to know to know one another. If we do have to pivot back, um, so be it. Um, I, but that is that. That's that's where my conscience is 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 being. Um, I will sleep um, not well, um, but I will know that I voted how I needed to vote, and that's because I'm not a pandemic specialist in schools. So 
that's just where I wanted people to know where my vote is coming from. I, I agree with you, Jill. Um, I think we owe it to the kids to work through all these challenges, and I think that the administration, along with the working groups, um, really listened, and it's clear in what they're rolling out and their proposal here. Um, to date, we've served 33,483 meals to kids in our community, and I'm really proud of that. And um, this has been an incredibly difficult time for everyone because all, all these scenarios are kind of crummy, but we have to make the best decision. And I've worked really hard to weigh and balance the needs and concerns of everyone. Because I've listened, I've read the 499 teacher survey responses, the 3,500 3, parent responses, and it's really difficult because oftentimes everyone's needs are in conflict with each other <laughs> because one person says, I need, some, I need my kid to go to school. The other person said, I'm scared, I, I'm at home, I, I can take care of it, or um, I need to keep my job, or they're not doing well at home, all these different competing things. And it makes it very difficult, but I'm very comfortable and can sleep at night knowing that we're taking the steps to work up to that. And um, I know with all the meetings coming up that we will have the opportunity to reflect and um, pivot and be nimble if is necessary. If the groups come back and they're working and they can't figure out the lunch component, we'll figure. So we, we might have to pivot, but I'm I'm okay with this as it's laid out right now. Um, <clears throat> I, I participated in the last meeting um, remotely, um, and so you were all blessed by not having to hear as much from me. Um, so I'm going to make up for that tonight. I also have some prepared statements, and I, and I feel like um, to give not just Karat and Emily um, more of a sophisticated perspective of where I'm coming from, I feel like there's many in this, in the, in this community tonight who will be disappointed with my vote. And at least if you don't have to, you don't have to disagree with me. Um, you don't have to agree with me, but at least you can understand where I'm coming from. Because um, that's what I've always promised, is to explain why I vote the way I vote. So I've broken my, my thoughts down into, into five separate sections. This first one's just about listening. I assure the community uh, right now that I have spent much more time these past few weeks listening than talking. Um, in the last month, I've read every email sent to the board, processed every public comment, spent way too much time poring over every relevant thread on Downers Grove social media groups dug deep into survey data from thousands of respondents. Um, I've prodded Dr. Russell and other board members for their insights into how they think this group of parents or that school building or this type of teacher or that union leader can have their needs met with every iteration of the plan that's come before us. This may be the biggest decision any once or future board will ever make in the history of 58. This is certainly exponentially more significant than any other heated times I can think of as, since my time of being on this board, iPads, collective bargaining, superintendent's contract, Longfellow, a referendum, nothing else even comes close. I've heard from so many people with the most poignant conversations circling in my head right now as I speak. There's the parent of the immunocompromised compromised child who is terrified of what could happen, the teacher who wants to get back to school so badly but is worried about bringing the disease home to her family. The parent whose child is already struggling and thinks more remote learning will prevent future successes. The parent of the special needs child who made tremendous strides in the 18 months before um, remote learning, but has seen, since seen horrible regressions. This whole board is listening. I think the administration has done a great job of engaging our stakeholders. There's no solution that's going to make everyone happy tonight. Um, there's no solution that will probably make half of us happy. But um, when 97% of our respondents say they will avail themselves of an in-person learning, when should it be offered, it's difficult for me not to acknowledge that we may have a mandate from our community to provide it, if we can, safely. Uh, moving into safety, that's my next section. Student and staff safety is paramount, full stop. Sorry, my mask is ill-fitting, it appears when I'm talking too much. <laughs> There's no debate on that. In full disclosure, no one should be surprised to learn I bring zero medical or epidemiological experience to this conversation. Like many in this room, I've consumed every article and perspective I can related to this virus, particularly as it pertains to schools and school-aged children. The science, which I have gleaned from such sources as the CDC, the American Academy of Pediatrics, UNICEF, the World Health Organization, and others, is demonstrating to me that the children without comorbid comorbidities are less likely to die from this disease than they are from the seasonal flu. The evidence is demonstrating to me that children are poor transmitters of the disease and that schools in Europe and Asia have been able to open up safely without spikes in positive COVID diagnoses. But all that aside, I appreciate there are other viewpoints out there tonight. And I certainly appreciate that for many, this is not always a logical conversation. This is an emotional one. 
After all, we are discussing the health and safety of our kids and our families. So I don't expect anyone to agree with my assessment of the risks as a parent and my firm decision to send my own two children back to school. As parents, my wife and I ask ourselves not what are the risks of going back to school, but what are the risks of our kids not going back to school. But that's the Harris family. So I have my unschooled thoughts as an individual and my own perspective as a parent, but I checked them both at the door tonight. As a board member elected to the community to use my judgment to make decisions about our schools, I have decided to place my trust in Dr. Russell and his team. I have great confidence that they have gone through every line of guidance handed down to us by Governor Pritzker, the Illinois State Board of Education, the Illinois Department of Public Health, and the DuPage County Health Department. Knowing that I have no authority on this matter, I will listen to the experts at the local, state, and national level and accept their ex expertise in telling us that this can be done safely. Although I'm disappointed in some ways by some of the drastic changes made to the normal school day, I thank the team for making the right adjustments to protect the health and safety of our students and our staff. And I will demand as a board member that you be continuously assessing the effectiveness, the effectiveness of these precautions and should the time come when you can no longer ensure that our kids and teachers are safe, you must pull the plug on the current model and find something that works better. The section I call equity. On June 7th this year, hundreds of our community members braved a pandemic and came together to march for equality in our village and our society. I'm sure that many of the, village, of the people here now at Village Hall or listening at home participate in this event. Tonight, I urge the community at large to remember the spirit of that event when engaging in this conversation surrounding opening schools. The idea that we should strive for equality and for equity for our students is a position for which there is virtually no counter argument. And if you have one, frankly, I don't want to hear it. I hear from friends and neighbors on, and read on social media about families planning for how they should support their children while they have been and may continue to be learning remotely. And while I should consider myself very fortunate to live in a community where so many have the privilege to hire private tutors, for example, and who have the privilege of not having to work, which provides the flexibility to homeschool their kids, I remind myself that we are, in fact, a heterogeneous community where a great number of our parents and guardians struggle. And these families cannot possibly dream of providing these kids these kinds of opportunities to their children, especially those who are currently facing an additional layer of financial hardship because they had their hours at work cut, or their business is struggling, or they've lost their jobs completely. The fact of the matter is that when we talk about equity in education, which the June 7th event shows me that we value in this community, we have to put these kids at the center of our conversations. Here's what our data tells us. Our black, brown, English learners, and low-income kids underperform year in and year out when compared to their white peers. Does anyone think these achievement gaps shrink during this year's remote learning? I certainly don't. And my sense tells me that this, they probably grew significantly wider. We can, all go, we can go through all the reasons why this may be in more detail at a later time, but I promise you that remote learning isn't going to help these kids close their gaps. For disadvantaged families whose children are already struggling academically, more remote learning will only make them fall further behind. And let's be honest here, these families are almost certainly, woefully underrepresented in this discourse based on social media activity, based on those emailing the board, based on those who have approached me as an individual board member, based on those participating in, in, in this meeting, either in person or remotely. But I will use my, vo my voice to support them tonight. The section I call the whole child, to my friend, Jill Samanti. On July 13th, you did an amazing job of speaking up for kids and the types of services that they need that we cannot adequately provide through an iPad. I was participating in the meeting remotely because I was out of state, so you didn't see or hear my reaction to your wonderful comments. I thank you for them now. You took some garbage on, for your defensive kids on social media for some reason, but I applaud you. You're absolutely right. Our kids need health, mental health services. They need access to good food and nutrition. They need to be around kids and other so, and for their social emotional development. They need occupational, physical, and speech therapy. They need mandated reporters to protect them from sexual and child abuse. Let's not forget that for some kids, reading, writing, and arithmetic are not necessarily the most crucial services provided by our staff. How many of our kids, I ask, would we, we be exposing to potentially greater risks if we do not open our doors to them next month? You see, there's a subset of children that my heart goes out to tonight. They're not my kids. To those of you listening to me speak right now, they're probably not your kids. They're not Dr. Russell's. They're not the kids of any other, probably, of any other member, board member colleague. They're the kids who need school to open back up because school is the best place in the world for them to be. Because, well, home isn't. Take this from somebody who is starting his 18th year in education. Most of those spent as a classroom teacher in a minority majority district where 60% of kids receive a free reduced lunch. For some of our kids, school is where they can escape the stresses and traumas of their lives. School is the only place where they feel safe. School is the only place where they feel happy. For many, school is the only place where they get a good meal. School is the only place where they hear, you're doing great, or let me help you figure that out, or you can do anything you put your mind to, or I'm proud of you, or I love you. Our teachers and staff members are amazing people who do amazing things, and our kids need them now more than ever. For this reason and others, I can only support an option that gets our kids with these awesome adults for the maximum amount of time that we can deem safe. Our last section is I call student outcomes and efficacy. 
What are the long-term socioeconomic impacts of us on our society when a generation of kids goes six months, a year, 18 months without being in school? After consulting with my broad network of colleagues in education, my friends and neighbors who have school-aged children, uh, the school and school-aged children themselves, I have learned that they unanimously believe that there is no reasonable substitution to on-site learning, with many of them sharing their spring experiences being highly disappointing. I say this with profound admiration and appreciation for the yeoman's work that our teachers perform this spring. But what I believe to be true is that an iPad or a Chromebook is in many cases ineffective for trying to meet the diverse needs of our learners, particularly for K, pre-K, K, one and two, if not all of elementary and even some of middle, special education students, English learners, and so on. Uh, what I believe to be true as, as an educator is that for, for our K, one and two students especially, if they're not if their academic needs aren't met, if they're not on track by, uh, by, second grade, by the end of second grade for their math and their literacy, they might never be on track. They might never recover that. Uh, please don't interpret my comments to suggest I have a lack of love and support for our teachers, that I'm indifferent to their concerns. Far from it. I just know that based on evidence I've gathered in my years as a DG58 parent and a board member, their teachers are essential to this community. Forgive the corny cliche, but I know that to the world, a DG58 teacher is just one teacher. But to our kids, their teachers, their world. I saw a meme on Facebook recently that somewhat disappointed me. A little bit, I was a little bit shaken when I read it. It was something to the fact that we shouldn't be worrying about kids' academic growth and achievement if it puts them at risk. Now that's a fair sentiment, and I don't mean to argue one bit against that. But it said, and I quote, we can always recover a child's academics. No, we can't. If we, and by we, I mean the professional edu educator profession and the society as a whole, haven't been able to close achievement gaps after decades of trying new things, and investing literally trillions with a T of dollars, we are not going to simply catch these kids up whenever we hit phase five and schools are opened back up without restrictions, whenever that may be. Our kids are falling behind. Some of them will never recover academically from their losses in the spring. Anyone who knows me knows how important our students' academic outcomes are to me as a professional educator and someone who serves the community as a volunteer school board member. And no one should be surprised to know that I cannot endorse the idea that we keep going with an instructional model I don't think is effective, it, I don't think is the most effective way to promote kids learning for a huge chunk of our school body, our student body, especially when there are better options that can be implemented safely. Um, I'd just like to finish my remarks by, um, I, I want to, as always, I, I like to give um, Dr. Russell some props, um, but um, today I'm going to skip over him, I'm going to go to his team. Um, I thought you guys did an amazing job. Um, I thank you all for, I mean, the, if, if you put 20 minutes into every slide, you guys put an, 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 an Unbelievable amount of time in this presentation. You answered every question, I think, wonderfully. And um, I'm, I'm just, I'm proud to be involved in the work that you've done. I'm proud to be involved in this organization. And thank you for all that you're doing for kids. Thank you, Greg. That's great. All right, well, I'm actually going to keep my comments very short. Uh, um, this is a topic that's going to, you know, has and will continue to consume conversations for the next year, you know, let, let's face it. So I could personally talk for hours about this tonight, but, but, but I won't. Um, you know, I, I think the word listen has come up in every single person's comments. And, you know, I could say with the utmost confidence that all seven of us up here have listened to every single piece of information that's come in through the community, whether it's through email, social media, phone calls, conversations in your lawn chair in the cul-de-sac, we, we've gotten lots of, of, of input, and you know I think honestly we should all be grateful um, for the level of passion that our community has for education and safety. You know I, I just want to say that. So we've all listened. Um, I also want to point out that we all recognize the plan can't be all things to all people. You know everyone's child's unique. Everyone's health is a unique situation. Everyone's family situation is unique. Everyone's extended family situation is unique. Um, so everyone's risk equation is different. Um, so although we'll never have a plan that satisfies 100% of people, we are providing choice. So I, I just want to kind of reiterate the fact that um, this plan that's been uh, recommended um, does provide choice for, for everyone. So I, I take um, great, pr great pride in that. Um, but overall, I firmly believe it's what is best for the kids and it truly does balance all the input we've received of, of what the community needs and wants. So across all stakeholders, I, I think that this plan does, does balance all of that. Thank you, Steve. Thank you.
other comments, questions, or discussion? Melissa, will you please call roll? Member Doshi? Nay. Member Hannes? Nay. Member Harris? Aye. Member Olchik? Aye. Member Samanti? Aye. Member Weiner? Aye. Member Hughes? Aye. The motion carried to approve the resolution approving the fall 2020 school reopening plan consisting of modified on site instruction five days per week for pre K through sixth with a phase one of two and a half hours per day through September 9th, phase two through October 23rd, and a third phase starting October 26th with a runtime of 8.15 to 2 p.m. with pre-K and kindergarten as a half-day program, and a blended A-B instructional model for middle school grades seven and eight with transition days through September 9th. We have a couple of announcements here. We do have a financial advisory committee, which will be Friday, August 7th at 7 a.m. That will be done um, remotely via Zoom. And then we have a meeting, a regular board meeting, right here in Village Hall um, on Monday, August 10th at 7 p.m. We do not have any items that would take us into closed tonight. So I will move to close the meeting. Do I have a second? Second. second. <laughs> All right, Melissa, please call roll. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. Motion carried. Um, the meeting is now adjourned at 11.27 p.m.